Thank you. Welcome to today's Phoenix City Council meeting. I officially call the meeting to order. Before we start the official portion, we are here today in the Orpheum Theater due to the loss of power at the city council chambers and yesterday's tragic accident. Line workers and electricians are the people who keep our world connected. Their job is very dangerous and often goes without recognition. Let us take a moment to honor Rico Castillo, the APS electrician who died, and to think of his loved ones. I would ask you to join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. I also want to thank everyone involved in responding to the events, as well as the team at the Orpheum who put together today's council meeting on very little notice. We are doing the best with the logistics as possible, and people worked enormously hard to make today's meeting possible. So thank you to everyone who is still working to keep our community safe and to restore power in our downtown. We also want to take a moment to just set the scene for today's events. There have been some threats made against members of our community. We want to make it very clear we will not th tolerate threats against our first responders, threats against those who do dispatch for the city, threats against activists, threats against the elected officials. We will take those seriously and pursue them. They are unproductive and wrong. I also want to remind everyone that this is still an official policy meeting of the Phoenix City Council. So the same rules that we have in the council chambers apply. If public would like to submit comment cards, you can do so in back. We are asking that all comment cards be in turned in by 3.30 p.m. Those that are turned in after will not have the opportunity to speak, but may still, still submit comments for the record using our white comment card. To participate in a productive conversation, we must ensure that residents are here for the presentations from speakers and listen to the comments made by fellow residents. This rule is to help ensure both of those things happen. When we have policy meetings, we begin with council information and uh, follow-up requests. So I want to turn to council members first starting on my right to see if anyone has requests. Councilman Nowakowski does not. Councilman DeCicio, Garcia, uh, Vice Mayor, Councilwoman, and Councilwoman Stark. Uh, Councilwoman St uh, Pastor, are you with us telephonically? <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'll just explain. Uh, my son is uh, broke his finger and uh, had to take him to, needed to take him to the doctor. But I had uh, Dad be the father of the year, so here I am. Did you skip it? So we're not doing announcements? Or uh, do you have any requests for information or? I do, I do. So um, I have a question for the city manager and staff as it relates to the proposition on an August ballot Prop 106. Um, I've been getting many questions from the constituents on what this proposition does and how, it pass how its passage could affect our city. I would like to direct staff to draft a memo on this topic to help us better understand the impact of this initiative with information including but not limited to impacted city programs, monetary impact, and long-term effects uh, on our city. I would also like the memo to include an estimate of the city's pension contribution over several years under Prop 106, including this year and last. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Before I turn it over to the city manager, I'd like to say that we are here today not because of one particular event, but because of our desire to have the best police department possible and improve our city. Some people want to paint this as an us versus them issue. However, it is much more vast and complex than that narrative allows. It is not two groups with opposing views. We are a city of 1.7 million people who all have views formed by their own life experiences. This issue will not be solved overnight. When we had our listening session back at Pilgrim Rest Church on June 18th, I told you that we'd come back within 30 days with some ideas and solutions. That is why we are here today, two weeks later. The council is here to listen and to present ideas on how to improve our department and improve trust with the community. 
One of those ideas is an ad hoc committee on public safety that we discussed at the June 26th council meeting. The charge of this ad hoc is to review past and current recommendations on, way to, on ways to improve the department and strengthen community trust. Each member of the Phoenix City Council will get an appointment to this ad hoc committee. We will collect all nominee names by the end of this month so that we can have the first meeting in August. Our lives are driven by data. We, when we have the best and most accurate data, we are able to create innovative solutions to problems. Part of this data is gauging the sentiment of our community, our entire community. We must know how they feel if we are going to have the best and most innovative department possible and to measure our progress. It's important to remember that an individual can support our first responders and also believe that there are important changes that need to be made in the department. These items are not mutually exclusive. We've been taking steps in the direction of change, but there is more to be done. We have escalated the rollout of body-worn cameras, and by the end of August, all of our frontline officers will be wearing one. A year ago this month, our training for officers changed from military style to best practice of problem-solving based training. That means our department is changing the way our officers are trained. They are putting a greater focus on communication, decision making, critical thinking, and scenario based de escalation tactics. These are not minor changes. They are positive steps in the direction of transparency and accountability and represent a wholesale change in how officers interact with people in the field. We also need to understand what our public safety officers are experiencing both in their personal and professional lives. This includes dealing with an enormous amount of behavioral and mental health challenges in the field. I've shared my commitment to have specially trained clinicians answer calls along with our officers to assist with this monumental and growing task. The work is bound to take a toll on any person and we also need to ensure that these officers receive the help they need in their non-professional lives. Our goal, and I know I speak for many of the members of this council, is to ensure that our public safety officers and community members make it home safely each night. And now we'll hear an update from our city manager, Ed Zerker. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. As noted on the agenda for today's report from the city manager, Chief Jerry Williams will discuss her action plan for the Phoenix Police Department. Mayor, two weeks ago, as you mentioned, you held a community listening session at Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church, and there you committed we would return in no more than 30 days with an action plan. So I'm pleased to note that the police chief's action plan is going to be discussed today within 14 days of that meeting. Chief, William is presenting, chief Williams is presenting on the issues that she can undertake quickly. This is not comprehensive, and we look forward to additional input and recommendations from the city council and from the ad hoc committee, as you mentioned. As city manager, I take very seriously the concerns expressed by some members of the community about their trust in our police department. I also know that Chief Williams Executive Officer Mike Kurtenbach and the vast majority of our police department employees work hard to serve the community every day. When we make mistakes or act unprofessionally, we will own up to it and fix it. That's what you'll hear today from Chief Williams. Over the past decade, we've made significant improvements to how we do policing in Phoenix based on collaborative efforts with citizen advisors. And there are more improvements coming. Admitting that we have room to change and improve is not a sign of weakness or a lack of faith in our police. Rather, it's a sign of strength and confidence in the men and women of the Phoenix Police Department. Let me be clear. I have complete confidence that Jerry Williams is the right police chief for this time in Phoenix and that she, her executive staff, and our entire police department, top to bottom, sworn and civilian, are more than up to the challenge to strengthen trust with all members of the community working in good faith. The City Council has my commitment to work diligently and steadily on this with the Chief and the community and to support the Ad Hoc Committee and the City Council in any effort you as a body direct us to pursue. Chief Williams will now present her five-point action plan based on what we have heard so far from the community and our police employees. I'll turn it over to Chief Williams. Thank you, Mr. Zucker, Mayor and Council and community. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss some things that can be immediately implemented, as the city manager men mentioned, with the police department to work through the process of putting into action what has been discussed during the listening sessions two weeks ago today. What I heard loudly and clearly was that some members of the community are tired of talk and they want actionable steps. Today I'm sharing some of the actionable steps that have come from the Tuesday's meeting 
and some of the previous discussions in relation to the Community Policing Trust Initiative or the CPTI and some information from other parts of the National Police Foundation study. As was mentioned by the city manager, any unprofessional behavior reflects on everyone in the police department. There are thousands of police employees who do not deserve this perception. I accept the perception is greater than reality and that we must work to change this. However, until the community sees some actionable steps, all the discussion will be for naught. It's my goal to make changes that will make us a better police department for all whom we've served. There are five bullet points and five buckets, if you will, that can be implemented quickly and others that will require more time and effort and community engagement to properly implement. So if we can move forward with the PowerPoint presentation. And of course, technology is not working for me right now. There we go. So as was mentioned, there are going to be five actionable steps that we will discuss and talk about. The first is communicating clear expectations to employees. The second is modernize technology and processes. The third is assess best practices. The fourth, improve training. And the fifth, surveying community for their feedback. Let's start with the first one, communicating clear expectations to employees. I believe that hearing the voice of the community is important, but I also believe that hearing the voice of my employees is of, is of, of same importance and sharing my expectations with them directly. Within the last two weeks, we held six employee sessions in six locations, and hearing my employees hear my expectations of them and then provide them the space and the time to share some of their information as well was one of the most beneficial things that I've done in the almost two years that I've been here. Precincts also had direct conversations, and assistant chiefs and commanders had conversations with employees on expectations. And lastly, we sent out written information to our employees um, to make sure that they understood what our expectations are. And we have a module that's up and running right now where employees are mandated to go through crisis communication under stress. This has to be done by July 15th. And we also are front loading and uploading implicit bias training that's going to be the second reiteration of the original implicit bias training that we had. The next pieces are going to be modernizing technology and processes. Body-worn cameras, body-worn cameras, body-worn cameras. Uh, yesterday, we started the rollout of Cactus Park Precinct, and that puts us well over the 50% mark of having body-worn cameras out in patrol. Uh, I, get, I got asked questions during these two weeks from community members wanting to make sure that we outfitted our neighborhood enforcement team members, as well as our community action officers. Hearing that, uh, I was fortunate to be reached out by Axon. Rick Smith is the CEO, Re reached out to me on Friday and asked what could he do to help us in this time of need. To our credit, uh, Axon is giving us an additional 200 cameras along with the software to accompany it to make sure we're able to outfit our neighborhood enforcement teams and our community action officers all by August. So thank you very much to Axon out there for the much needed help. The second piece is tracking when officers draw their weapons. This was mentioned in the Community Policing Trust Initiative or the CPTI and it was also referenced in the National Police Foundation study. We have the required software update and we have policy that has been disseminated to community members. And with that, we'll be able to roll this out in August, we hope, of this year. And what this will track is when we draw our weapons at people, it will document the race and ethnicity of the person with whom we've drawn the weapon on and, and age. And then we'll give a narrative as to why we're drawing our weapons. A perfect example of that will be when we're conducting building searches, we draw our weapons when we conduct building searches. If someone is, is in the field of the gun being pointed, we will need to document that. So that's a good example. It was heard loudly and clearly two weeks ago, especially at Pilgrim West Baptist Church, that we need to figure out a way to streamline the process for releasing reports. We gathered all the individuals who have some kind of stake in the report writing process and dissemination of those reports this past week, and we figured out a way to make sure that if an individual is involved in a police incident, that next of kin notification will make sure that next of kin gets a complimentary copy of that police report within 30 days. Our recruiting and hiring best practices, we've done an amazing job on the front end with recruitment and getting people into our process. We've done an amazing job with the hiring, uh, we've done an amazing job with the training process. We have some of the best practices in training. What we need to do is really look at our hiring process and best practices. Uh, 
Metro PD and Baltimore have, have a couple of systems and a couple of ways to test for bias and or interaction with community members. So our hiring team is out looking at some of those and they'll be making a couple road trips in order to make sure we have the best practices there. Last but not least is the early intervention system. There are some companies who provide this service and we kind of have something that's kind of like an early intervention system, but the system is not able to talk between and among the various systems in the city. So what we want to do with this early intervention system is really find ways to track behavior and make sure that if red flags or yellow flags pop up on employees, that we're able to take action and help that employee through that crisis and or perhaps move them to a different function if necessary. Um, the early intervention system was one of the components of the 21st century policing strategy and plan that came out a few years ago. And I quote, um, and I give you a quote from that report. It says, hurt people can hurt people. So the early intervention system will be the way for us to make sure we're really taking care of our employees and keeping track of what's going on with them before they engage with members of the public. Assessing best practices among peer agencies, you all know that we've been working through the National Police Foundation study that talks about the recommendation number nine, and the mayor mentioned this previously also, looking at and making sure we're having the right people respond to calls at the right time. It doesn't necessarily have to be a police officer all the time. To whatever degree and extent we can have behavioral health, we want to work through that. So in our assessment of best practices among peer agencies, we're going to be looking at behavioral health, de-escalation techniques and tactics, recruiting, hiring, and training, report writing, community engagement. Um, we're also going to look at, too, and I probably should, should go back, this came up in, in conversation, uh, need to check our practices of how we deal with community members post-traumatic incident, incident. So we want to make sure we have the best of the best in that, too. Obviously, in improving training, that's, that's a big step and a big piece for us. I mentioned to you that we're doing a great job attracting people on the recruitment side. We have some of the world-class best practices in training. Um, we, we have a different challenge with the field training officer process, and we need to do a deeper dive in that. The field training officer process, so everyone will know, police officers go to the academy, they get certified, they graduate. They go to a post academy and they spend time in the field, kind of like on the job training, learning how to be a police officer from someone who's certified to be a field training officer. What we're realizing is that that function right now is assigned in patrol. We're going to move that function to the training bureau so that there's consistency in the training process from the time that we hire you until the time that you're checked off and being a solo capable officer. We're also going to have Arizona State University and others help us with best practices in field training in order to be the best of the best that we can be in that. Our report writing process, it was made clear, very clear, uh, two weeks ago, Tuesday, but we've heard this oftentimes also, so we need to look at best practices in report writing, and hopefully the body-worn camera system will help us make sure that what the officers are seeing and doing is being translated directly onto those police reports. Last, last but not least, yeah, we'll the same piece. we have our survey for community feedback, and I don't know where that went. Um, our survey for community feedback, we're talking about voice, we're talking about hearing from our community members. Uh, the CPTI made this recommendation for a community survey in recommendation 11. The National Police Foundation made that decision and made that call for us too. We would like to conduct a statistically valid survey to assess public perception. And then we also would like to conduct a statistically valid survey to listen to my employees because I haven't done that since I've been here as a police chief. So fast forwarding to council action, if I may, Mayor and Council, we're asking that you provide authorization to conduct a procurement process for an early intervention system, as well as item 1B, authorized to create a qualified vendor list for public opinion research firms and services. So I, I know this has been a lot of information and I talk really fast. Uh, I will have a memo that I'll present to the city manager that can be disseminated, and all of the information that we're providing is going to be provided on both the city website as well as the police department website. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Chief. We appreciate you coming back to us quickly with solutions. <laughs> Taking the time to listen to your employees as well as the community. I will next turn it over to our Public Safety Subcommittee Chairman, Michael Nowakowski, for a potential moment, a motion and comments. Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. You know, as the Chair of Public Safety for the last eight years, 
I really want to thank our mayor for the last three months as mayor. You really worked really hard making sure that this was an open and transparent process and fair to everyone and listening to all sides. And I know that today's motion, it's just the beginning. It's the first step in the right direction. And I know that as the chair of public safety, working along with the mayor, we have meetings that we're gonna be setting up during the summertime. She asked me to keep my calendar open during the summer, so my wife's not that happy, but we're gonna make sure that we, we go in between vacation time. But that's how important this is for her. So I wanna thank you, Mary, first of all, before making the motion for making this really an open process, listening to both sides and all sides, really. And with that, I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve items number 1A and 1B. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. We will. We have um, many cards from the community and many comments from council members. Council member Stark. It, thank you. I just wanted a clarification on uh, item 1B. You said that this would be a public opinion, but not just from the public, but it would also be for the officers in conjunction with um, you, correct? Uh, so Mayor, so Councilwoman Stark, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Guardado. You spoke briefly about early intervention software, and I had a question. Can you just speak a little bit about further on how this program differs from current one utilized? I know you mentioned it a little bit um, by the police department. Just talk a little bit about what's the difference between what's already there and, and from what we're asking to be implemented. So I would like to have Assistant Chief Mike Curtin back explain that because he's my right arm and he knows that system well. Mayor Gallego, Councilman Guardado. So the system we have right now is Early Identification and Intervention, EIIP. It's a threshold-based system that is set up based on the 12-month rolling period and thresholds that we decide. For example, three administrative inquiries in a 12-month period, two Professional Standards Bureau investigations in that period, two vehicle pursuits or collisions. That information then is reviewed by an EIIP coordinator, a single point of failure, who then makes a determination of whether or not that gets pushed out to the field. It is a very rudimentary system that I believe is flawed because of that single point of failure. What we are looking for is a more holistic system that can look at the whole officer that not only look at those triggers, but it is truly evidence-based. And Mayor, you, you said something early on that our lives are driven by data. This system would be truly da data-driven, and that's what we are hoping to seek. Thank, thank you. Thank you, and it's been important to see there have been a lot of advances in this type of system because there are many departments who face similar issues, and so we want the opportunity to have the best and latest technology. Vice Mayor. Is it fair to say we're taking what's always been called in police procedural shows and so forth, you know, your file or your jacket, you're taking that and making it basically electronic in a more usable form than you have right now? Uh, Vice Mayor, yes, that, that's definitely true to say. As Assistant Chief Kurtenbach mentioned, we have the system in place right now, but the systems aren't talking to one another, and there's one single point of contact. What we're looking at is a holistic system that's able to track training, accidents, discipline, you name it, and put it all in one place so we're able to help and assist our employees and make them better officers out there. So there are systems you're already aware of, but you have to go through a process to let people bid and so forth. So you, can't, you couldn't start using one today if you wanted to because we have to go out and buy it. Is that a fair yes, analysis? That, I, I would love to say we can just drop and play one and make it work, but no, sir, we have to go right. through a process. So, all right, but, but there are several different firms, I suppose, that make stuff like this, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, but we're not, really, we're not really reinventing anything here, it's just the way you're storing the data and how efficiently you'll be able to use it. Is that a fair summary? So I, I would say it's the next level or the next generation. I'll go back to what the mayor, vice mayor said, that just the fact that systems have gotten so much better in the ability to connect data and information and provide the flags and systems. And, and I think we're definitely due for that. And I think this is a great opportunity for us. Uh, do you have an expectation that officers that maybe who could use more training or however you want to put it will now pop up in this system 
who weren't getting early intervention before? I mean, I assume that's the reason you're promoting so, this. So that Vice Mayor, um, that's one of the many reasons. Um, to be able to catch and track behavior so that we're able to make conscious choices and decisions that will impact our employees as well as impact our, our public. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Garcia. Um, so I have some questions about that system. We got in 2017. Um, what data do we have from it and has has it been a complete failure? Have you not been able to use it at all? Has anybody been? Mayor Gallego, Council Member Garcia, no, it has not been a complete failure, not at all. It's a very basic system. As I mentioned, there are thresholds that are set in the system, but I believe it's fallible because there is a single person, the IIP coordinator, who's responsible for seeing when officers meet that threshold. What we are seeking is something that is far more robust and data-driven that, as Chief Williams mentioned, connects all of our uh, systems in one place. So, for example, if I may expound upon that, training is critically important in our department, as the Chief said. Right now, we keep our training records in one location. Our investigation records, internal investigations, professional standards is in one, one location. We have officer notes, we have division files, we have department files. We have all of this information spread throughout the organization. What we hope to seek in one solution is a true 360 degree view of our employees. So whether it be somebody potentially needing some assistance from our employee assistance unit, or our on-site psychological services provider, or recognizing that an employee is perhaps going down a bad path where behaviors could lead to something more egregious, if you will, we don't have the capability right now. So no, it's not a failure what we have. We're looking at something better that would better serve our officers and our community. Has there been a situation where something's come up through that database and you've been able to stop something or address an issue? The current one? Yes. And is there any of that data that's available? Council Member, I'll have to follow up on what data is available in the system. Some of the information, certainly as it relates to uh, officer wellness would be protected, but in terms of accidents and, and the other behaviors that I alluded to, I'll follow up. Okay, and I got some questions on 1B, so I don't know if you want to go through 1A. I think go ahead and go in. Uh, we'll, I was going to take the cards on 1A and then the cards on 1B, but I think if you want to just go straight into 1B, I, that's I fine. I can wait for 1B if that's all you Okay. Uh, Council Member DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor, and I'm fully supportive of moving forward with these two items. I think that more information is always better uh, than less. Uh, it prevents the, uh, the ability to make bad mistakes, <laughs> and they're bad mistakes sometimes if you don't get all the information in. Uh, no different than getting information on and prejudging things that occur, even in the field, and that's what we did by prejudging what occurred in the field with some of these officers. So the more information we get out, one of the things I'd like to do, if at all possible too, is that, and I go back to the story of the shoplifting case, if the police department were able to get out a timeline a lot faster than what we did, um, it took, what, about a week and a half to get out there in the sense it allowed the media, the public, to only see the last chapter of a book. Well, not even the last chapter, the last page of a book. And think that what occurred in that book it was what occurred in that last page, when in fact there was a lot that headed up to and caused the last page of that book. So if we can also get the police department to put out a timeline immediately afterwards, and it's gonna be hard to do, and I understand that at least a general timeline that goes out, that outlines it so that the media, the public, I mean, there's not a single person out there that saw that video thought, well, that was good, but they didn't see the fact that the individual was shoplifting, that they basically, the police officers gave them orders, commands, they ran from the police. Uh, the second time that they ran was about a mile away. All these things were occurring that the public was not able to see, so others were able to define what occurred when in fact that that's not all that happened. There was a lot else that happened there. So I'd like to make sure that whatever we do, we also look at creating timelines for the police department to get information out in a faster way. The, um, uh, where is this? The, oh, the, uh, for the early intervention system. If I remember correctly, because I've been around for a little while, we had something similar to this back in the, or at, like, the late 2000s. This is before most people up here on the council were there. We had something similar, so if there was a shooting, there was an occurrence that occurred, we were able to identify the gender, the race, everything else immediately, so we're able to track if there was something being done to individuals in an area 
that was unacceptable. I always liked that because it gave us the ability to track what was going on. My understanding is, well, in my understanding, I believe we, we, ended, we ended that program. When did that all stop? Because that's some information that would be able to be, would have been helpful. Pardon me? So, so that, that was called the PASS system, if my right. memory serves me correctly. <clears throat> that's right. it, I couldn't remember. And, and I'm not certain, I don't know if I was gone when, that, when we stopped using that or? You were gone, okay. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But go ahead, I'm sorry, Chief. Uh, Mayor Gallego, Councilman DeCicio, yes, the Chief is correct. It was the Personnel Assessment System, or PASS. It was a very simple system in that there were green light, yellow light, red light thresholds, mm -hmm. but it was tied to the old PACE system which was phased out with our current records management system. And that ended right around, what, about five, seven years ago, approximately. You don't, you, I'm putting you on the spot, you don't need to answer that, but approximately. Approximately. So, I mean, had that been in place, I think that would have been able to help us today to be able to go out to the community and talk to them about that. Um, I'd like to find out exactly why that was canceled. I understand the record management process and the new plan that was put in place, but why was that canceled? I mean, that was something I was always supportive of, to be able to at least get an idea of what's happening out in the field. And at the end of the day, it gave our, you know, gave our department the ability to say, wait a second, this is not occurring. Because I do believe that there are a lot of narratives occurring, some of them extremely false, that our police officers are racist and they're all that stuff. This would be able to point out and say, wait a second, that is not occurring, or they could actually verify that it was, right, with individual officers. So at the end of the day, we really need to be able to provide more information. And I would, my understanding, just looking into what we're looking to do, this early intervention system, is a lot more complicated and a lot more in depth, which I like, personally, because it also goes to the officer and what he or she is going through. So I'm fully supportive of this, but remember the, to the public, we had something similar to this that would have really helped us today that got cut out. Uh, we stopped doing that several years ago for a variety of reasons that I believe, but I'll let them come back and tell us why. Um, so from that, um, I'm fully supportive of moving forward, Mayor, on the ad hoc committee. I kind of forgot we were doing that. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I like the idea that each council member, because we are elected body, that um, we, you know, because we are an elected individual, we represent a larger population, and that population has a, an ability to be able to go in there. And then with the opinion poll, Again, I think this is going to make sure, I would really caution that we try not to politicize that in any way. I know Sam in my office is delivering that message, that we're looking for deep information. And there might very well be a divide, but how big is that divide? Is there a divide? And how big is that with the population? And I think we as a public need to have that information too. So I think that's it for my end of it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Pestor? Yes. Um I'm holding in my hand right now uh, Personnel Support Services Operation Order 3.8 and Item 4, Early uh, Identification and Intervention Program, EEIIP, and I believe that's what you were speaking about. And uh, the language in here is very similar to the language that is in uh, 1A that we'll be voting on. Uh, my question is, we purchased this or we uh, got this uh, software in 2017 and we're 2019. I would like to know, first of all, what the cost was for this software. Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, my understanding is that this module, which is part of IA Pro, the cost is approximately $17,000 per year. Okay. And uh, this module was to capture the data because I'm reading the same language, so it's supposed to have operated, the 2017 was supposed to operate uh, catch, capturing um, the comprehensive risk management software system for early intervention based on individuals' performances and other measurements. Correct. Okay. So what I'm hearing is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm hearing we purchased the software of 2017. We purchased a software that we didn't realize talked to one another systems. Then now we're being asked to modernize and purchase a new software to 2019. 
which now means we don't have any data or what I don't know I don't know if the 2017 system and the 2019 system is now going to merge and be compatible and how do we know the 2019 system is going then to talk to our other system and get the data that we need so I'm just curious So Mayor, Councilwoman, Pastor, all great points. Uh, I will say that technology moves fast and furiously and we have been able to speak with and talk to vendors that will actually be able to deliver on everything that we're talking about as well as make sure we're incorporating all the different systems. I will say in 2017 we didn't know what, what we didn't know. So we've had a lot of challenges with our records management system, I know you know that. A lot of challenges with our ECRIS system, talking to the IA Pro system, talking to a, a lot of different systems. And there are companies out there that are going to be able to help us do just that. Um, and these are technological challenges that have advanced over time. Okay, so in, in hearing that, I am hoping, or actually I'm not hoping, I'm gonna direct since I need to direct from the council. I am going to direct that our IT management is part of this purchase and is able to demonstrate that it talks to the systems. And if not, then we're not purchasing the system. Or we're figuring out a way that our 2017 can talk to our systems because there's brilliant technology people out there that can make these pieces, these systems talk to one another and gather the data and be able to import it and export it and wherever we need to do it. But now I feel like we're now back at the same spot that we were in 2017 and we don't, we can't, we're, we're not moving forward. We're spinning. So that's one of my directives for 1A. Councilwoman Pastor has the floor. Please be respectful and listen to Councilwoman Pastor. Thank you. Um, so I'll wait for 1B. Mayor Councilwoman uh, Pastor, just to, to note, our chief information officer will be part of the procurement team. Though it will include police and our chief financial officer as well. Thank you. To your point. Thank you. And I've had the chance to talk with police superintendents and mayors in other communities, and they have really emphasized that technology has moved a great deal in this area and that there are very strong products that support police officers and good outcomes available. Uh, Councilman Waring had a uh, follow-up question. So the 2017 product is the RMS system, which I think I've really talked more about with Milton <laughs> than I have uh, with the actual department. But it, it's the same system. It's one mm -hmm. component of yep. that system. Is that right? It's separate. Mayor Gallego, Vice Mayor Waring. So I, I don't want to confuse things. Yes, we did transition from our PACE system mm -hmm. to our current records management right. system. All of our internal investigations, so I'll focus on that piece, are managed through IA Pro. This early intervention is a module of that. What, in, in speaking to Councilwoman Pastor's point, this isn't a bad system. It just isn't the best system that we could possibly have. The EIIP is a standalone system that doesn't talk to all of the other systems that I mentioned. So it's an, it's an add-on module versus a holistic, comprehensive, evidence-based system that would allow us to get that aforementioned 360-degree view of an officer throughout his or her career. So I guess, Mayor, I would say, so we had, I don't mean to criticize any one individual, but we had I'm a technophobe. I'd be the last person to tell you what system you should be buying. I'm relying on expert opinion, right, to figure out, does this make sense? Um, I don't remember the discussion particularly about this. It's now been several years since we probably purchased it. But it sounds like it's one company that had a subset product that doesn't talk to its other products. I mean, did anybody think, is that a fair assessment? And if so, why did we buy that product? I don't know. I don't know enough about it. I mean, I guess for me, I, I don't know enough about this area of life to make an informed decision on my own. We're relying on people who theoretically are going to pick the best product. Now, I realize it's two years later, 
I made the same argument about the body cameras, thank, frankly. I mean, two years ago, the camera two years ago and the system two years ago is not nearly as advanced as the one now. Um, I, you know, I'm a little, I mean, is that, what I, is that accurate what I said, though, that it's the same company, this is a subset product, and then one of their products doesn't talk to the other parts of their product? That doesn't make sense to me. I must be misinterpreting. No, Mayor Gallego, Vice Mayor Waring, I, I don't think it's you that's misinterpreting. I'm not communicating this clearly, so I am also not the most technologically savvy person. So let me try I and I think that's another way of saying we're old. Right? <laughs> yes, sir. That's... So let me try and frame it this way. EI Pro, IA Pro, these systems mm -hmm. do what they were designed to do. A professional standards system that allows us to track internal investigations. What they don't do and they were never designed to do was tap in to training records, other employment records, sick leave usage, things that were alluded to earlier that are housed in ECRIS. So they were never designed to talk to those systems. So we're seeking a solution that will combine the information in all of those systems so we get a true view of the employee. So it, it wouldn't be accurate to say that what we have today, the EIIP, isn't doing what it was designed to do, it is. It is a module of IA Pro. It's just limited in its capabilities. And also, as I said before, it's a threshold-based system. So we just set the thresholds, and I'm not trying to minimize this, but based on what we think is right. It's not evidence-based. It doesn't account for other factors, such as what part of a community an officer works in, who he might have, he or she might have contact with within that community. What are some other things that we should take into account? Because not every officer has the same job in the 3,000 members of the organization. Hopefully that provides a bit more context. And I'm glad you mentioned that, and I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second. I guess, so it sounds like, and I'm not saying everybody's perfect, everybody always makes perfect decisions at work, but it sounds like we, we knew what the product did, we just bought the wrong or an inadequate product for what we're trying to use it for now. You know, Vice Mayor, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Okay. So, so, so again, we, we bought a system at the time that we wanted to have to track things that were available at the time and at the moment that we were, were aware of. Over the course of two years, and I'll go back to my conversation or discussion that I had with Councilwoman Pastor, so much has changed technologically for us to be able to know what's going on with our employees in ways that are light speed ahead of the system that we purchase. So our discussion in having this early <laughs> intervention system is to add on that next piece or that next layer that's going to allow us to assess so much more about our employees versus a very limited scope. And I guess just from our perspective, I don't want to pretend to speak for, for Councilman Pastor or some of the other comments that were made, you know, it is, we're kind of buying a souped up version of the same thing we bought two years ago, you know, just two years later. Now you're, you're saying no, so maybe that's bad analysis. So, analysis. so by, Vice Mayor, I'm, I'm not trying to disagree, but, no, no, but, I, but I will say this, we're buying a system that is going to be a more holistic view of our employees and how to track that behavior and manage and mitigate that behavior before bad things can happen. Right. I'm not trying to be disagreeable, it's just we wanted to track behavior two years ago too, so I, I don't know that the goal has necessarily changed. Maybe it's uh, a broader goal, um, but I, we, we wanted to track employee behavior too. We didn't want officers who shouldn't be on the street to be on the street two years ago either. I don't know that the goals of the police department have changed all that much. Yeah. Um, uh, I would say to, to uh, uh, Chief Kurtenbach's point, you know, I, every officer shouldn't be judged on the same scale either, given what they're doing. They talked about that, I think there was an article in the paper, I think it was about Mesa police. I believe one officer had been involved in five shootings, but then what they had done for a job was go out and I think serve felony warrants and so forth. I mean, they were right in the middle of things, every day, all day, dangerous job. Um, you know, that would be more surprising if, if you were doing something else and, and you were involved in these shootings than that. So um, it sounds like this system will distinguish in that. I guess I want to get back, though, to something I asked about earlier. So if, I'm, if I was a sergeant, how many officers do I supervise, typically? Uh, Vice Mayor, Mayor, Vice Mayor, it just depends on what your work unit is. You could have eight, you could have 10, you could have 15. Some units right now have 20. So it's kind of manageable. So a, a sergeant has 20 paper files for the officers they supervise right now? 
or do they use the system that we have right now? So, Mayor, or Vice Mayor, it really depends on who the supervisor is. I'm guessing most of the systems are trackable on an online system type format. Um, but back to your previous question, the current system that we have is not as robust and not able to catch the things that we really know that we need to look at with our employees. But I mean, if the officers, so if one of the 20 officers they're supervising had been involved in a shooting or uh, a discipline or multiple disciplines, they wouldn't know that? I mean, a supervisor wouldn't know that? Mm -hmm. Or a supervisor would? So mayor, vice mayor, it, it all, all depends. Uh, again, on where the systems are, what the information is shared, what IA Pro, as Chief Kurtenbach mentioned, it said, IA Pro looks at the disciplinary side, it looks at the whole discipline police. We have multiple systems that hold and house different systems, and that's why the early intervention system is critical for us. So if I was a sergeant monitoring up to 20 people, I'd really have to go search. If I was like, should we keep putting this person out there? I don't know, you have to go search through multiple systems and potentially paper to sort of piece together the narrative to decide what you want to do? Is that Sometimes that does happen, yes. Okay. Um, uh, that's just a little, it's not even a criticism of you or, or Chief Kirkenbach, it's just that that's a little surprising in this day and age. Yes. I guess a question for Ed, I mean you manage uh, about 11,000 employees who are not police officers, right? So, and maybe separate fire out, so another 1,500 or so. But for our other officers, or for our other employees, excuse me, what system do we use and do we have the same problem there? Because I would think you'd call up a file and there'd be the discipline record and there'd be everything else you need, salary history, job history, right? I mean, so with, with our basic uh, non-sworn employees or civilian employees, we have, well for all our employees we have an, an ECRIS system or an enterprise-wide human resources system that keeps basic information. But, um, and Councilwoman Stark will remember this because she was a department director at one point, there are departmental files and there are central files uh, that are not always uh, harmonized together in that system. So it, we, there is not one comprehensive system in the city, but most uh, civilian employees don't have the jobs that are as complex as our police sure. Uh, officers and have the, the same stakes involved, I guess, in their actions and behaviors. So they wouldn't have, Mayor, probably as thick a file because they wouldn't have nearly as many public interactions and opportunities for something to go wrong. Generally right, speaking, frankly. no. I mean, most employees wouldn't. I wouldn't think. Um, it kind of makes me wonder how you ever figure out who to promote. It seems like it would take forever to, to piece it all together. Um, okay, thank you. This has been enlightening for me. I guess. Thank you. Councilmember Garcia. All right. Uh, how was the EIP, the 17 system procured? How, how did that go about? And um, I will ask Denise, our chief procurement officer, if she can join us as well in case there are additional questions about procurement. I don't know that we know specifically with EIIP, what that procurement process was, but we can certainly find that out. Well, did we do an RFQ, an RFP? Again, I, I don't know. It's that we 2017, know that right here. so it's it's pretty fresh. It, it, we can easily find that out. I don't know that the four of us sitting up here know that specific detail right now. Okay, and then <clears throat> the follow-up question on the your 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 idea on the length of the implementation of the new system. I know MCSO under court order has been going through a similar process and they've had a lot of trouble getting it uh, implemented and so with the conversations you've had, how long do you think before this is implemented and effective from where you get the system? Mayor, Councilman Garcia, that's a, that's a great question. So going through the procurement process, uh, we've talked to a couple of different companies and systems and they say that once we get the approval and authorization, it can take them anywhere from three to eight or nine months to get uploaded and ready to go. Okay. Um, it, I mean, that, it's unacceptable hearing what we've, we've been going through. But what, I want, what comes up with that is, is this conversation and I hope the ad hoc committee can support in that where I think the mistake in 17 was community involvement and oversight and so I hope that with this new system we're able to pair it with 
ad hoc committee or, or whatever we come up with to make sure that there's there's community oversight over it because I think what we've seen is completely uh, failed. Councilmember DeCicio. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, there is a reason why I vote against some of these IT things is because of the lack of compatibility uh, in the future. So if you go through my record, you'll see that. But at the end of the day, we're talking about the RMS system, correct? Um, I'd like to get a you know, letter to the council, at least, describing the current status of the RMS system. The city of Phoenix, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but we spent about $30 million on a system that doesn't work. So is that correct or not? It was that, did we spend $30 million on that? So, Mayor, Councilman, DeCicio, uh, I would need to get the absolute okay. dollar amount. I know we've been very challenged with that system. Oh, you, please, Mayor, you, we've got to get these people to stop doing this, interrupting. We're having a conversation here that's civil. <laughs> I mean, seriously, let's, let's, you'll have your time. Everyone will have their yeah, time. These are but, serious issues. Yeah, so stop that. So, uh, Mayor, <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm serious. Stop it. So, um, I feel like I'm talking to my kids. So at the end of the day, the RMS system that we have, uh, we spent approximately how much on that system? Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, I, I don't know the exact number, but it is multiple millions of dollars. We should distinguish, though, RMS, or Records Management System, is a, is a different system than, this, than IA Pro or the Early Intervention System. Agreed. It's, that's about the records that the police are keeping Agreed. with their interactions as opposed to a personnel system. Yes. And this is what we're talking about with the earlier intervention is related to our personnel system and uh, RMS is related to the daily work of the officer, the reports and those sorts of things. Agreed. But what I'm also bringing back home is that we've had major functional problems with that system. And that was about $30 million. I think we kind of wasted a lot of money on that. But outside of that, I think one of the things, this opens up a bigger discussion too, is not just with the RMS or anything else we're doing, you've got to look at compatibility. Uh, when hospitals and others in the private sector went through this whole you know, system through the Obamacare years, you know, have, it's amazing what really did come out of that is basically a centralized system. I had to go in for a medical procedure today and without anesthesia, so I'm just letting people know. <laughs> but at the end of the day, so I'm fine, I'm cognizant here. But uh, the, uh, the fact that, I mean, a simple thing is like, they knew what medication I was taking the minute I walked in. They, they said, hey, you're no longer taking this. It was that instantaneous. Um, likewise, the system that we look at needs to be compatible, not only with what we need today, but to Mr. Garcia's comments, like, you know, we didn't do that back then. Well, back then was a different time. You know, a lot of the things, and granted, there were individuals from, you know, from Phoenix, that were complaining about it, but it wasn't at the level that it is today. So I'm gonna give you know, everyone a little credit on this thing. So as we move forward, the, you've gotta be able to look at compatibility issues going forward. And not only with this, uh, and I'll talk to Ed to this, but the compatibility that we have with this needs to take into account also that we have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, private information that is medically related that cannot be disclosed and will not be disclosed at any time. I want to make sure we are clear on that because that is private information of, individu of an individual. Uh, likewise, the compatibility of whatever program we're going to be looking at, whatever system, which I like, the idea we're going, that doesn't mean I'm going to vote for it because I'll do the same thing I did before. You know, I want to make sure it's the right one, but it's got to be, it's got to have the ability to not only plan for what you have today and the needs of today, but something that may be two to three years from now. And it's hard to tell with technology moving at this rapid pace today. I mean, if you haven't followed what's happening in technology, which my kids inform me on, on a regular basis what's happening, but until we know that, you know, what I want to make really clear is that whenever we do this uh, step, we don't come back five years later and we put it on the record, this is the best that we could do today, okay? But that's on our end of it. On your end, you've got to make sure that it works. So the RMS system that we have in place today, I believe does not work and that we wasted 30 million. I, I believe that. So that is a fundamental. Um, but likewise, you have a responsibility on your side of the table there. You know, we'll 
I'll make statements like this is the best we can do, but you've got a responsibility that it is, that is workable, it's functional, and it's able to be able to be adapting to, to, to new changes moving forward. If you don't do that, we're going to be in this mess again. I mean, literally. And the other thing I'd like to get, if I could, um, along with the RMS, I'd like to know in the last five years, how much has the city spent on all IT-related uh, items? You know, how much money have we spent on IT? And how the lack of compatibility has been occurring throughout each of those systems. Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman Guardado and then Councilwoman Pastor. So in, in terms of the oversight, right, like I understand, you know, that we're going to be able to track things a lot better. Like how many times a week or how many, you know, times a day maybe are we going to be checking the oversight? You know, checking that the program is actually functioning the right way, and how is it, and who raises the red flags, and and how is it that we can also get that information, right? Because being blindsided, I don't think it's fun, and I just think it's important for us to be able to understand, you know, where where the oversight is at, and and be and making sure that we also have people from the community that's part of the oversight that can help, you know this process be a lot smoother and making sure that we have different eyes and different people looking looking at the system as well. So Mayor, Mayor Councilman Guardado, um, that goes back to Councilman Garcia's point of making sure we have community involvement. We would need to have community involvement in writing the policy. Uh, we would need to have community involvement as we discuss and talk about what we want to have in the system. We already have some checks and processes in place where sergeants, lieutenants, commanders are supposed to be periodically checking those and we need to talk through this with the community to make sure that we're meeting what the expectations are from the community as we move forward. Councilwoman Pastor. So, um, in listening to the dialogue of Councilman Waring and uh, really trying to understand what a process is. Um, a city has HR process and protocols. Am I correct? That's correct. For all city employees. And in having process and protocols, there are items that are on a checklist or that a supervisor or a manager oversees and looks at in a very holistic well-being uh, way, as a manager, that's what we're required, to uh, look at our team and see, uh, are they performing? Where's their mental state? Uh, are they uh, following directions? Uh, how are they communicating with one another? How do they operate in a team? All these elements come in uh, and play in an HR uh, performance. So I find it hard to believe when I'm hearing a dialogue going on and hearing, well, one may do it this way, but the other one may do it this way. We may take paperwork over here and use the system over here and do all these other things when there are protocols that are required by managers and supervisors to follow. And when they don't follow, we have a responsibility to make sure they are not to tell and write a performance review saying they are not following these things. So where I find it hard is that we have provided for quite some time as I sat on as I have sat on this council for 5 years tools and resources for early intervention. Yet I feel that there's a lack of will to utilize these tools and resources and accountability for not using these resources and being transparent. So I don't want to move ahead on item 1A and purchase something that we are not going to use to the level that we need to use it and hold people accountable. So I struggle with this right now. So Mayor Councilwoman Pastor, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I am saying that the current system that we have is not able to do all the things that you are saying that we should do. 
Yes, we should hold our supervisors accountable. Yes, we should be accountable. Yes, we should be responsible. Yes, we should know what's going on with our employees. And our ask is to make sure that we have a system in place that's able to do that, ma'am. No, I, I get that, Jerry. But we have been doing this for the last five years. And there are systems into play. They may not be as modernized as the system that you're asking for, but there are systems into play and protocols. So that's where I'm struggling. <laughs> and I, I hear you. I hear you. Vice Mayor Waring. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Chief Kurtenbach. Thank you, thank you Mayor. Uh, Councilman Pastor, I, I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. So our supervisors do hold their employees accountable. What we are seeking is a system not when something bad has already happened and how we respond, but to identify those things before they occur. So I just want to be very clear that once we have an incident of misconduct, let's say, we document that incident, that sits in a database, we can reference that for comparable discipline, for meeting out discipline, we do that. Our supervisors are responsible for completing monthly supervisory notes on their employees, which go into the monthly or, or to the yearly PMG. What, and going to the vice mayor's point earlier, which Chief Williams alluded to when we talk about the span of control for our supervisors, a sergeant, and I'll talk about sergeants with officers, should absolutely know what's going on with his or her employees. But with an agency of our size, employees have the right to transfer. Employees could transfer from a different shift to a different precinct, to a different work unit. And right now, that information that doesn't rise to the level of misconduct sits on paper. So I understand that. I, I completely understand that. And, and thanks for the clarity. My point is that we have an Operation Order 3.8 that this prevention and this intervention started in 2017. So my worry is all of that data we are not looking at and we are not using, and now we're asking for a modernized system to, to look at it in a holistic way. When we purchased a product and it doesn't talk to the systems, that's where my frustration is. And Mayor and, Gallego, Councilman Pastor, we, we are using the system that currently exists. It's just a limited system. So I don't want there to be any misconception that we spent money on a system and it's just sitting idly not being utilized. It's limited. To your point, we agree wholeheartedly. It doesn't talk to the other systems. That is a, an important flaw in what we have today, but it is being utilized. Got it. Vice Mayor Waring. So I, uh, I appreciate where you guys are sitting. You're getting a lot of you know, public pressure and so forth, and you, you want to comply with community and council uh, requests, and you want to do the best job possible, and you want to make it as easy on the supervisors to gather the information that they need. So I appreciate the uh, further explanation about you know, the span of control. I'm still a little surprised um, that there isn't more of a coherent um, we're going to promote this person or we're not going to promote this person sort of system long before 2017. I, I just would have thought that's a thing, right? Watch police procedural shows and they talk about their jacket or their file or something. I just think somehow that's getting to the right person. Obviously, I clearly didn't ask the right questions in seven years on this council of do, do we know who we're supposed to be promoting and so forth. I just assumed that was something that was addressed in the 80s or 90s once we transferred to computers. Um, Part of my questions is, is just me getting my back up because I am outside my area of expertise to the extent I have one. I can learn a lot of things. As my nine-year-olds will tell you, they know way more about computers than, than I do. And uh, that's not the embarrassing part. The embarrassing part is they knew more about my computers and my phone when they were four. That was actually pretty humiliating. I, I just, I know what I don't know. And this is one of the things I don't know. So, so when the department or Ed or whoever comes to me in 2017 and says we need this thing, now I vote no a lot. So some of you guys cheer when I actually vote yes, so that's very gratifying, but I, I do vote no. Part of it is, 
you know, I just I get kind of an uneasy feeling about, you know, some of this stuff because I don't know enough about it and I don't really even know who to ask. Um, so I guess I'll put it this way. Is the same group or same individuals or individual who recommended the system in 2017 working on this project again? Because clearly we, we kind of picked the wrong thing. And I'm not blaming anybody individually, but I will say, you know, try to see it from my perspective, it's a little frustrating. I'm driving while blind. You're giving me information. I'm like, yeah, they say they need this. You know, I, I try to make an informed decision, but I don't really have the tools to go out on my own and, and figure out what would be the best system for the department. I'm not a police officer, I'm not a chief, I'm not really a supervisor of anybody. We have had to do that. I mean, and when you go down the list, I, I don't really have a way to do that. That's not really a fair ask of us, so we have to trust. And I am not the most, most trusting person. So when, uh, you know, one of the local TV stations called me several times, uh, I don't know why me, but they did. It was ABC 15, and good for them, because there were issues about RMS um, and the rollout and how long it took. So I would have to call Milton and then Milton would get back to him and explain why it's not that big a deal and so forth. But, but that was a little frustrating um, because I don't know enough about to answer the questions intelligently. Maybe I should. There was a recent article about a Silicon Valley congressman who was complaining that the other congressmen and women don't know anything about computers. Is that really that surprising? I mean, you, know, you can't be expert in everything. So I'm, I'm curious like what would give me confidence to vote for this today or to move forward with this today where I kind of feel like I got, again, nobody's specific fault, but a little bit burned, you know, just a couple years ago for a fairly high dollar item. Not fairly, a high dollar item. I mean, what, what's really changed? So, so Mayor, I'm Vice sorry. Mayor, what we're talking about here is procuring a tool that allows us to bring data that exists together. The system that Chief Kurtenbach and Chief Williams described is, I guess, in the silo of internal affairs, internal investigations, right. that information. There's also information about employee wellness that's not in that because it's, that's internal affairs, employee wellness. Uh, there, there's some up training, for example. So what this is is a tool that goes and gets information from all those systems and brings it to one place so somebody doesn't have to go to each place physically, which is a challenge when you're supervising that many people or people are moving around. So it, it, it's, it's trying to use a, a different tool to get the information that we have and harmonize that information. I mean, I think I, I understand what the goal is. I'm, I'm just afraid we're going to be here a year, two years from now, and the goal won't be achieved <laughs> for some reason or this wasn't the, the exact right item. Uh, and I understand your point about the supervisors, and I'm not busting on supervisors, but if you have to go to different places to find out about your employees, then that's what you have to do. I mean, at some point, you know, I, I, I'm sympathetic to a point, mm -hmm. but you know, if you have to go to a couple different places or make a couple calls to find out if somebody's been disciplined or something, then that's what you need to do. I mean, that, that's kind of a major thing of being a supervisor. If you don't want the responsibility, don't get promoted. But um, yes, it would be great to make it easier and have it all in one place. Um, I'm just trying to ferret out like, what's really changed, I think the goal is the same. Uh, maybe it's a ramped up goal, maybe the technology is better. It has been a couple of years. Now I made the same point about the cameras <laughs> a couple of years ago, so I, it's kind of funny being on the other end. Um, to hear, well the technology's gotten a lot better, I made that point about the cameras. If you wait a couple of years, look at the phones. Look at how many more things and how much better and cheaper it is just a couple of years later. The product that used to be a thousand bucks is now a hundred bucks. And then they quickly stop making them and they go on to something even better still. Um, that's happening in every area of technology, so that's not that much of a surprise. But, um, you know, some of this technology stuff, the experiences we had, frankly, an experience I've talked about with you, Ed, at the state that they voted on right before I got there, the thing was a disaster. And they thought it was going to be the be and end all, you know, be all end all. So, um, I don't know what I'm going to do exactly with this, but I want to make sure we don't, you know, just waste money on something that's not going to accomplish the goal that I think we all want. It just that makes me nervous. Thank so, you, Vice Mayor. And to that point, this, this is what this item is asking is for us to conduct a process. We are not purchasing anything at this time. So we go through a process, we analyze the products that are out there and what the cost is and their effectiveness and bring that information back to you before we would ask to enter into a contract to do that. Right. But Mayor, I think, I think my question, or at least one of my questions was, you know, is it the same crew running the search? 
then you're taking your head no, Chief. So it's going to be at least different. Maybe that's a question for Ed. Yeah, the, the uh, information technology department will support that along with the procurement experts, mm -hmm. but the experts in the, in the, uh, what in the need has to come from the police department and those would be identified by Chief uh, Williams and Chief Kurtenbach. So, Mayor, Vice Member, if, Mayor Waring, if I may, um, we're actually having different people step up in this process because we know that this new procurement can add on additional tools. So we have the folks in the training bureau, we have folks in IT, so this isn't just the Professional Standards Bureau looking at this. Again, I go back to my holistic approach comment. We have more people in the department that are going to feed into the system, plus add on the dynamic that Councilman Garcia brought in, having community members have a voice and a word in what type of things that they would like to see. Are we gonna ask the business community to potentially help? I mean, they might know, they might know of systems that are fantastic and might really work for us. I don't know, but I mean, is that something that could be done? That's, that's what I'd like to see. The private sector, they got a lot, of, you know, they can't, they can't afford to just spend 30 million on something that doesn't work, they've got a business. So um, that, that is something that certainly I would encourage you to do. Uh, I'm not getting on our IT department, but I'm sure there are people, if you can call Bill Gates, not the one who used to work here, <laughs> the one who didn't graduate from Harvard, the other one. Um, if you could call him, then that's what you should do. I don't know if he'll take the call, but you know, if you could try to get somebody who's really just top notch and they're like, oh, maybe they'll invent something for you, I don't know. But I, I would certainly encourage you to think outside the box on this, because the way we've been doing it doesn't seem to have worked, which is how we come to be here in the first place in part. So, thank you. So, um, Council Member Garcia and then Council Member Pastor. I, so, so I think we should get the system, just like I thought we should get the cameras. But I think if we don't fundamentally change the way we look at policing and involve community and actually address this issue with the urgency that it needs, um, then these systems are for naught. And like we saw this 2017 system. And so I, I again, I'm, I'm for the system. I think you should get the tools that you need. But I do, again, uh, want to point out if community is involved, both if, if it's possible in the procurement, if, if community could be involved early on, the best, the earlier the better. Um, and then hopefully once the ad hoc's on, we could follow through with the implementation. Council Member Pestor. So are you asking when you say community involvement, are you asking for community involvement to be from the beginning, to look at the system, to look at if it's gathering the data that is needed, to look at a holistic intervention piece? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. Um, my understanding is, yes, we're going through this uh, conduct procurement process. This is the beginning that we go through this process, and then you'll come back and you'll say, oh, these following companies do these following things, and I'm hoping that you test it out and test it with our system to see what really works with our system. And then it'll come back, and or we'll go out for an RFP, and an RFP, we have these, these companies. So it is beginning a process. So I want to be clear about that. This is the beginning of a process to purchase another system. Okay. All right. Thank you. We will move to our citizen comments on this item. Uh, we will begin with Warren Stewart, Jr., followed by Dr. Ann Hart. There are microphones on either end of the aisle. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Mayor Council. With the high amount of officers using deadly force against civilians and other instances of police misconduct, it has caused a growing amount of public uproar and has led to mistrust between citizens and police, leading to even further negative interactions. Procuring a holistic early warning and intervention system can work in predicting which police officers are at risk of engaging in neg negative interactions with the community members, which we have seen too many instances in the African American community specifically. The Phoenix Police Department can provide targeted early interventions to prevent such interactions, rather than responsibly dealing with the officers after incidents occur. And in conclusion, many of our daily operating systems are constantly being upgraded on our phones, computers, social media, and other forms of technology to strengthen security measures which prevent viruses and threats. 
these upgrades and these systems that automatically happen on our phone and we just push a button allows our lives to function properly. So we must invest in an early intervention system that is modernized, highly functional and accountable as other departments around the nation because it will help prevent the viruses and the threats that are in our police department against the civilians who experience police brutality. We are asking for a system that works for us, the people, since the system of injustice is working against us. I would hope that you would seriously consider the best early intervention system that will help gain the security that we need and weed out the threats in our police department in the city of Phoenix. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ann Hart will be followed by Toy Sanford. I would like to say good afternoon to the mayor and the police chief, Chief Jerry Williams and um, council persons. Um, I'm glad to be a part today of this forum to hear your integrated dialogue on this topic. And it's very obvious that there are a lot of concerns and questions and I'm glad to hear that being discussed to the forefront. But it sounds to me as though at the end of the day, we know there needs to be some additional oversight in this matter so that as one of your councilmen so clearly suggested in the, in the beginning, so we can have both sides of the stories because we know the truth is stranger than fiction. And I agree that we do need a holistic approach and nothing is more surreal than to have the actual data. Um, one thing that I would like to say is that we do have in this audience later on, you may be able to be identified with who those are, members of the Community Police Trust Initiative who has been um, a part executed since 2015. And as a part of that Community Police and Trust Initiative, we sent several recommendations to the city manager and one of those recommendations included exactly what we're expecting today. Now, it is true that through evolution, technology improves. And I would hope that we would all to agree, and I would like to render and encourage that we do consider that we do use this technology so we can evolve in this process. And as a part of that community initiative and trust committee um, in May 2015, one of the things that was on our report was to develop, build trust and legitimacy for continued policy oversight for technology and that the public be engaged in this process to include a solicitation of feedback from the community as the best has to do with training, crime reduction, and education, and officer wellness and safety. So I encourage implementation of this technology. Thank you. Toy Sanford will be followed by Garrick, McFad Garrick McFadden. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Chief Williams, Mr. Zerker, Chief Kurtenbach, my name is Toy Sanford. I am speaking to you as a representative of the community, but I'm also a doctoral candidate in psychology over at Grand Canyon University, and I say that because I have the research expertise now in behavioral science. The other reason I wanted to speak to you is because I am retired sergeant from the Phoenix of from Phoenix Police Department. And I also had the opportunity to be one of the two people who actually created the initial early intervention program that got international recognition um, several years ago. Uh, my studies in psychology and my ongoing interest in early intervention has led me to creating my own consulting company. And I would love to be able to um, assist with some of your procurement processes if that be available. But one of the things that I do want to stress to you, and especially since um, looking at some of the history of early intervention programs and where they've come today, there seems to be a misconception in them being either a behavioral um, program or an auditing tool. And listening to the discussion here, it seems to be a little convoluted. So I would urge you to decide whether you want your early intervention to be an auditing tool, which is something like what I've heard MCSO doing, or if you want it to be a behavioral tool. And truth be told, it is not a personnel system 
where it is tracking a lot of the evaluations. It is supposed to be designed to draw inferences of problematic behaviors like Chief Kurtenbach mentioned before it becomes an issue to your constituents in the community. Unfortunately, there is a limitation in the type of software that is out there, and that's where I am planning on helping with uh, addressing the research to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Garrick will be followed by Michelle Rose. City Council, Mayor, Chief of Police. Um, I sat in this beautiful building reading on my phone the best studies of, by Ch the University of Chicago about EIS systems. We know that we need a machine learning system. Is our current EIS system, is it a machine learning? Because we know that we can game the system if it is just a set mar of, tri of marks that are stated. Second, we know that it needs to go back farther than one year because we know that the greatest predictor of police misconduct is officers that have been at a suicide, and especially if it's a child. But if it only goes back one year, the cumulative effect of being in those taking on the trauma of those suicides will cause. We also know that the best effect of that police who have four-year college degrees are 34% less likely to have misconduct than those are. So do we have a program to get our police who do not have college degrees the tools to receive a college degree to make us safer? There's so many questions. On this, I put myself as in favor of this. But the questions that have arose of what we have right now, this system, is not machine learning. So therefore, it is not the best practice and it can be beaten. Because if you know that police chases are one of the things that cause misconduct or gives you points, then our police might be less active. So a question that the council can ask is, is this machine learning and do the officers know what type of information goes into the algorithm that is being used? Thank you for your time, my time. Mayor. Councilman Nowakowski. Is it machine learning or what is it? Well, I don't know that we would know what solution, we don't have a solution. Oh, we don't. So, Mayor, members of council, so the, the answer to the question that the gentleman just met, mentioned, is it a machine running? We're, we're letting you know that today we need more components to make the machine run and function the way it's supposed to function. And that's why we're asking for the, the different system. But I think it, uh, the woman that spoke just before brought up a valid point of what are we trying to gather because for me it's early intervention is really early prevention and really the well-being of uh, the police officer and so is that what is the tool that we're looking for and so I, I know you don't have the answer but I think that's 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 what the group and the process need to figure out what is the best to gather what we need in order to have early prevention. Councilmember Garcia. Yeah, I, Mr. I think it was McFadden. Um, I don't think we understood, or or everyone up here or in the room understood what you meant. Um, so we could just real quickly explain what machine learning is, AI, or however you want to define it quickly. Thank you. Yes. So a person from the University of Arizona, along with these researchers from the University of Chicago, did an implementation in the Charlottesville Police, or Chattanooga Police. What machine learning does is it takes the personnel, right, the neighborhood that they are working in, and then other factors which they will determine if it's more likely for a police officer to have a, a conduct of misconduct. What this machine learning does is it eliminates 32% of the false negatives while making sure that 12% has better outcomes. This puts our police, so police that might be put on the sideline, 
there's a less likely event of them being put on the sideline, while more effectively finding the police they're more likely to have. Like, as I said, the greatest indicator of police misconduct is a police officer who, wa uh, who does a suicide, right? And the current system, with only being one year, does not track the cumulative effects of those suicides. So just from the start, if our, with all this data that is coming into our system, if, if it is not learning and finding and taking what has happened in the past, that data is useless. Like the mayor said, we need to have data and we need to analyze the data. The best program right now is a machine learning EIS system. And it sounds like from the questions that, from your interrogation of them, sounds like this is not a machine learning and they will be back here in two years saying, we need a new system. So that is my question. Is it machine learning or not? Thank you. Thank you. And today's vote is to authorize the department to go out and look for solutions. So we are not recommending any one solution today. So we can go out and look for the most advanced technology and, and take Councilmember Garcia's we're suggesting we talk with the community. Vice Mayor Wang suggesting we talk with beat leaders in the business community and get whatever is the best practice. Um, anything you wanted to add on that? All right. Uh, Michelle Rose will be our next speaker, followed by Princess Lucas Wilson. Hello. My name is Michelle Rose. I'm a resident of Scottsdale. I support the Early Intervention Software Initiative. Uh, my first recommendation would be for every future uh, meeting with the community and definitely anything involving technology to bring some of your tech team here who can explain these things. Um, so for this, we need to make sure that holistic data collection is um, maintained, uh, recording excessive force complaints and the outcome of the investigations. Uh, any incidents of officers being on the Brady list, which in my opinion should be an immediate disqualifier, they shouldn't even be hired. Uh, falsification of police records, such as they, re they put one thing on the report and then a video comes out and they change the report. Um, that should be an automatic disqualifier. Obstruction of justice when they refuse to testify or not delivering police reports and videos, uh, which would include refusal or just inability uh, to wear body cameras turned on. Uh, also, pre and post hiring history of like their personal history of uh, domestic violence or any criminal history, uh, as well as this new information from the Plain View project, which involved Phoenix police officers celebrating police brutality. And this information should be owned by the public. It should be maintained and held by the Citizens Review Board, which we'll talk about later. And be sure that the uh, CRB is an independent third body, which maintains full control of the data warehouse. It should be elected officials which represent the community that look like the community they represent. Thank you very much. Uh, Jimmy Bethel followed by Ken Baker. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Princess and then Jimmy. Good afternoon, Mayor, Chief Williams and City Council members. Safe policing um, is essential to our well-being, and I'm here for the Maricopa County NAACP uh, branch. Although perceptions and interpretations vary regarding police encounters, the NAACP Maricopa County branch acknowledges the persistent pain associated with the loss of loved ones and the related community concerns about safe policing and acknowledge that these concerns may also have a racial historical context. Moving forward, it is crucial that we as a community and the Phoenix Police Department focus on solutions to these long-standing public law enforcement and community safety issues. We also acknowledge that African-American community leaders and others have proposed solutions in the past and we welcome other 
allies in this endeavor. It is particularly imperative at this juncture that we as a community go beyond recommendations to plan implementation with continued community input. We ask that the following be considered for implementation with the sense of urgency as expressed by community members. Uh, first, some of these have already been mentioned. Uh, Civilian Oversight Committee of Board to review police conduct and make recommendations for improvement. Next, early warning system to identify triggers, symptoms of possible mental health issues or unmanaged emotional distress experienced by police officers. As we believe these conditions have potential to jeopardize public safety, we recommend pulling effective officers offline before unprofessional conduct occurs. Next, although there have been opportunities for community feedback in which some voices were heard, a community survey is recommended, this has been recommended before, uh, to further foster transparency. The survey would serve as an additional method for feedback to increase community voices regarding their respective safety concerns and policing. Uh, next, uh, conduct additional listening community meetings in small groups to facilitate more preventative interactions between the community and the Phoenix Police Department and to also generate solutions. Could you please give us your final thought? This is my final thought. Perfect it's, timing. It's coming up. Uh, final thought, review recommendations made by the Community Engagement and Task Force approved by the Phoenix City Council on January 11, 2011, that may still need implementation to garner community trust and specifically review those recommendations related to improving the process for accountability. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jimmy Bethel, followed by Ken Baker. I'm Jimmy Bethel. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> happens all, I'm, I'm also a singer, so please excuse me. Uh, I met Chief Williams uh, last year at Coffee. Coffee with the Chief, I think it was event. And I tried to explain to the chief at the time, and I'm, I'm not playing a blame, a blame game, but uh, people want to know how they can get home without getting shot by police officers, okay? That's the bottom line. People don't want to hear about statistics. If you want statistics, Stanford University did a 10-year study of over one million traffic stops just to tell us that black and brown people were discriminated against and were stopped more than any other race, okay? I'm a retired police detective with 32 years of police and security experience. I love my cops. Nobody loves cops any more than I do, and I, I, I've been through it all with the police department, good and bad. But let me say this. I have spent the last two and a half years developing a product that will absolutely identify safe hands on traffic stops. Police officers stop people at night and they don't know who they're approaching in a vehicle with darkly tinted windows. Police officers put their lives on the line. I'm not playing the blame game here again, but had the chief listened to me, one officer might still be living and at least I think the two officers that were killed on traffic stops, their families, would have had financial assistance if the chief had even helped in any way me putting safe hands in vehicles. What safe hands does basically is to identify yourself as not having a weapon when you're pulled over by a police officer. The main reason police officers shoot people is because they were lunging for something. But all my years of experience, I'm in uniform with a gun on. Nobody's lunging for anything. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but Thank one you thing that the police department has to realize is that you have racist cops on the Phoenix Police Department. 
all police departments throughout the United States have racist police officers on it. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ken Baker. Let's, let's promote. Followed by Walter Nicholson. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, last time I spoke, I spoke in front of the city for a contractual thing with the Bank One Ballpark, or the America West Arena, I apologize. And the one thing is, is it was kind of political, and then there's contractual things. So it sounds like this ex item 1A is you're trying to find out if we want to start a process to start a purchase of another software product. And I'm a pragmatic guy, and uh, I kind of would ask you, why can't you just improve what you have or figure out and pay for an IT group to integrate all of the softwares that you have to accomplish what the chief wants to do. And then second, why can't the union and the and plea work together? Because they're certifying people. Why can't they have a hand in how things are certified? And that's just a layman's personal, just looking and listening to you. And I'm impressed with the questions, because that's what I would ask. Um, you know, we bought something in 2017. It's not like we bought it in 2000. So the goal, I think, is to make sure that things can be communicated with in an easier fashion. But I agree with one of the uh, council persons to say, well, if you have to do a little more work to make it happen, that's what's going to have to happen. If you don't wish to do that, don't be a supervisor, don't be a sergeant, don't, don't be able to sign off on your group. Um, if you have too many people in your group that you can't certify everyone in the things, then we can reduce that. But there's operational things to do. Software will not, I'll conclude with this, software will not solve a human problem. And what this police department has and the city has is a human problem. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Walter Nicholson followed by Redeem Robinson. The Honorable Mayor, Police Chief, and members of the City Council. I'm not computer savvy. I'm just listening. Some things I understand what you're saying, some things I don't. I want you to know this, and I'm sure the American people would like to know, you said the police officers are going to get body cameras. What will be the consequences if they turn them off? Fire them. What will be the consequences? I'm sure the American people would like to know that. And there ain't no question they can turn them off or turn them on at will. My primary question is two. What would be the consequences for the police officers that pulled guns on that family? Why would they be left on the police force to do the same things all over again? Well, I'm 75 years old. When I was a child growing up, the old people used to say, take a rotten apple out of the barrel. My next question. I was kidnapped, arrested, assaulted, and seriously injured. Why is it that I can't file charges against the people that did it? Why is that? I would really like to know, and I think the American people would like to know too, because if that happened to me, and it's okay for me to be assaulted, arrested, kidnapped, and assaulted, uh, uh, and injured, not being a suspect of anything, 
not being accused of any crime, is that okay? The Constitution of the United States and our laws is important to me. I hear other people talk real good, but they don't do nothing to uphold the law. The laws are based on the Constitution of the United States. And whether anybody wants me to be an American or not, I am, and I'm proud to be. I feel like I and my neighbors, my brothers and sisters, deserve an answer to that. Did you notice I didn't paint anybody a color? Did you notice that? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your time, and thank you. I, I, you know, like I said, because you locked me up and threw me away and put me in prison all my life, I'm not familiar with a lot of things that you guys are familiar with, so I just got to speak the truth, and I hope you can accept it. Redeem Robinson, followed by J.J. Johnson. Thank you, Mayor and City Council and Chief Jerry for, um, for calling this policy session here. I believe that we are moving in the right direction. It seems like we're moving in the right direction here. We seem like we have some solutions here. However, I'm a little concerned as a citizen, as a black man in this city here, we keep hearing, we keep going through with these meetings and, and, and talking, town halls and, and talking about solutions. Can you assure us today that we're actually going to get some solutions today? Because I don't know about anybody else in this room, I'm a little frightened to live in this city right now. I, I, ju I just got to be honest, and I've lived in some of the worst cities in this country. I've lived in West Baltimore. And I fear Phoenix more than West Baltimore. Because our police department, it, 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 has, a bad, it has a bad reputation right now. So I just want you all to assure us, uh, are, are you, are, okay. I just want you all to assure us that we're actually going to get some solutions today. Thank you. Thank you. J.J. Zanchin, followed by Vidi Hernandez. Mayor, Council, I've been coming before this Council since at least 2012 talking about uh, officer accountability. And basically nothing has been accomplished at this point, we have seen a police officer killed probably by his peers because he came forward to report misconduct. That was Sergeant Sean Drenth. We, over and over again, it's like Groundhog Day. Every time we come back and talk about this, it's like y'all have never heard about this before. And the way the system is set up, when an officer engages in gross misconduct, and I'm going to use the name of Justin LeClaire, Justin LeClaire was arrested for sexual misconduct with a minor. And when he was arrested, he resigned, and y'all didn't do an administrative investigation after that. So we never got to the bottom of what was missed. In his case, what was missed was writing 500 DUIs over a four-year period. He was a regular 700 patrol officer. He wrote 500 DUIs to fluff up his overtime because he was supporting two families. And y'all missed it. I have talked to, I've talked to council members. I've talked to police chiefs about this. When an officer, can, you know, like Tim Morris raped a woman while he was on duty in one of our patrol Tahoes, he resigned and there was no administrative investigation. Nobody looked at how there was a vacuum of accountability with his supervisors. Nobody looked at where, where did his squad mates think he was with that woman that he was raping in the back of the Tahoe. 
Where did the dispatchers think he was with that woman? You know, where did, you know, that she was arrested by Scottsdale PD and then he just dropped her off at home after he raped her. So nothing has changed in that system as far as how he could pick her up from Scottsdale and just drop her off at home after he sexually assaulted her. If an officer goes dark for 41 minutes like we had here, he's probably in trouble. The things that kill police officers break down into three things, felonious action, dr accidents, and cardiovascular accidents, cheeseburgers. Those are the things that kill police officers. If an officer goes dark for 41 minutes, he's probably in trouble, but we haven't fixed the system. Fix the system. I'm tired of coming here talking about this. Thank you. B.D. Hernandez, followed by Xenia Arona. Aronia. Who's that? B.D. Hernandez, followed by Xenia. Oh, thank you so much. All right, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to give this statement in, in Spanish because I know there's Spanish-speaking families that are here. Eh, voy a dar este mensaje para las familias que están aquí um, y saber qué está pasando, un poco lo que está pasando, ¿verdad? Familias no han tenido justicia día tras día tras día de que esto está pasando por años. Ha estado pasando la violencia de los oficiales a las personas y a las familias y no hay justicia para estas familias. Los policías tienen derechos, pero los derechos de las familias se ignoran completamente. También hay un sindicato que hoy pidió que mucha gente viniera a esta junta a apoyar a los oficiales. Este sindicato, esta unión de policías, es, un, es una unión de las más racistas de los Estados Unidos. Es una unión que apoyó la SB 1070, que estuvo con la Jan Brewer, ahí, ¿verdad?, cuando estaba firmando esta, um, estaba firmando esta ley racista, la más racista de los Estados Unidos. Apoyaron a Arpaio cada elección y más reciente, en el último, los últimos dos años, apoyaron a Trump, diciendo que ellos van a hacer, um, ¿verdad? Y acá están, que, est que van a enforzar las leyes de inmigración de Trump. So, por eso estamos aquí también, ¿verdad? Porque este sindicato y la representación de los oficiales es racista y es violenta y ellos son los que tienen y paran que los oficiales malos se han corrido del departamento. So, quería decir que ellos son responsables, muy responsables de la violencia que también existe aquí. And just in summary, 15 seconds, just pushing back on you know, all of the conversation, we want this to move forward, this is great, but we have also seen the lack of accountability at every single step of the processes. There are rights for officers, but there's absolutely no rights that are upkept for the families. These families are traumatized, dehumanized, not only in the incidents of violence, but then after those incidents as well. And I also, in my last statement, um, to push back, I don't think you got, got translation, um, that, that one of the biggest reasons for that is that they, we have one of the most racist and most violent police unions in the country, from supporting SB 1070 to supporting to supporting our payo every single election, to, right, to, to being there when the most anti-immigrant uh, law, SB 1070, was signed. Thank you for your testimony. To also supporting Trump. So I just want to also make that comment. Thank you. Xenia. Good afternoon. My name is Xenia Orona. Um, and I have, can my, my time be started over, please? You may have an additional 10 seconds. Thank you very much. Please listen to the person who has the floor. So um, I did want to commend the, uh, the following agenda items that are up for review and up for vote today. I think that they are excellent first steps. Um, I also agree that any implement, and the search for the, uh, the software that you guys are proposing that it should be up to the ad hoc committee that should be open to the community and available to the people who are present in this room today. 
Um, I did want to ask a couple of questions. Um, would the information that is being input into the accountability system, how is that put in place? Is that by the supervisors? Would it be by the employees themselves? Um, is there anybody available to answer at this moment? If you could conclude your testimony, please. Okay. Um, my, second, my second question, I guess, would be, um, how often are officers being evaluated psychologically from the beat cops to uh, sergeant and the brass? Um, I believe that this is a very difficult job. This, this, they, officers are wielding force against the community. And so they should also be um, regularly evaluated to see if they are eligible and in a good state of mind to be able to use the excess power that they do have. Um, and that should also be included in the evaluation system that they had that would be put into place. Um, and my last question would be, would anonymized statistics or anonymized information from the results of these reviews, would they be made available to the public at any point? And would they be made available to the civilian review board that we would put in place? So those are my three questions. Thank you for your testimony. Councilmember Garcia. Yes, uh, Chief Williams, uh, City Manager, I think both questions of the psychological assessment or what kind of health assessments are made of, of the officers, and then the second one, which I believe was, well, can you repeat the second question, the last question? Um, so the last question is how much of the information that is gathered through the accountability system will, will be, be made, made available public. to the public and to the Civilian Review Board for um, possible termination or eligibility for termination or suspension or et cetera. So how much of the data would be available? So Mayor Council, Mem Mayor Council Member Garcia, um, I think there were a couple of questions asked that our system as we go through this ad hoc will start breathing some breath and some life into that. There was also a question asking about regular psychological evaluations of our officers. Um, Chief Kurtenbach and I recently, along with the Labor Association plea, went to a New York City training that talks about the critical importance of those mental health evaluations. So that is something that we can talk through and discuss through the ad hoc committee, but it's definitely something we've been discussing and having conversations about. I think you know that, I'm sorry? We don't. No, we, we do not. So, that, so thank you, boss. Uh, the only way that you get those mental health assessments would be if you're involved. Chief Williams has the floor. Thank you. So the only way that you would get those assessments is in the pre-hiring process and or if you've been involved in a critical incident, that one, that's one of the checklists that's required for you to come back to work. Councilwoman Guardado. So just on, on follow-up with what just being said, I'm, I'm a very hands-on person and I would like to see you know, that we get like a monthly report per district, you know, trying to figure out what are the different incidents that are happening because right? I, I would like to be a person that wants to be active in the community to trying to figure out what are the incidents that are happening but then at the same time as we're fixing the issues and we're you know rebuilding that trust between our police department and some parts of our community you know making sure that we're also celebrating that as well so I, I just think having that transparency where we're actually able to see those records and we can also communicate within our districts. Um, these are the things that are being fixed and then these are the things you know, that, still, that we still need to do some work on and making sure that you know, we have the community input and that we're working together with the community so we're actually rebuilding, rebuilding some of that trust. Any further council member? Comments or questions? All right, uh, we are ready for roll call. On 1A only. So 1A is the early intervention the software motion. system. Who made the motion? Oh. Okay. Did CCO? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Item passes seven, seven, to seven to one. Thank you. We'll now move to item 1B, authorization to issue a request for qualifications to create a qualified vendor list for public opinion research firm services. We'll begin with Council Member 
questions or comments? Council Member Garcia. Councilmember Garcia has the floor. So my, my question with this is, what are we hoping to learn from this survey that is different from the past ones that we've had and, and what is it that we're looking for? Um, and also the same question as earlier, what is community involvement in this, both in coming up with questions and figuring out uh, what's, what's being uh, brought forth? Mayor Councilman Garcia. Uh, appreciate the question. I'll start with the broader picture and then uh, Chief can talk about Phoenix, please. The last time we did a citywide community survey was in 2012. It was uh, an item that was cut from the budget in the lean times. And so we have actually not done a community-wide statistically valid survey since 2012. So this would be more specifically focused on attitudes and opinions about the Phoenix Police Department and policing in Phoenix. And uh, I'll turn the rest to uh, Chief Williams. So thank you, Mr. Zucker, Mayor and Councilman Garcia. Uh, we're really looking at perception of safety. We're looking at community interactions with law enforcement um, and how, to be honest, people rate the Phoenix Police Department and hopefully to some component based on uh, obviously our discussions with the community. What can we do to get better? What can we do to build trust? What are some of those things that we need to put into place that perhaps we haven't thought about that the community members will bring forward? And Mayor Councilman Garcia, to the other part of your question, I think one thing to consider is that the ad hoc committee, when appointed, would actually be a good um, community uh, input pro place and process for developing a survey instrument. So I, I think the ad hoc committee can actually be very helpful in that. And going back on, on the 2012 how would the, the questions come up with? And also, who does the surveys? Because I think in a, in a moment where we're at right now where trust is, is lost, just thinking about an officer actually approaching someone is not going to be, it's not going to work. So who actually will conduct the survey? Yes, uh, Councilman Garcia, the 2012 survey was d conducted by a uh, behavioral research firm. And it was a, a phone survey, an instrument done in a scientifically uh, tested way. It was not a one-on-one -on -one, uh, personal interaction. The questions actually were, uh, I think, uh, in place since maybe the late 80s. It was designed to be a longitudinal survey where we tracked the answers to questions about citywide services. So it was not actually focused on police at that time. It was across all city services, such as trash pickup, fire, uh, protection streets, uh, uh, is Phoenix a good place to live? Questions like that, and they were tracked over a period of time every two years, so we could see trends, but it was not specifically focused on police, although it did have some specific police questions. And so this, this survey, to your point, uh, would be to find firms that are able to do something in a statistically valid way, but also perhaps do some qualitative work as well, uh, more personal interaction those sorts of things, but we would we would want to to seek that out in our request for qualifications. I would just encourage again community participation and looking at new models that can make that uh, happen. Uh, Councilmember Nowakowski. Mayor, one of the things I'd like to see is that if we can break the city down by zip codes, and and each zip code create some type of a matrix where we make sure that there's broken down by gender, by race, by maybe political um, affiliation. So we ask the same type of people from each zip code the same questions instead of just having a random group of Sample. people throughout the um, city. At least we know that we're getting it from every aspect um, of the city of Phoenix and we actually get some data that we can use. And the questions, I think it needs to go beyond just this issue, but other issues within um, that people might have with um, the City of Phoenix Police Department. And maybe have a, a question at the very end, is there anything else that you would add to the survey? And I think that this can help us in the future for all kinds of issues that 
people might have or there might be something positive too, right? To make sure that we get a full report from everyone and creating that matrix system. Vice Mayor Waring. Um, the use of the survey or the results from the survey, um, I guess I would say, I'm not sure what you're looking to find here that you wouldn't find. I guess the way I would do it if I was trying to solve a problem would be to look at the best practices of other departments who have handled similar issues. Um, I've voted against these surveys in the past, and not just a police survey, but you know it was the broader city services survey that Ed's talking about. I think the last time we had a vote on that was maybe 2015. 2013. 13 was the last time we had a vote. So um, I just, you know, we, we don't have an unlimited pot of money. So same with the last item. We can't afford to waste it. We can't afford to be redundant. And we can't afford to do stuff that might have negligible value. I will agree with Councilman Nowakowski that if we do do use this, the needs of Northeast Phoenix that I represent might be radically different than what's going on in Levine. I don't know that that's true, but okay, that might be one reason to my mind to do a survey to find that out. But I assume, you know, Chief, Assistant Chief, I assume you, your officers, I, I know you do, go to conferences and so forth, get best practices, get manuals of what other police departments are doing, I assume. Uh, coordinate with other chiefs, talk to other chiefs, compare notes. Chief, you've worked in a different, you know, a whole different state, much less a different department. So um, I guess I would just say, you know, have we, have we kind of done that first and try to see what other excellent departments, I'm not saying we're not excellent, but departments that have thrived in every bit, I'm sure as tense an environment as we find ourselves in here. To me, that would be a better way to address this than just a blanket survey that, that might or might not fit the needs of one area of town versus another. So Mayor, Vice Mayor, to your point, constantly engaging with mm -hmm. and speaking with police chiefs from all over the country, I large assume. agencies, small agencies. Mike has a great network, network of folks too, um, but every city, every town, every community is very unique and very different. And that's why us gathering, getting information on, again, perception of safety, community engagement, interaction with police officers, what we're doing wrong, what we're doing right, is one of these critical pieces, and that's why we're asking for the survey. Right. I just wonder, you know, what information, I'm not sure what kind of questions you're going to be asking. They're going to get back specific enough information to know how to address it um, and make changes. And what if the changes are completely incompatible of the mission of the police department, which, frankly, to my mind, is, is stopping crimes. I mean, I, I think that's like why police departments were invented and then you kind of go from there. Um, people want the officers to be mental health professionals and everything else. I, I just simply, as you and I have discussed, Chief, I, I just don't think that's realistic. People are not perfect. People do not have areas of expertise that, that cover this broad swath. I mean, they are there to protect the public and Maybe it doesn't completely end there, but that is the bulk of the job, as far as I'm concerned. If people say we don't want them doing that anymore, what are we really going to do? Get rid of the police department? People have asked us to get rid of the police department as recently as meetings last week. Sounds ridiculous when I go knock on doors and people are like, what are you talking about the council meetings? I'm like, well, some people said we shouldn't have a police department. And they look at me like I'm nuts. Maybe I am, but me repeating what other people have said at our meetings is not indicative of that. So. I just, at some point, um, you can survey to your heart's content, but if you're then either going to disregard the results or you're not going to be able to implement results compatible with the findings, or you get just kind of a mishmash of answers that, that you can't really utilize, then that's more money we've spent that could have been spent on something else. So those are some of my concerns on this. I, you know, maybe it's rhetorical, you don't have to respond, but um, so. Council, uh, Councilwoman Guardado, followed by Councilwoman Pastor. Councilwoman Mayor, Mayor, Guardado has the. Stop this behavior out there. Yeah, please, these are very important topics. Seriously. We need you to pay attention to the person Grow who has the there. floor. Councilwoman Guardado has the floor. I just think one size doesn't fit all. And you know, like when I, when I'm thinking about the survey, I think the the questions are going to be different, you know, from one district to the to the other. Um, and and I would just suggest as we're thinking of, as we're thinking about the survey and putting together the questions, I think we should definitely have input from the community um, to put the questions together when it when it pertains to certain area. 
Um, I just think what the questions that we'll be asking in Maryville are very different from the questions that we might be asking in Paradise Valley and making sure that we're able, you know, to all work together as soon as we have answers to the to these surveys, you know, like making sure that we have like a real process on how we're going to tackle some some of these issues um, so that we can, again, and I'm going to keep repeating this, right, like how do we make sure that we rebuild that trust and that we feel that people are part of the process, which I think at the end of the day is what's going to make the, the difference because I don't think the systems or the surveys are going to work if we're not all working together and making sure that we are taking the input from the community. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Pastor, followed by, by Councilman DeCicio. So I'm going to piggyback on that and also Councilman Waring. Um, we have such a diverse community and many different populations that are, uh, that deal with or are, or, or, I don't know how to say this, uh, that have some um, interaction with the police and it could be many different levels and many different ways. Um, so I look at this as more strengthening really our community process. And what I would like to see in a very holistic way of being getting a holistic picture and population and diversity is uh, the possibility of uh, oral interviews that would be facilitated by a third party, uh, a confidential telephone hotline number staffed by a third party, websites that post information about the public participation strategy, what's the strategy and how are we gonna do it, uh, dedicated email address for anyone wishing to comment, uh, public forums at the start of the process to obtain input from stakeholders and other interest groups about transparency, accountability, incident, and anything else, and then either an online or telephone survey that can work to provide opportunities to everyone. Um, we have to remember we have uh, different populations. We have the homeless population that has interaction. Uh, we also have those that have mental health issues that have an interaction. We have the LGBTQ community and we also have the migrants and there's many different ways of capturing this other than a survey by the phone. Um, so I think we need to broaden this and make sure that we get what we would like to see. Additionally, I request that the council be allowed to provide direction and feedback on this, um, along with the community, the questions to be asked, um, how and to whom, and by what method, and then how the universe gets cut up. And what I mean, the lists that we use of those being surveyed or chosen. So it's very similar to Councilman Nowkowski looking at the list, looking at our district, and seeing how uh, we make an impact and get the proper input that we need. So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So one of the things in addressing each of these things, statistically, you can't really just say, hey, we're going to have a certain percentage of each group. You have to expand the survey is the only way to do that and make sure that it's accurate. So instead of doing 150, you might have to do 2,000 or 3,000 surveys multiple ways. They maybe have to be done in person or others. So what I want to do is make sure that whatever we do, it's a population in the survey that's large enough to be st uh, statistically accurate. And we'll be able to judge that by a large population. <clears throat> the other thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the way you create, uh, surveys can be given to do certain things. Again, when I said I really don't want to see this thing politicized, I mean, I'd like to get the information, I'd like to get accurate information. Uh, what I don't want to do is go in with the perception that police are bad, okay? So it has to be a, a, an accurate uh, survey that allows, you know, basically it's, it's based off of fact and questions that are not um, basically push-pull that we've all done on council up here but it has to be one that it's basically based off what you're seeing and identifying what's occurring in the communities today. The other point of this, um, I'd like to also have certain types of questions of, do, we, do you think that we need more police in our areas? Do we think we do? I'd like to see that. Uh, the biggest complaint I've got is that we don't have enough police in my district, and I'm happy to take any police officer that anybody wants to give up and put them in my area. I would dig that beyond belief, 
uh, that's what the public in my district want. If anyone up here wants to say, take all my cops, I'll take them. So uh, believe me, I would dig that beyond belief. Uh, I would have the safest district in the entire country. So um, from, from our end of it, I, I'm sorry, Mayor, we got to stop so, yes. this, this Councilman DeCicio has the floor. So the other thing is, and I think this is important, is that when you get a large enough segment, we love the police. So when you get a large enough segment of the population, you're also being able to draw into that policies, not directly changing the different types of policies for police officers, you've got to have uniformity, but at the same time, you've got to be able to address different things that are happening in different communities. And I think possibly to Councilman Nowakowski's idea of breaking down by zip codes might be a little too big. You know, you might want to look at even smaller segments because literally if you look in the downtown area, those downtown areas can shift pretty quickly and they're all in the same zip code. So one of the things you might want to do is really look at smaller pockets and I don't know how to do that. I mean, that's something that I leave up to the pros. But each pocket is onto its own. And you can develop different plans for each, if you're willing to do that. Now, this is a lot of work and time and money. So what we're looking at doing here, and this is going to have to be a commitment from this council if we want to do it. I mean, we spent $30 million on this RMS system that I don't believe works. I mean, something more personal would have worked probably more, and hiring more cops would have been better off too. But at the end of the day, that didn't happen. So the question is, where do you go from here? And if we're going to be going forward with any plan, we better have monies attached to what that plan is. Right now, we are short in the city of Phoenix over 500 police officers. 500. That's a number that came from the police department. 500 police officers. You don't think that there's stress going on out there with those individuals? I mean, they're working uh, every, I mean, every contact that they have is never a positive experience. Think about it. They constantly have to go through this stuff. And the criticism they're getting right now is just, it's just unacceptable. And that's why you're hearing me push back the way I am, because we, the politicians, created the problem. They didn't create it. The cops didn't do this. We did it. Okay? We did it, not them. So we have an opportunity to fix it. But that also means making a commitment to making sure we have the right amount of officers that are out there that we're going to need. That's something that needs to be part of this mix. And I will have an issue if we don't start seeing some of these other objective standards that we could use, like, hey, if we had enough police officers, we'd be able to have these type of uh, officers being able to go out there in the CAOs. I heard we're cutting back again. So, I mean, my gosh, they're the ones that have direct contact with the public. So from my end of it, I'd like to see it more holistic rather than saying, hey, here's what we have today. What could we be? is I think a better question that we need to be asking. What could we be? And how big do we need to be? And what is it that you think we need to have? So futuristic questions like what do you think would make us better would be better in this survey as well. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. Vice Mayor Waring. Thank you. So since Saturday, I've probably met 100 citizens knocking on doors, probably a little more to meet sometimes multiple people in one house. Since the beginning of the year, about 2,500 people. Um, how many criticisms of police officers have I received? I think none. Uh, I've heard a lot of comments, certainly in the last couple of weeks, support our officers. So we're here now in a special meeting uh, because people are demanding it. But that should not be interpreted as the entirety of the 1.6, 1.7 million people who live in the city of Phoenix, not by a long shot. So I guess I would wonder, Ed, if I recall, now that I've had time to reflect on it, our polling in 2012. I think it was 94% satisfaction was my recollection citywide for all city services, not just police. I don't suppose you happen to know if there was a breakdown on police interactions. Council, you can recall it's not fair because it's seven years ago. But maybe right. you know. We can pull that last 2012 survey because there were a series of questions about the police that actually were there from the first uh, community Outreach Task Force. So there were some specific mm -hmm. police questions more than, than usual in that 2012 okay. survey, and we can easily find that. But to your first point, I believe there was a general satisfaction, is Phoenix a good place to live question, and it was in the 90s, somewhere, 92 to 94. It was higher than it had been in 2010 when I was not on the council. I think it went from 90 to 94 or something. That sounds um, correct to me, yes. <laughs> well, I, don't, I know, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. I got elected, it went up four points, amazing. Um, <laughs> 
So I, re I recognize when I go around and knock on doors, I'm only hitting one eighth of the city uh, to Councilman Nowakowski's point, Councilwoman Pastor's point. So that, that's not indicative. So it might be completely different if you went and knocked on doors somewhere else. Uh, it is 1.7 million people after all. But I am gonna guess by and large, given the comments that I have, that the vast majority of the public is going to support the police. And that's what you're gonna find in your survey, unless to Sal's point, you do a push poll and then you know you, you kind of gin it up so it's by definition gonna be negative. Um, do you get nervous when police are falling behind you? I do too, everybody does. You're afraid of my tail light out, am I speeding? You know, am I going a couple miles over? It, it, that's just a natural human reaction. They make, comedians make jokes about stuff like that. I mean, it's just, that's just a natural human reaction. Um, so I guess I would say this, Everybody in the audience can accept the results if 94% say we're good with the police and a reasonable person might conclude, look, people aren't perfect. You have, what was it, Chief, you told me last week, 2.3 million interactions that your officers, your 3,000 officers roughly have. I don't know what that, should have worked that out, how many that is per officer, but that's an amazing number of interactions. Um, almost all of them probably positive or helpful, you probably have a statistic, but probably not in your head is my guess, of how many of those are actually like fighting crime related, but then how much is also giving directions and so forth, because you make about 40,000 arrests a year. Is that right? So you've got, you know, to my point earlier, maybe I'm refuting my own analysis. To my mind, police are there to stop violent crime and then property crime and then everything else, but the everything else is a lot more of the interactions. It's 2.3 million roughly to about 40,000. I bet most of those 2.3 million interactions, the customer's happy. You help them change a flat tire, you did something positive, not something negative. So I just wonder how this polling is gonna come out and how is that gonna be helpful because then we'll be arguing about a poll instead of using the money we spend on the poll, and polls are expensive, particularly if you do it right and use live polling and so forth, ask any candidate, we probably all had to do it um, at some point. It's expensive, it's not a cheap little trinket, I just, again, I, I just don't know what we're really gonna get out of that. If we get unusable results, we're not gonna make quality changes, so that will frustrate some members of the community. I, I'm just not sure this is gonna be a productive exercise. And so um, I also just wanted to say, for the people that I've met, it's been 100% supportive of the officers. It's been, I hope, if they haven't seen my comments, um, you know, and there's no real reason they should, not the most outspoken person, um, you know, they're like, I hope you're supporting our officers. That has been the uniform response. Not every person has said it, but of the people who have brought it up, it's been 100%. That didn't surprise me, not at all. I think vast majority of the public respects the officers, understands kind of what their role is. Um, and I, I think by and large, your officers are doing a great job. There are always gonna be some people who aren't either up to the job and so forth. That's why we had, I, I was surprised about the discussion we had on 1A about the supervisors. I would just think if you're a supervisor, your job is to make sure, uh, well, somebody used the phrase weeding out, and I, I would disagree with that. We're not, that first system, if we go through with it, even though I voted against it, um, that's not a weeding out system. To me, that is a train, that if you use it right, that's a training system to get officers who are struggling to get up to snuff. The weeding out, what I would think happen in the academy. That's a tough word, but that's kind of what it is. You're trying to make sure people are capable of being officers. Um, I just think at some point, you know, we're, we're busting on people who by and large are doing an outstanding job under very trying circumstances, and we just keep adding you know, more to the pile, and this polling falls in that category, even if it turns out to be in their favor. So, I appreciate you hearing me out. I, I don't think I can support this, but I understand the reason you're planning to do it. I just don't know if it's gonna accomplish the goals that I think you're hoping that it will. Thank you for the time. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you, Mayor. This, this certainly is a complex um, issue, but I, I, I do agree with Councilman Nowakowski. I think we need to drill down in the different parts of our, our city. And I agree with Councilwoman Pastor, we have to do it right. Um, I know for a fact my husband unplugs our landline all the time just because he doesn't want to be annoyed with these kinds of opinion polls. So, so there, we have one, but he always pulls it out. I, I, don't, I probably should just cancel it, but, but I do, we do need to reach out in, in a, the right way. But I also, 
understood when the chief said we want to ask questions to ask what we can do better. I think we need to ask questions on what we do well, because I think we do some things very well. For example, our community action officers. We have an outstanding group of community action officers, and I think um, there are some things that we need to drill into and, and see what we do well to help us. But I think you also said that you were going to question the police department itself, and so maybe that's something we ask as well. What do you think you do well? What do you think you need as far as additional training or services? So I hear this isn't just for the public, but it's also to look into what the officers think as well, and I support that idea. Thank you. Councilmember Garcia, followed by Councilman Nowakowski. I think what Councilman Waring pointed out gives us the, the reason why we need to do this. I think who asked the questions, if it's a white male asking you the question that works for the city, you're going to have a certain answer. Um, and then obviously, depending on what side of town. The majority of the incidents have happened in the, the last couple in our district. Um, and so those, those answers are obviously going to be different, partic particularly with the brown community and even more so with the African American, with the black community. Um, I, right before this meeting, I uh, sat down with the Hernandez family, uh, the parents of Alex uh, Hernandez and, and the brother. And their sentiment was two months ago, before the incident with their brother, they would have had a completely different uh, response than they would today. Their experience in the last two months, and, and I'll, I have a series of questions for you all from that family in particular, but their experience in the last two months has completely ruptured any kind of trust that they've had with the police department. And anyone that hears their story, all their family members, all their neighbors, ha are now have a whole other uh, system because they've had that interaction. And so I think the survey, yes, is important. I think a phone call, no. I think actually sitting down, having community meetings, or making sure there's community partners that know how to speak to people and ask certain questions to bring them along, that could be helpful. Um, but I also think we've done a lot of that. And I don't think just a survey alone, without the action steps and without matrix of how the data that we're getting from these surveys are gonna fix the issues we're seeing, is gonna, is gonna solve the problem. And so I, I wanna again push us to those things and also see this as part of the greater picture of the ad hoc, the CRV, and so on as we move forward. Councilman Nowakowski. Mayor, I've been on the council for about 10 years, and this survey can be a great tool for us to um, gather a balance um, feedback throughout our community. I work for a radio station, and we have Nielsen surveys that go out on a monthly um, basis and it gathers information of where the listeners are. And we look for our weakness points. So this is a way for us as a community or as a city to look at where our weakness is. And if it happens to be in some certain areas, then we should create some policies or a program to address those issues. And I think we have to have it citywide because we can see the imbalance within our city and we can create something special for those areas that need that special help. And we can start to understand why some areas have different needs than others. And I think it has to be a holistic approach and it has to be a, something that we can use as that Nielsen is being used for, um, for radio. Thank you. Councilman Pastor. Yes, I, I'm sure you said this earlier, but I wanna go back to it. I just want to know, uh, once this survey is done, what are you going to be using this information for? Is it going to be used to improve the environment? Is it going to be used for, uh, the, is the Civilian Review Board or the ad hoc then going to be using this? And who's going to give the analyzation of all this um, to everyone? Because. We did a report, the ASU report, and next thing I know, it's out in, the, out in the community and I didn't even have an opportunity to read the report and be able then to respond. So I want to understand how this information is going to get to us and have the proper timing for us to read the report and understand it and then release it to the community. 
Um, and I'm hoping that this will then go through the ad hoc committee and it run through the ad hoc committee and recommendations then come out of it, along with analyzing all the other reports that we have. So those are my questions. So I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Russ. Vice Mayor Waring, Councilwoman Pastor, probably yes to all of your questions. Um, I think the ad hoc committee or whatever group council comes up with can really drill down into all the information that you're discussing. And as you talk about transparency and making sure you all have time to review information, the boss and I were both sitting here nodding in affirmation. We've been trying to work on making sure you all do have what you need and the time you need to process what's going on. So we, we, we hear what you're saying, and I took notes. Councilman DeCicio. A couple points, if I could. So what you're talking about here is getting information and then uh, making that information actionable. That's really what we're looking at accomplishing here. So I want to make sure we're really clear with what we're trying to accomplish. And so that actionable item that we're going to be creating, it means you have to just have to work backwards, then you have to create a plan, right? And that plan isn't going to be done overnight. So the public needs to understand that if you're working on this, this isn't a two, three or four month plan. It's just there's no way. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it right the first time. And Ed, we've had this conversation. I mean, if you look at everybody in my office, they're required to do it right the first time. Likewise, oh my God, are people that rude? I mean, this is horrible. How do you get anything across? I mean, how do you get people to listen? So the other part of it is you um, have got to do that. Then when you create that plan, so I mean, the public needs to understand this is not going to happen overnight. The other is when you're doing that type of survey and you create that plan, you've got to attach dollars to it. So the question that this council is going to have to decide, because like everything else, I believe a lot of this was knee-jerk reaction and that we're dealing with. Now it turned out that the police were right and all that stuff has occurred. And now we're dealing with something that's further down the line here. So at the end of the day, what I don't want to have happen is have knee-jerk reactions start dictating a plan. I mean, they're all part of it, but they don't dictate it. I mean, look at the audience today. Very few of the anti-police agitators are here because they, they realize that this is, you know, they saw the whole story just like the public has. So the li except for a few people, except for a few of the extremists. Stop! That's so, just ridiculous. Yeah, You're really. embarrassing yourselves by behaving this yeah, way. And by the way, and by the way, nobody on TV can hear you. I don't even think we're doing this on TV. Right. So why don't you just pipe down? Right. So at the end of the day, that means there's going to have to be a commitment to dollars. Well, yeah, we're short 15 to 30 uh, 911 operators today. We're short. I am committed. Frank Pacioli, if you're listening, I hope you are. Um, if you're willing to bring an item forward, I would support hiring more uh, police operators today and using whatever dedicated funds we have. So just letting you know, uh, Ed, that I'm supportive of that. Frank Pacioli, if you're listening, I hope you are or your people are. I'm fully supportive. We had a strong, con long conversation on that, and I agree with him on it. So we're going to have to balance those needs, too. It's not going to be just that. But quite frankly, if we can find a way to settle down and create a, a level of harmony, I'd be favorable toward that. I'd be willing to spend money on that if I believed it was going to work. If I think we're throwing money or throwing ideas and just creating more chatter and more talk, then I'm not going to be supportive of that. So I'm supportive of moving forward with each of these items, but I want to see it first. I want to see what we're expecting. So it can't be done right away. I want this thing done right from my end. Now, everyone's going to want it done differently. But again, we go through this chatter all the time, and you know things like that turn out to be a dud like this. So thank you, Mayor. I don't know that anyone's mm -hmm. All right. Vice Mayor Waring. Thank you. So let's say we break it down by district, and you get the polling results, and um, you find Vice out Vice Mayor Waring has the floor. You find out that there are different needs in different communities. Are you really going to police differently in different areas? And I certainly hope, uh, to a point Sal kind of alluded to earlier, for areas that don't want police, because that's come up at some of the meetings I've been at over the last couple of years, um, we'll, we'll definitely take them in District uh, 2, I think, for sure. I was pretty irked 
with the light rail discussion of, I think, the summer of 2017 when crime skyrocketed along 19th Avenue. Um, and I, we, we moved, I think, four officers over there. Um, well, that's one half of an officer that arguably would have been in District 2 that now isn't because they had to get moved to a different area. So I would hate to see officers, you know, we, we have a lower crime rate in District 2. I would hate to see officers transferred somewhere else. Um, I would hate to see the officers expected who transfer or, or who are moving around, I think all the officers are moving around, to be expected to act much differently in one area of town rather than the other. I, I just, I'm not sure how you would make that work. And I do think that if you had found um, the magic elixir at any conference or from other chiefs or from anything else, you would have implemented it by now. Um, so those are, maybe they're rhetorical questions, but I am curious about the, what if the findings, we break them down, if not by district, by zip code or something else, how are you gonna address that? So mayor, vice member, that remains to be seen when we get the results of the survey. So to your point about best practices and already implementing things that some of my fellow peer chiefs have had in, in the mm -hmm. country, we have taken some lessons that we've implemented, some of it's in training, some of it's in, in the recruitment process. I'll be honest with you, a lot of chiefs across the country are learning with and dealing with what Phoenix is going through right now. So those best practices are out there, those conversations are happening. Um, and at the end of the day, we'll deal with the survey when we get the results of, of the survey. I actually think we're putting it very, very far ahead um, in our discussion because we still haven't talked about what those mechanisms would look like through the procurement process of a company that can listen to and gather everything that we're talking about and put it into a system to provide to you all for information and direction. And I would say, Mayor, uh, Chief, to the point some in the audience have said, you know, what are you gonna do today? Really, we're not gonna do anything today because to your point on this, on 1B, you have to come up with the survey, you have to hire a survey company, you have to get the results. That all takes time. I don't know how much time, but quite a bit of time. Then you're gonna to have to train the officers to implement the results. I mean, that could be a years long process, not one year, several years long process. Certainly if you're gonna to try to actually make uh, substantial changes. And on 1A, you know, you have to do an RFP, right? Then you have to go out and implement the system. You have to train people in the system. That was the crux of, I think, uh, the, the ABC 15 questions to me, you know, it took a while to get that thing up and run, the RMS system to get up and running and so forth, and then it wasn't the smoothest rollout, and some of the officers struggled with it. I mean, at some point, you know, we got an audience who's at least here is upset today, and, you know, we're talking about stuff that might get done in a couple of years, um, but I think you've already got probably best practices that you're implementing and learning with other departments. And I think I watch certainly enough national news to understand other departments are struggling maybe way more than Phoenix is in some respects. I think you've handled tough situations very adroitly. Presidential visits and everything else, I mean, no loss of life, no property damage, no substantial injuries. I mean, at some point, the expectation is perfect. I said last week, that's just not realistic. And I think by and large, with the 2.3 million interactions, we're probably getting excellent service. Why are we polling that? But um, I understand why you feel you need to, and, and I hope, even if I don't think it's a worthwhile idea and don't vote yes, I certainly hope that you get something useful out of it. I just, I hope you can understand from my perspective why I'm a little skeptical that you will, because I'm not sure with the facts that I just laid out, you're gonna, you're gonna find something that's worth implementing. But, um, but thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any further council member comments before we take cards? Carol Coles Henry, followed by Ken Baker. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego, Vice Mayor Waring, and members of the City Council. I'm Carol Coles Henry, and I am the former co chair of the Community Police Trust Initiative with Julian Nabosny, who couldn't make it today, but he's in full support of my comments. We worked really dil diligently in 2015 under the uh, leadership of City Manager Ed Zerker, who gave us a, a charge and a mission to provide recommendations back to the city to improve police department trust, respect, 
transparency, and accountability with the community that it serves. We work really hard, more than 100 hours, and we thought what we did was give the city a roadmap to the future. Significant recommendations in the form of 15 recommendations that we truly believe if fully implemented in partnership with the city council, city management, and the community will advance the importance of improved trust with the community. Our phenomenal team of community experts and leaders crafted those recommendations. They are just as relevant today as they were back in 2016. And we believe that they are the next best steps for the fifth largest city in the country. Many of the CPTI members are here. I just ask if you stand or wave your hand that you can see that they still are committed. And I thank them for their selfless sacrifice. I want to ask you that as part of your efforts as you move forward, the chief is going to need and the city manager full support for their policy and financial considerations related to our recommendations. In order to advance those things, your support will be key and essential. Some of the CPTI's recommendations were embedded in the recent police foundation report that you recently commissioned. Today you are presented with several agenda items that require an affirmative vote for action and implementation. I ask you, Mayor and City Council, to, to demonstrate your passion for our city by having unanimous full implementation of the CPTI recommendations and also the city managers and police chiefs direction that they are asking for, the price tag that goes along with it, and the support to bring Phoenix back to its rightful place of a best practices city for law enforcement and community relations. Thank you. Thank you, Ken Baker, followed by Leonard Clark. Thank you again. Thanks for this forum. Um, it, it sounds to me as I've, I've listened, I kind of like the vice mayor's opinion is what's, what's this going to do? Um, I don't quite understand why you need a poll for that, but I'll give you a very simple solution. There's a big company called Uber and I think they drive people around all the time. And every time they hand them out a card or they electronically get rated. So every interaction, you have two and a half million interactions, hand a comment card with your name and that officer's direct supervisor and design it however you want, postcard size. And then if there's other issues, they can run. You'll get good comments, you'll get attaboys, and you'll get not so good comments. That's all you need. You don't need a, another company to sell you another survey so that you all can argue about it. So that's what I would do if I gave you a suggestion. Um, and I agree, I just think it's just kind of a thing. And then the simple thing is, in the 50 seconds here, I think the citizens are just saying show respect. You don't need a poll for that. And if somebody says these officers did nothing wrong in this video, oh, they did something wrong. One officer went off the rails, was having a bad week, a bad morning, a bad day, and started throwing F-bombs at a citizen. That's it. So was it justified? No, because police officers, the way I've been studying them, is they're non-judgmental. They're just here to take Tell it to the judge, sir. Tell it to the judge, ma'am. They take you in or they don't. The officer at that dollar store did the right thing. He called it in, took the thing, started a process. So that's my things. I don't think you need a survey for what you're trying to get, but if you can, a card is excellent. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. I want to remind everyone to please be respectful to the individual who has the floor. Leonard Clark, followed by Dr. Ann Hart. Thank you. Uh, well played, Councilman DeCicio and Jim Waring. You've, bit, you've built the wall. You know, you you provoke people out there. You throw out comments. The mayor said we are not supposed to be coming here as this is the red team, this is the blue team. No, but that's what you are doing. Divide and conquer. 
you know, I, you know how many term time, you know, hey, take a survey, McDonald's, if you take a survey, and this is not, a, I'm not being paid by McDonald's, you get a Big Mac. But if I want McSpaghetti to be brought back, I'll get a Big Mac. Do you really think they're listening? No, they're not. Sorry, executives at McDonald's. So this is like so much, I do hear a lot of patronizing talk, and I'm sorry. Okay, I don't believe all police are bad. I resent the fact that you and the local media, not all the other media, you know who they are, the radio station, playing the propaganda today, fomenting hate and anger amongst our community. Uh, that, that's ridiculous that you can make those accusations as if we all hate police. We do not, because love is what's gonna defeat your hate, Sal DeCicio. And by the way, and by the way, Governor Doug Ducey is competing with you. Doug is in the news over Nike, but I think you're getting more national news because, you know. But here's the deal. Please you can your take your survey. survey. This is so much more talk, 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 patronizing. I am born white, and yes, I get that. There have been white people discriminated against, but you have a bias, and maybe not even on purpose. Many of us don't realize that we have biased feelings. For example, I use the word icebox. The kids are like, Mr. Clark, why are you using the word icebox? That's a refrigerator. You see, I had parents. I lived around people from a different culture. So we pick up these things. So Sal, I don't hate you. I love you. I love y'all. But the problem is, you got to stop fomenting this hate. Okay, stop it. We are one community. That's the Phoenix bird up there. And this hate's going to stop. We're going to come together and we're going to find a solution. Thank you. Dr. Ann Hart will be followed by Ginny Ann Sumner. My comments will be brief. I am a member of the Police Community Trust Initiative. As echoed by my co-chair, I concur with that. I would just like to encourage the mayor and the city council to implement this. And I would also like, if you do not have a copy of this, it was written and developed in 2015, and we revised it for the last chief of police before Chief Jerry Williams. If you could all city council members, I encourage you to take a look at it because these recommendations should be, I encourage you to take a look at them and consider moving forward with those. Thank you. And Ginny Ann Sumner will be followed by Garrett McFadden. First, excuse me, first of all, Mayor, thanks for your opening comments. I appreciate them. <clears throat> Given the recent dialogue, I don't think we need a PR firm to tell us what residents want. We want to be safe and order maintained. Conflicts managed, rules equally applied, and to be listened to. These, but these go both ways. Police officers want the same considerations. What the community wants and the officers want are the same, fairness and justice. Our officers need to know the policies and procedures that are expected of them when engaging with the public. And our police organization must support those same policies and procedures when engaging with the public and the police officers. There are more, more guns in the hands of the public, more drug-induced behaviors, and more mental health issues than ever before. So the public needs to understand that under these current police challenges, what they are, and be realistic with their expectations. If we ask the officers to adhere to these policies and procedures, then the public must be willing to accept the authority of the police and adhere to the same. Cities all over the country are reviewing and developing policing strategies, procedures, and conflict management due to the changing of our society. I put more faith in the work that they are doing than I would in a PR firm. Let the police do the research. Let's develop some best practices for Phoenix, and then let's refine those. Let's refine them by having community input. Let's look, work with our, with our police unions, the chief's advisory boards, and the public, and let's realistically make certain we, de we develop the best practices for the city of Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you. Garrick McFadden will be followed by Talanya Adams. Um, Mayor, um, Councilwoman Deb Stark, who rep represents me today, I met with uh, the head, the president of PLEA at their office, and so following up on our previous conversations, we had an hour-long dialogue. One of the problems that we have with this, I'm in opposition of this, uh, of this plan. I believe that it is a waste of money. We have 
these citizen initiative um, where we know what the best practices are that we can implement. Last year we had 44 shootings. 42 of those shootings happened here in Phoenix. Two happened in the neighboring city of Glendale. Why do, not, why do we not avoid the appearance of impropriety and have other police departments investigate our officer-involved homicides? That is a best practice. That will give clarity. That is things that we can do. If we do have a study, if we do have this study, it has to be based on the experiences of people. It needs to be mass, different methods. So in person, knocking doors, computer, um, phones, uh, cell phones, plug-in phones. It has to be able to cover things. We, it has to be able to carve up our population by racial, uh, racial identity. It has to have income levels. Because the policing where I live in uh, uh, Councilwoman Stark's district is different than in Councilwoman Gallardo's uh, district. So if we're not taking these things into account, it's not going to give us the data that we need. And if we're going to be a data-driven society, if we're going to make the best policing, then we have to have good data. But we already know what the best policies are because in 2015, a group of people came together, created ideas, 15 of them, and we haven't implemented. So why don't we implement those than spending money that we don't need on a survey that won't accomplish anything? Thank you. Talanya Adams is followed by Ashley Davis. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and Chief Williams. My name is Talanya Adams, and I'm here to support uh, Section 1B and ask you to uh, pass and fund this survey, um, including the internal survey of the police department. An effective, engaged, and successful police department can be achieved, improved, and truly benefited from community input, and community input beyond the ad hoc committee. A preference, um, as, as the agenda item is written, there is a preference for the city manager to issue the RFQ. A um, public opinion research firm is helpful, uh, but I do agree with some of the earlier comments. We've had lots of external folks come into our town, uh, you know, be selected for a bid, um, and then uh, not really do a really good job. I think in general, surveys are uh, dismissal. Uh, they receive dismissal responses, and for efficacy and inclusion, um, focus groups and communities in each district should be directly involved in the survey creation, dissemination, and the collection process. To do so will likely result in a higher survey response that may yield input uh, and data to better understand citizen reviews, citizen views, community and peace officer needs, and the perspectives of the strengths and weaknesses of our police department. The metadata response, in addition to the final report and summary, should be made immediately available to the public and used to assist the development of critical policies and also identify patterns across districts and conduct. The scope of the survey should be extended beyond sentiment and used to better create public policy and cultural change, including but not limited to publish policies regarding peace officer incidents that involve firearms drawn on suspects in the presence of children. A um, successful disseminated survey also should reach every citizen that has had an interaction with the police department and ideally every household. Uh, lastly, I do concur um, with uh, Councilman Nowakowski and Waring that in regards to uh, disseminating the survey, zip codes or district uh, and source tracking is an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley Davis, followed by Jennifer Hernandez. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley with Patriot Movement AZ. Happy to be here today. It seems the main reason we're here today is to call the cops racists and tightening a leash on them like they're dogs, and that's wrong. We don't need more software programs or review boards. We need to let the police do their jobs. Lord knows most of us are not strong or brave enough to do it. They are here to protect us citizens and arrest criminals, people committing crimes, participating in illegal or illicit activities, and then take them to jail. The police in this country already have review boards, superiors, and bosses but apparently that's not enough to some people. And apparently body cameras with perfect audio isn't enough either. Maybe we should switch gears here and ask people who have trouble understanding how to obey the law. 
All of the people sitting in here thinking the police are too tough, they're not babysitters. I too was roughed up by a cop one night and spent the night in jail, but you won't hear me complaining and calling every cop I see a bigoted, racist, sexist, Nazi, homophobe. But the cops who blatantly have authority issues, give them a desk job. But we have individual responsibilities, not to provoke or antagonize the police. Perhaps we should be having meetings that the general public is mandated to attend instead of the police on how to be civil and respectful when pulled over, confronted, or questioned by the police. Maybe we ha maybe have some meetings on how to have etiquette to authority figures and how to be a decent human being in society because that's where we're at. If that was the case, guaranteed this would pump the brakes on how often officers have to use their tasers, pull their guns, and let the dogs off the leash. Sure, update the software pr programs and hold cops accountable with the complaints to the review boards, but let's show some respect. We need to have personal responsibilities as Americans and stop treating the cops like they're all stupid, idiot, racists, because they're not. Are all of the black and Hispanic officers out there and in here all white supremacists too? The people are... The police are awesome. Let's support them, hear what they have to say, and let them do their jobs. Thank you. Jennifer Hernandez, followed by Xenia Oruna. Uh, is Jennifer, Jennifer Hernandez, followed by Xenia Oruna. Is Jennifer here? All right, Jennifer is uh, no longer here. Uh, I'm, I'm, oh, right I'm here. sorry, Jennifer is here. Um, good afternoon, public servants. Um, so I'll make a comment on the public opinion survey um, y'all want to do. First of all, I want to say that I think it's um, There are so many red flags that come up when you mentioned it. First thing first is that we have told you again and again that communities of colors do not trust the police. We don't trust the police, they're violent. Sorry. This would only lead to dishonest data. People are not gonna answer honestly if there is a white male asking a person of color. I know if a white male comes up to me and ask me what I think of the police, I'm, I'm gonna lie about it because I feel like there's gonna be consequences if I say the truth. Which brings up the question, what communities are you targeting? Because looking at your past your researches, we know you always leave out communities of color. Language. Communities impacted by police violence, communities with no resources, communities like Maryville and South Phoenix. And I know for your benefit, you're gonna try and target white communities, resourceful communities, because that will lead to data that proves that police are good and that we need them and that they're safe, but they're not. So my ask is that you include us as community to be part of this process, to reshape your shady questions and still be a part of it after, to analyze the data. Want to remind people not to use foul language. Xenia will be followed by Maria Sanchez. Xenia. So I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I I do agree that the crafting of the questions is it needs to be very the questions of any survey have to be carefully crafted. Um, if you just ask an individual, are you happy with the police, and you get a yes, no, that does not inform, that does not give valuable information for us to be able to craft policy. The delivery of the survey is also extremely important. Um, there are communities who do not have access to reliable internet, who do not have access to a landline, who do n not trust, uh, trust uh, people that knock on their door to answer the door. So there needs to be a multimodal delivery of any sort of uh, feedback that you're trying to receive from the community. Um, so I agree with Councilman Garcia that it should be in community group based, it should be a holistic survey, not just around the police in order to give, uh, give better feedback. Um, and I also agree that there is, a, and there is tons of value 
and having community feedback from it. Because if you put out a product, if you're a marketing company that wants to know how people are reacting to a particular product, then you don't just assume, you ask. And if you're asking and getting honest feedback, then that's how you're, you know you're going to provide valuable services to the community, the community and to the cities. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, I would also advise that you use Pew uh, strategies and, and Pew um, research standards in, or, in order to conduct the surveys. Um, and since when the census is being taken, it, they get as specific to a 10 household uh, census tract. So you are able to determine in this one block, one row of houses, the, what these people think. And it's anonymized, right? You're not able to pin it down to one household, but you're able to get, uh, to get very, very specific information for a particular community. So I encourage Pew, Pew and census, census style um, um, methodology for when you're crafting these, uh, these surveys and conducting them. Thank you. Mar Maria. Maria Sanchez will be followed by Joseph Larios. Hi, good afternoon, City Council Mayor um, and community member in District 3 um, here in Phoenix. And I just want to say that I do not agree with you conducting this survey. First of all, the community doesn't trust you. They're not going to be sharing any of their experiences with you. And I can say that for a fact from a person that led, was one of the persons who led the 10,000 people survey that was going around asking community, do you trust the police? How do you feel when you see a police officer? What was your experience when you called them? when you were pulled over, what reason did it give you? All kinds of questions. And I can tell you the community, even when they had experiences, they were very reluctant to even want to speak about it. And as you even saw in the last meeting, right, community is afraid to speak about their experiences. And some even told you, I only got the bravery to speak about it because other spe people were speaking about their experiences that were similar to mine. So I, I think we're going to waste money doing this survey, um, unless they're going to go do it in every district, every community. And person, not online, because like they were saying, it's not going to be accessible for everyone. Community, especially those most impacted by police violence, do not trust you. Um, and there's a lot of red flags in this. And I also want to say that I have a few questions about this. So what are we hoping to learn from this survey? Because like we heard Sal, right? He's saying that he wants to make sure that police are seem like the good people. That's already biased to me. Like who's going to be shaping those questions? Community needs to be part of this process the entire way to be able to look at those questions and say, yes, these are appropriate or not. And then afterwards, also make sure that we are there to analyze the results because we don't, we're not going to trust you if you come back and give us a report and saying this is what the community is saying. So in order for us to actually believe in this process, I'm, I'm sure you're going to move forward with this because you're moving forward with every other stuff that's in here. Um, you need to make sure that you include community in the entire process to make sure that they're analyzing those questions, to make sure that they're, when you're actually out there in community, it has to be in person, like I said, and that we're analyzing the results afterwards. Otherwise, and overseeing, after, after you see those results, overseeing implementations are gonna be from the, from the data. Because if you're just gonna go out to collect info, then that's gonna be for nothing, because we can already show you our survey to give you some information. So unless you're gonna be implementing something from this survey, Thank then it's gonna testimony. be useless. Thank you for your testimony. Joseph Lar Larios will be followed by Michelle Rose. Hello, council members. Uh, my name is Joseph Larios. I grew up in South Phoenix. Um, and I want to address the fact that we do live in one of the largest cities in the country. And just like many large municipalities, we are addressing complexities of governance around public safety with limited resources. And so I think it's important that we utilize every investment, especially data-driven investment, that are meant to help us govern. And so I want to draw attention to a 2015-2019 analysis of impediments to fair housing choice in the city of Phoenix. It's a commission we studied. In it, and I'm quoting directly, within the city of Phoenix, there is a high and persistent level of segregation with whites being the most isolated, in effect, segregated from other, from other racial and ethnic groups. That's our own study. We have conditioned to say we have already created a segregated society. 
If the driving characteristics of a systemic problem with public safety in the police department is a racial bias, then of course we're going to have completely differing understandings of public opinion on public safety and policing. This would help us understand when districts that have a high number of concentrated, segregated, isolated, white neighborhoods like District 2 and District 6, it would explain why you would have a fundamentally difference of understanding of how effective our police department is. For that reason, I think if we are gonna going to construct a survey, we need to acknowledge that these are major segregated differences that we have to account for. If we're gonna have a public survey that measures, and they did it by housing tracks, 10 years worth of housing track data is what, what the survey was built off of. If we can demonstrate, if we can show that there is a difference of opinion, but on the internal survey, where do those relationships actually lie? Because I think what we will find is that internally with the police department, they have much stronger, more robust, and more representative relationships with white areas of the city than they do with, cities, with the areas of the city that are of color. If we're not going to address the segregated dynamic of our built environment in our large city and how we're receiving feedback, then I agree with everyone saying we're going to get biased, not useful data. Thank, Thank you. you. Michelle Rose. <laughs> Sorry, I had a left there. Okay, um, Michelle Rose from Scottsdale. I am speaking in support of the vendor list. The satisfaction survey uh, could be conducted in a scientific manner. It should not be conducted internally. Uh, someone mentioned Pew Research. There's also local focus groups which can remove that um, level of distrust. The, this is written on the agenda as a qualified vendor list, so that means diversity has value. There should be preference given to a black or brown owned and conducted business for this. And that will avoid future problems of, oh, we didn't think to ask that, public distrust. The outcome of this should be uh, focused on transparency and trust, making publicly available documentation of the processes, open to observation, and publicly available outcome. When someone earlier spoke about a relatively low turnout, for the most part, a meeting on Tuesday, 2 p.m. to 7, being able to attend that is what privilege looks like. Many people can't show up today because they're working, they have children. Um, so I would suggest having more in the evening and also implementing something like the Right to Speak program that the Arizona State Legislature has. Uh, speaking to some other things that were mentioned, when seven to 10 police officers can respond to a stolen doll we're grossly overstaffed. We do not need to hire anyone else. Seven to 10 police officers responded to a stolen license plate incident. We're grossly overstaffed. And I'll just add um, <laughs> um, a thing to do for next practices at the last meeting you asked, what can we implement tomorrow? Children should not be able to be detained without their parents' knowledge. And that's completely legal right now. So the police should voluntarily say, we will make sure that, you're, that the parent knows if a child is detained before any waiver of rights, before any talking to the police. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are numerous individuals who have been here today who are members of our city advisory boards, including the police chief's advisory boards and the city, uh, CPTI, so I want to thank you all for your service and just wanted to make sure that people heard this uh, research instrument will be reviewed by the ad hoc citizens committee, which will have representatives from each council district, so it will reflect our entire city. Do we have any additional council member questions or comments? Vice Mayor. I'd like to respond to the last comment, so about the overstaffing uh, from the woman from Scottsdale. 
So I guess I would say this. Um, I'm not bringing up any individual case, but obviously there's been one in the news recently. Um, I think we should all maybe hold our comments till the investigation is concluded. That's what we have professional standards boards for. So, um, you know, I think Sal has addressed that as well. I, I just don't think we should prejudge it before all the facts are in. And we are not the body that would be prejudging it anyway, because we're not expert police officers and so forth. So, um, so that's number one. But since that case, since that case has come up, I guess I'll just say this. People are being very cavalier about other people's stuff. I mentioned earlier, the police are there, to my mind, and police were invented to stop crime. So I will come over, I will come over, since I like to knock on doors, I will come over tonight, knock on your door. When you open, I'll come in and just start taking some of your stuff. And, and oh, by the way, I get to decide what I'm taking and whether it's important or not, and whether it's valuable or not. Does that sound like a good plan to everybody? Because I've sort of listened to this stuff and it's kind of ridiculous. So the, I, the shop owner is the victim when their stuff is being taken. He's not asking or she's not asking to have their stuff taken. Uh, all I can say is what are the officers supposed to do? Not come? If, again, and if you live in a community that says, I don't want officers to come to my neighborhood, and I've heard that at public meetings, I can't believe people have gotten up and read prepared remarks, but I've seen it happen with my own eyes live. People said, no, no, I don't want people to come to my store, I don't want people, okay, uh, that's fine. But again, to Sal's point, we'll take them in District 2. I'm losing a few, potentially because of light rail, so we'll be happy to take a few back. We have big, we're, we're a, we're the second biggest geographic district in the city. So it, the response times are slower by definition just because they got a lot of area to cover. So we'd be happy to have more of a police presence. But to cavalierly say, I guess, or imply that other people's stuff doesn't matter and the police shouldn't respond or I guess the store owner shouldn't respond, I hope every citizen who is the victim of a crime calls the police every time. Because you know what? They should get a response they should get a response, and if it's a disproportionate response, so be it. Don't take other people's stuff. That shouldn't be. That falls in the same category of what Mayor Gallego said earlier. Please don't swear at our meetings. I mean, honestly, we, we got to tell you that? I mean, I just, you know, what are you going to do? So in my case, I guess at some point, maybe you accept what you accept. But it is a little insane to say we should just ask the police to stop responding to crimes and not have enough people backing them, not enough officers they feel um, are required to respond. It's up to the officers to decide that. They are the professionals who do this. So I thank everybody who listened respectfully and the rest of you who shouted me down. I don't know. I'm used to it. Thank you. And there's exciting news on light rail. We've done a recent study and, it, and the crime rates around the light rail are down. So good news. We also have some great response times in Black Canyon Precinct. Roll call. DeCicio. Garcia. Yes. Wardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Gallego. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, item passes. We will now move to our final agenda item. This item is placed on the agenda for information only, so council members and community can ask for questions. We have a lot of research on this issue, which is very complicated. We will welcome our assistant city manager, who will be doing the presentation. Assistant City Manager Milton Dahoney oversees the police department. 
and has been doing research on this information to give us a sense, to let us know what is the current status in the city of Phoenix, as well as different models used in large cities throughout the United States. Assistant City Manager. Wait, wait. Excuse me. Council. We're taking public comment, right? We are. Okay. We will hear the presentation. And then afterwards, or we're then we will turn to council members for comments, then to public comment. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council. I am, I am here to present information on CRB. Uh, like Chief Williams, I will be presenting a lot of information, touching on a number of areas. I cannot stress enough that every city that sets up a CRB does something different. The norm in this area is to tailor your exact approach to fit the specific set of circumstances in your city. So starting with a brief high-level history of CRB, the origins traced to the 1920s. There was a surge of CRB during the 70s in the post-civil rights era. It waned in the 80s. And then there's been a surge again in the 2000s. During the 2000s, a number of cities have been changing the name of their uh, CRB entity. Some have expanded the scope. Some have a singular focus, and in some cities, there are models that do more than one thing. The common denominator in whatever city you're talking about stems from the trust issue. It's not that police departments do not have processes for investigating complaints, but rather Many residents in cities simply do not have the confidence that the current processes or practices will be fair. So essentially, they are looking for where can I go to receive a fair and impartial inquiry and resolution for a complaint against the police department. So let's touch base on the purpose. The purpose of CRB is to provide a non-threatening complaint process. It is also meant to increase transparency, to build trust, to increase accountability, and to deter police misconduct. The 2015 President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, which is a document that has been widely read, referred to by many community groups across the country, and also utilized by many police agencies, had one of its recommendations that called for some form of civilian oversight of law enforcement. It points out that that is important in order to strengthen the trust within the community. But it also adds that each community needs to define what the appropriate form is and what the appropriate structure is uh, for their civilian oversight. So I indicated already that every city essentially does their own thing with it. But regardless of that, they tend to fall into one of three types. The first one is called review. The second one is called audit monitor. And the third one is called investigations. There are some variations of these all across the country. So I'll go back and start with the review type. It's aim is to review investigations that are conducted by the police department. So whether you have a single individual, whether you have a board, whether you have a department, regardless of what you create, the focus of this type is to look at an investigation that's been done by the police to determine was it fair, was it thorough, uh, did it really address uh, the issues that it was meant to. The review type also will make recommendations about discipline uh, to the uh, authority. And then thirdly, it makes recommendations for policy changes. The policy changes can have to do with training, it can do with hiring, it can do with a number of things, but that's primarily the basis of what a review entity will do. The second type 
is called audit or monitor. So with this approach, you are reviewing data to determine patterns of concern. So you're looking at statistical analysis of transactions that take place within the police department. You're trying to see if there's something that jumps out, if there's something that looks unusual that bears probing. Additionally, you will monitor investigations to ensure they're fair and impartial. Again, the investigation is done by the police department, but the audit or monitor type is reviewing that. And then thirdly, this type will make recommendations for operational changes. The third type referred to as investigations. They may have full-fledged independence to conduct parallel investigations. So even though the police department might be doing an investigation of a complaint, a CRB that is set up for this purpose will also do an investigation. They may or may not have subpoena authority to compel testimony. Uh, for those that do, it, it compels both officers and citizens or witnesses uh, to provide testimony regarding an investigation. And then thirdly, they may or may not have disciplinary authority. It simply depends on how you set them up. So I want to take a look at some of the large cities around the U.S. and talk about what they do. Uh, first, in the review uh, category, we have New York, Indianapolis, and Austin. Uh, New York does a review function, but it also, and is more better known for its investigative function, which I will touch on a little more uh, in a few minutes. In Indianapolis, they have a merged government, city and county. They have a metro police department. They have a complaint board made up of 12 members, and they hear both complaints and commendations uh, regarding uh, police service. The same goes for Austin, Texas. In Los Angeles, they have an OIG, or Office of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> thanks. Office of Inspector General. The OIG in LA reports to a five-member board, uh, and both LA City and LA County have OIGs. Uh, they are looking for data patterns, uh, abnormalities, and they make recommendations for changes. In San Francisco, uh, they have a Department of Police Accountability. They have undergone a name change and a scope change, and in 2016, they underwent a charter change in order to establish the entity that they use. I mentioned earlier that some models do more than one thing. So this category refers to cities that have CRBs that do both review and also audit. I draw your attention to San Antonio, Texas. In San Antonio, they have a complaint uh, review board, Citizens Review Board, it has 14 members. Seven of them are sworn officers, seven of them are civilians. Language about the CRB in San Antonio is contained in the MOU between the city and the police union. When they started this process years ago, there was seven officers but only one citizen. And so over time, as people have gained uh, trust in their approach, uh, they've balanced out the membership. Officers are not compelled to offer testimony to the board, but because they now have a process that both sides seems to, to respect and trust, uh, the city reports that officers in large majority numbers will voluntarily go and give testimony 
when there is a case to be heard. Uh, in San Antonio, they report both to the city manager and the uh, police chief. In Tucson, one of our sister cities in the state of Arizona, they have an independent police auditor and civilian investigator. This individual is attached to the city manager's office. Uh, their role is to review investigations to determine if they were complete, thorough, and fair. And they look at everything from courtesy to excessive force. And next is the investigations column. So even though New York deals with review, they also conduct investigations. The New York model has subpoena authority. There is a board uh, that is established and there is a police commissioner in New York. There is an MOU that exists between the board and the commissioner and so the board will conduct uh, their investigation when an allegation has been made by a member of the public. They will then make a recommendation to the police commissioner for what they refer to as administrative prosecution. There is then a process by which the officer, whatever they're alleged to have done, uh, they go through their process and then they'll make a recommendation, a recommendation for discipline. In the New York model, the police commissioner retains the authority to discipline the officer. So the, the, uh, super, the uh, commissioner can agree with the findings or he can determine uh, to do something else. That is contrasted with Chicago. Chicago is a very different model. They too have subpoena authority. In Chicago, they have a three-legged stool. There is the police superintendent, which in Phoenix would be the chief. There is also a civilian office of police accountability. Their primary role is to make recommendations. And then there is a nine-member board referred to as a Chicago police board that is appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council. In the Chicago model, the police board decides the discipline. So if the superintendent wants to uh, suspend or terminate an officer, the superintendent has to go to the police board and get approval in order to do that. If there is a disagreement between the police superintendent and the chief administrator from the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, the police board settles the dispute. I did not find any information that any model anywhere conducts criminal investigations. Uh, in each instance that I saw, if there is a criminal investigation to be done, that is carried out by a police agency that has arrest powers. And then there's a couple of cities that at present do not have any uh, CRB. So in Jacksonville, where you have a merged government, uh, they have been looking at it uh, for a while. Uh, it's not something that has uh, taken shape yet. If they were to have one, the understanding is they would need to have a charter change. In Fort Worth, uh, they have been talking about a CRB. They have had, over the last couple of years, a race and culture task force. Uh, they have brought forward 22 recommendations to the city. One of them is to create a CRB. Uh, the model that has been called for would be a nine-member board with a civilian monitor to take complaints. Uh, again, no decision has been made yet about uh, the outcome uh, in that city. So next, we'll turn to current citizen participation in the disciplinary process in Phoenix. So first, we have what's called a use of force board. There are six seats on the board. 
Uh, three of them are officers and three of them are held by civilians. So the use of force board is engaged when there has been an allegation of excessive force. The purpose of this board is to determine if the force was within policy or out of policy. If they determine that it's out of policy, then it goes to the disciplinary review board. This board has seven seats, two of which are held by citizens. Their role is to make a re recommendation to Chief Williams as to the level of discipline that the officer should receive. The chief has the authority to accept their recommendation or she can increase it. If the officer is dissatisfied with the discipline handed out by the chief, they can appeal to the Civil Service Board. The Civil Service Board has five seats. All of them are held by citizens. The Civil Service Board has the authority to reduce or overturn the discipline that's being meted out by uh, Chief Williams. So if the council were to determine that it wanted to go forward with some version of CRB, and you sort of ask rhetorically, well, where would we start? How would we do that? Um, an ordinance is one of the things that would need to be worked on. Cities that create uh, CRBs tend to create an ordinance that spells out several things. One is to define the scope of what the CRB would do. Second, to determine governance. Who will the CRB report to? What kind of reports will be required? You also would put in the ordinance whether it is advisory in nature or an independent arbiter. You would also establish what authority the CRB has. So does Chief Williams have the authority to discipline officers or would it rest within whatever you would create? And then you would establish a commencement date. And so as the ordinance would be being developed, additionally a legal review would take place. Uh, comparing the ordinance to state law, the Peace Officer Bill of Rights, looking at what the city charter might say about it, looking at civil service rules, and looking at the language in the MOU between the city and uh, the police union. As that is done, there are some considerations that you would have, things that you would have to deliberate about. Staffing, how many staff? One person, a whole department, 10 people. Again, board governance, what is their role? The disciplinary authority, would it have subpoena authority or not? And then uh, what types of complaints would it hear? Any complaint against an officer or just things that refer to use of force? There are some necessary steps that would need to be taken. So we have been receiving public input to this point. There's no doubt we'll receive public input throughout the process. Today you are getting an overview of the Civilian Review Board process or CRB. Uh, there would need to be a presentation of CRB options, things that you may have an interest in. Uh, at some point, council, should it choose us to go forward, would need to select an option. What type are we trying to set up? Adopt the legal documents necessary in order to make that happen, uh, implement it, and then there would be a continuous review. So right now, here's where we are, and there's a number of steps that would still need to be taken. At this point, I'd invite any questions that you may have or listen to your discussion. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you, Mayor. So going back to the New York model, the, the police commissioner, is that, that's, I think I know the answer, but is that an appointed position, appointed by the mayor? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So going to our current, our current citizen participation, I'm just curious in how we choose the civilians that are on the use of force and 
if you could talk a little bit about that or if you need to do research. Um, I know there's actually more than three members. It's that they rotate it, correct? Could you explain a little bit about that? Yes, uh, Mayor, Council, Councilwoman Stark. So think of it like a uh, reverse jury pool. Okay. So if you're unlucky enough, you get a notice to come serve on the jury and you got to go do that. In this instance, people step forward and say they would like to be considered to sit on one of these boards. So there is an application process. Okay. They must uh, go through a background check. They must go through a polygraph and they must receive training. And so right now we have a pool of 30 different people. And so when a case comes up in front of the use of force board, two people from the pool are selected to hear that case. When that case is over, they go back into the pool. When the disciplinary review board is going to hear a case and they need three people, three people comes out of that pool. They sit for that one case only and then they rotate back. And so that pool of what is today 30 people, uh, that list has been good for two years. It will expire in August and there are already 66 people ready for the next pool and that duration would be a three year period but the same process rotating in and out. Thank you. And so with um, the review, do we look at diversity backgrounds when we're trying to appoint those people? And I, I'm just curious as what the, the, the group looks like now. What, how does it reflect our community? Uh, Mayor, members of council, Councilwoman Stark, I cannot speak to the makeup of the pool of 30. Uh, there is uh, sensitivity. Uh, to the things you mentioned when selecting people for an actual case, but how it's actually done or the makeup of the 30 or the 66, I can get that information for you. Uh, I don't have it as I sit here. Yeah, I think that would be good information for all of us to see and if you could share that with us. And then going down all the way down to the Civil Service Board. So um, they have the ability to reduce or overturn the chief's decision. Do we have a history of how many times they've overturned or reduced a decision of um, the chief? And I, I know you may not have that today, but I think that would be important to share with us as well, just to see the effectiveness, effectiveness of that um, board. Uh, Mayor, members of council, Councilwoman Stark, uh, there were a number of instances where the Civil Service Board altered the discipline that was set out uh, when Chief Garcia was here. Uh, after he left and Chief Yonner became chief, uh, I'm aware of a case uh, a few years ago where Chief Yonner fired an officer and the Civil Service Board overturned that and gave the officer uh, his job back. Uh, during uh, the tenure of Chief Williams, uh, I'm not aware of them overturning uh, a termination. Okay. But they have, the, um, they have the authority to do that. And I, I guess to, to draw a further distinction, the Civil Service Board is set up to be an appeals mechanism for employees that feel like their disciplinary action was too severe. Uh, it's to help ensure employee rights are protected. Uh, it's a different animal than a CRB. So they're, they're looking at the officer bill rights and looking at the MOU and some other issues that... They, they are cognizant of that. Um, they are, when, a, when an appeals hearing is conducted, they will review the facts of the case okay. and they will make a determination. Uh, the chief's office will have the opportunity to explain uh, why she reached the conclusion she did, but the civil service boards, uh, their ruling is final. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think it would be helpful to get more information on just the diversity of the various um, boards. Feedback. Um, 
And the other thing, um, which you didn't put in your presentation, but we have a number of advisory groups um, the Chief works with. And how are those formed? So there's, I uh, think, about 12 or 13 advisory boards. They are set up to be advisory to the chief. Uh, they are uh, selected to provide representation of various segments uh, of the uh, community. Uh, they are engaged about a variety of issues pertaining to police, police services, service delivery. Uh, they do not play any role in the disciplinary process. Okay, thank you. So it is a very complex issue. I think you've already said that, Mayor, and I think I've heard you say that as well. So as we move forward, I think we really need to dig into the current citizen participation a little bit more, and then maybe look at the, the various advisory groups we have to see if we can get there more active and more input from them as well. Um, so those are some initial thoughts, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Guardado, followed by Councilman DeCicio. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I, I just had a follow-up question. So there, we have a poll of 30, 30 people that we choose from. And how do, how do, we, how do we choose from that poll? And how do, how do we make sure that it's not the same people that get chosen every time? So my first question, how do they get chosen? In terms of specifics of each case, I, I can't really address that. What, what I can say is that the purpose of having the pool is to rotate citizens in and out. So if there was a concern about uh, these two citizens that sit on and hear all the cases and they tend to lean one way or the other, you really don't get that because they're only there for that one case. Uh, the process that we have now is people step forward and ask to be considered to be in the pool. And so it's, it's not a self-select, but it is a self-request. Uh, and then they go through the process in terms of we have a particular case and what do they do to choose who's on, whether it's go through the list or not, I would defer uh, to the department to answer that. I guess, because I just think that would just be important to be able to clarify. How do we rotate people? How do we give everyone an opportunity to be part, to be able to participate? Because I think it's, I mean, that's the way people gather experience and just making sure that the group, I mean, I'm very interested to figuring out how, di how diverse the group actually is. I'll get more information on that. Yeah, Mayor, Councilman Guardado, and for all the council, we'll, we'll get a full report on that whole process selection background diversity and, and get that to the full council. Yes. Thank you. Councilman DeCicio. Um, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> just a couple things real quick. <clears throat> so we just voted to spend a lot of money on a survey to identify the problem. It's hard to create solutions to something if you don't identify if there is a problem, what the problem is or what if there is one. So a lot of, I'm glad we're having this conversation on boards and all that because I think it's important for the public to know it. But to do anything that what I would consider to be like a knee-jerk type of reaction, creating something when we haven't even identified what the problem is and what the plan is to solve that problem, I think is just wrong. And it's just not the way <clears throat> you should do business. And the city of Phoenix should not do that. So on a couple things right off the bat, the civilian review, I see, so this is something that's been get, that's lost with the media and all that. We have multiple boards already out there. We have multiple civilians that are out there. They may not cover exactly what everybody wants to see, but we already do have civilian oversight. The civilian uh, review board, I think, is critical, and I'm going to just walk us back in history because this created the, you know a lot of anxiety up here in the council, particularly me. If you remember the names Sergeant Phil Roberts and Officer Tiger, remember them? Those individuals were targeted unfairly, um, very unfairly. And they ended up, uh, Officer Phil Roberts ended up getting his job back uh, at, because he was targeted by a police chief. Not this one here, Jerry would never have done that. Uh, sorry, Chief Williams would not have needed to show that level of respect. Uh, chief Williams would never have done that. Officer Tiger had PTSD 
and ended up killing himself. So because of the anxiety and the stress that he was going through. So that is because that we had police chiefs that were unfairly targeting individuals and that's unacceptable as well. So the things that we ought to be looking at, if you know, again, <clears throat> identify the problem, create the plan to solve the problem. And then so a lot of this creation of a new board, we just voted on this. So what I don't want to do is get into what we just got into with the uh, RMS systems and others like that. We start creating something without trying to actually do it right the first time. So the, um, I've asked for, and waiting to get some answers back, uh, what does Portland, uh, Oregon do? Because they're not an example of what we want. So I want to see what their plan is, because if you look at what's happening on the streets of Portland right now, it's utter chaos. And so whatever the plan is in Portland, I would be fighting strongly against. And then Chicago, I'm, I'm glad we're using them, but they are literally the murder capital of the, of the, of the world <laughs> right now. They had 52 shootings last week, and I believe five deaths. 52 shootings in a weekend. I'm sorry, not a week, weekend. So they're not another example we don't want to do. So we want to use and look at plans that have worked. At the same time, we have to identify the problem first and see what that is and figure out what the plan is. Lastly, Mayor, if you're going to do this, you're talking about spending tens of millions of dollars by the time you're done with all of this, from the new computer systems to everything else. And other than that, I mean, if you're not going to spend this kind of time and effort to get it done right and right the first time, then don't do it. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're going to end up having the same kind of conversation 10 years from now. So there's going to be a commitment up here, I guess. We'll see. I'll see how far it goes. When we start talking tens, 15, 20 million dollars, what I don't want to do is have the city go back and say, hey, we've got to raise your taxes now to cover uh, the problems here. So at the end of the day, there's going to be certain levels of commitment. And I just don't think the city's going to do that at the end of the day. It just isn't going to work that way. So what I, what I, my biggest fear is we're going to create another knee-jerk jerk reaction that's going to try to create some board to make some people feel good when the majority of the public is not there and they want to see other things done. So we may have 3%, 5%, whatever that population base is, want something. But you still have to look at the needs of the other 94% or 90%. And if we're not addressing the needs of the others, then we've created a model that's not going to work. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Garcia. The problem is we're the deadliest city in the country at the hands of police. And that's a fact. That's not being made up. That's not on percentages. That's literally people being shot and, and dying at the hands of our police department. And so that's what's not working. Um, through the process we have, it's not a civilian review board whatsoever. Um, I think something we need to clarify is the, the Civil Service Board also encompasses all city employees. Is that correct? Uh, Mayor, members of council, Councilman Garcia, that is correct. And, and then the other thing, in situations of there being a, a victim of a shooting, um, is it right that in these boards that family, for example, Michelle Cousseau, Romaine Brisbane, those families are not able to present in front of the Civil Service Board. Mayor, members of Council, Councilman Garcia, uh, that is correct. The, the Civil Service Board is there to hear appeals of disciplinary action taken against employees. So that's just an employee-employer relationship. I think yes, what we yes, need, thank you. I think what we need is an actual board that's going to have oversight, um, that's going to be able to subpoena, have an actual investigation. Um, they're going to be able to have access to some of the data that we voted for today to be able to use them for disciplinary um, purposes or recommendations. Um, I think we're going to need a, a regular review of all these um, of the, of the shifts that we're making, and I think the Civilian Review, review Board could also serve as that. Um, and then also I think the, the due process for officers is, is something that was brought up earlier. I think that's what this board could do as well. I think the compensation of it, if it's similar to the ad hoc, it, it should be a fair board. Um, 
And, and I think one key, and, and I want to hear from the audience too, so I don't want to take too much time, but one key component is going to be the transparency, that this board is going to have the ability to look inside, behind the city and, and the police department and be able to communicate to the power, to the, to the, be able to communicate to the community what's happening and what shifts are happening and that the recommendations are being followed. The CPTI strongly recommended, and I've heard it again today, and we've arrest, already invested time in that. I've heard people telling stories of, of trying to get a civilian review board in 1990. Um, and so I think it's time. We're the largest city without one. And I really look forward to, to helping figure, figure it out. And I would I agree we have to look at different models, but definitely need an investigation based one that has both subpoena and the ability uh, to discipline officers. Councilwoman Pastor. Oh, okay, I didn't hear you, <laughs> sorry. Um, so many have argued that the Phoenix Police Department and the city of Phoenix have a history of civilian oversight and integration in police uh, disciplinary process for years. Uh, civilians do sit on, the, on those following boards, and I will name them, the use of force board, disciplinary review boards, I'm not sure about the Civilian Service Board, but then there's the Police uh, Chief Citizens Advisory Board. I have two questions. Do these boards and responsibilities rise to the level of any of the three civilian review types outlined by the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement? Mayor, members of council, Councilwoman Pastor, no, they do not. Okay. Do any of the advisory boards that civilians currently serve on the city of Phoenix adhere to the full characteristics of any of the three types of civilian review committees offered in the study by the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement? Mayor, members of council, councilwoman Pastor, no, they do not. Okay. Um, so I think it's, it's very important to know that because that's been several, that's been many people's argument and I've heard it from uh, uh, the community and I've heard it from uh, people within the city. And so I was told that uh, in this process that there is gonna be, we needed to give some direction. And I was kind of like direction, we should, you know, we're studying, we should know these things. So I'm gonna be very clear um, and uh, one of the things that I would like to direct staff is to study and provide feedback to the council on the three types of the civilian oversight uh, discussed today and how they might best fit and be used in the city of Phoenix. Uh, these responses can come and can be scenario based and I would like to them to be in the scenario based to offer the challenges and the opportunities of each one. Um, and additionally, I would like more information about the legal implications, uh, the city charter and the state law of instituting the following authorities, uh, sometimes given to the civilian oversight committees discussed today. The authority to investigate complaints independently, subpoena witnesses, subpoena records, impose discipline, review discipline, hear citizens appear, appeals, and hear officers appeals. With all that, it would include the elements that you went over. I think this all covered it, but ordinance, legal review, considerations, and necessary steps. I anticipate um, to hope that that research is done and given to us so that then we can have a fruitful conversation about what that really looks like in the future. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Dehoney for your presentation. Thank you, Councilwoman, Vice Mayor. Thank you. So the three boards that we have now, the Use of Force Board, the Disciplinary Review Board, and the Civil Service Board, so from one incident, an officer could have to appear before all three boards? Um, <laughs> Mayor, members of Council, Vice Mayor, it's possible, yes. Okay. How long does it take to work through that system? It could be a lengthy amount of time depending upon the complexity of the situation because there first has to be an investigation of the incident. 
Some months, it years. Could be months? It could be months, yes. I assume they have to get a lawyer and so forth? Many times. Some, sometimes. I mean, but they don't have to, but obviously it would probably be behoove them to do so, I assume. Well, if they are a member, I'm sorry, Mayor, <laughs> member of council, vice mayor, if they're a member of the plea organization, they may, that's an advocate that may help represent them, but they could have an attorney. Mayor could not. I mean, so it's obviously they might be paying for it themselves. The union might be paying for it for them. If we add another board, is that on top of the three the person would already have to go through? Mayor, members of council, uh, vice mayor, uh, most likely, but again, it depends on what you actually set up. And so as we're going through the process of setting up a CRB, if that's in fact what we're going to do, we'll have to, that's what the legal review would help flesh out. How would this entity function uh, in relation to civil service rules, in relation to the officer's bill of rights? Uh, that, that's part of the deeper dive that we would have to do. Uh, Mayor, on, uh, on page 15, uh, of your presentation or chart 15, where I put it, you talk at the end about continuous review, and I think what you mean is, you know, we'd be continuously monitoring the use of this uh, uh, board yes, sir. Yes, sir. and then trying to improve it and so forth. I guess if I was an officer looking at this, I'd think, wow, one incident and I could go through continuous review for the rest of my career. Um, I, I just, at some point, um, so if, if you go through the use of force board, Yes. How does that work? Do you get cleared? I mean, what would be the terminology? How does that work? They vote on whether it was meritorious or not? or So, Mayor, um, members of council, vice mayor, when the use of force board is engaged, there's already been an incident where some level of use of force has taken place. So you're really not debating if there was use of force or not. It's it sort of stipulated there something has happened. It's whether so it was the board was it within yes. policy yeah. or out of policy. So could you be found in policy and then still do you get referred to the disciplinary review board? Is that how that works? I mean how or do you start there? I mean I assume it goes in the order that you listed it, but I guess that's just a guess on my part. Well, if you're found within policy, that's essentially meaning that the actions you took are allowed. Okay. So if you're found to not be in policy, then yes. uh, then you go to the disciplinary review board. Yes. And then you could go to the civil service board if you thought the disciplinary review board took, uh, took too drastic of an action. Is that basically how it would work? Uh, mayor, members of council, vice mayor, you wouldn't be going to the civil service board regarding what the use, uh, what the disciplinary review board did. You're going to appeal the action that the chief took. Okay. So that board makes a recommendation to the chief based on this set of facts and the conclusion or the finding that this officer was out of policy. This is what we think ought to happen. Chief Williams could either accept that recommendation or she could increase it. And so you're actually appealing her action, not the recommendation that comes from the disciplinary review board. So then what would the new board do? I mean, you've gone through three layers where citizens got to participate. <laughs> and I, I do take exception, you know, um, first, I think a lot of the folks who want us to set up this board probably my guests are also calling for the immediate firing of the officers in the current situation, current video. So I'm not sure how those two things come together, but, but okay. Um, but there is a narrative out there that there's no citizen participation, but they're voting on cases, it sounds like. I don't know if cases is the right word, but, uh, and officers do get disciplined. In my time as a Phoenix council person, officers have been fired. And uh, at least one officer has gone to prison for a shooting, uh, that was all, uh, well, whenever illegality was alleged, it's the county attorney, correct, that investigates it. And the county attorney has put at least one of our officers in prison um, on a pretty serious charge. They have subpoena power. They investigate cases all the time. 
So what would this extra board do after these three layers, plus you have the county attorney there, if somebody is alleging that a crime was committed? What so, would be so the thing that they'd be doing that's different than all the rest of this? Which is a long, onerous process for the officer. So mayor, members of council, vice mayor, it would depend on which type you set up. So if you set up a CRB with a review focus, what that board would be doing is looking at the investigation that Phoenix police conducted around the incident and trying to make a determination, was it thorough, was it fair? So it's, it's a second look. If well, excuse me, I, I guess I would say, Mayor, it's not really a second look. Because you could also go through the use of force board, the disciplinary review board, and the civil service board. Isn't it about the fourth look plus whatever the county attorney did? So like fifth, sixth look might be well, more accurate. So let's say it's, it's a look from a different perspective or a different set of eyes. Milton, we should send you to the Middle East. <laughs> All those problems over there would be pish posh taken care of with that diplomacy. That's outstanding. I'm not trying to make fun, but I mean, I think you see what I'm saying. It's a lot of review. And somebody's going to have to pay for a lawyer through all this and so forth. I'm not saying there shouldn't be reviews. Yes. There already are reviews. There are legal reviews. There are, and officers have been disciplined and arrested and fired and all the rest. I don't know what the statistic would be in my seven years on the council, but there's been a fair amount of that. You never like to see it, but as I pointed out earlier, you got 3,000 officers. Um, it, it's, just, it's just the way it is. So I guess I'm not entirely sure which is, I think has been why this has been sitting here for several years, maybe since 1990, but I think certainly the last two or three years, why maybe nothing's come of this so far. I mean, nobody's explained to me what the compelling need is, given that you've got all this other stuff. It's not like these things aren't being scrutinized to death. Plus, you have the media also looking at cases, right? So. So, uh, Mayor, Members of Council, uh, Vice Mayor, the, the best way I can respond to your question is to go back to early in the presentation when I talked about the notion of trust. So the, the whole point of a CRB that's created within a community, they're trying to address the fact that there are members of the community that don't trust the processes that are in place. So it's, it's, a choice. it's a choice. So I guess let me ask it this way. So to Sal's point, so we do, a, uh, uh, we do the polling, right? We authorize the polling, I voted against it, but, but it got authorized, so it's gonna happen. I, I don't know how long it's gonna take to turn that around, but it comes back. Um, and Ed, I would like to see the statistics from the 2000, maybe 10 and 2012, you know, uh, polling that was done on behalf of the city. Uh, but I guess I would say, so it comes back and it turns out, I'm making up a number obviously, 90% of the public trusts the police. Yeah. We're still gonna do this thing? That's a very valid question. So, you know, I'm just speculating what, what happens then. So now, um, And I think that would be up to quo. the elected officials, not the assistant city manager. Yeah. I mean. I'm just, I'm just trying to get it like what have other cities found that the magic elixir that and it's not like based on my cursory reviews of the news with the sound off when I'm at the gym but I do see enough instances in places like Chicago where I'm from that you could not pay me enough money to move back there I might add um, I guess at some point it's not like they're all bastions of civility um, where everything's going great because they've got their citizen review board no, those cities look like a mess. And by the way, we're the fastest growing city in the fastest growing county in the country. And you know what? I bet most of our immigration is coming from all the cities you named that have one of these boards. I mean, at some point, I, I guess I don't understand. But all right. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, uh, and the guy who called me an idiot, I'll be happy to discuss that with you face to face after the meeting, tough guy.
Councilman Nowakowski. Thank, thank you, Mayor. So I have a question regarding the um, Civic Service Board. So there's five individuals that are civilians that serve on that board, right? Yes. And the present time we have three Anglo males, one African, African American male, one African American female, and that's the makeup, right? There's yeah. three. So Yes, sir. So 40% of our population happen to be Hispanic, and there's not one Hispanic out of the five. Is there a reason for that, or is it something that we can suggest members to that board, or how are they chosen? Mayor, Mayor Councilman Nowakowski, the Civil Service Board is appointed by the City Council, so the appointments to that are within the authority of the Council. So, so is there a possibility, is there term limits on that, or can we actually suggest individuals for that board? I, I would love to take a look at the Civil Service Board and would welcome recommendations to the Civil Service Board as appointed by the mayor with the consent of council. I think it's important we continuously look at the composition of all our boards and commissions. And Mayor, the other question is that I've been asked over and over again, why can't we just fire police officers that, that misbehave? Is there protections or is there a bill of rights or can you answer that question? Mayor, members of council, Councilman Nowakowski, uh, yes, there is a bill of rights. Yes, there are due process rights. There are a number of processes that an employee uh, has the right to go through in determining their innocence or guilt before any disciplinary action is taken. Uh, if, if we fail to follow the processes that are in place, it puts the city in a legal disadvantage. Thank you. The other thing is I'm going to ask the individuals that are going to come speak. We're here to give advice and guidance to our staff, which direction we want them to actually take. What I like to do is I like to hear from you all. What actions do you like us to take? What kind of data should, is there a city out there that is, has a best practice that you know of or that you think that would work here in the city of Phoenix? I, w I mean, we can sit here and we can point fingers at each other, but I think what we really want to figure out is what's the best process. And if there's something out there, somebody was telling me earlier that Las Vegas has a great um, um, practice out there. So, you know, I didn't see that out of all your list here. So maybe that's the city we can look into and see what their best practices are there. But I'm really here to listen to you all to kind of give us guidance on how to get that data that we really need to make this city a great city and, and work together as community and the police officers together. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Pastor. Yes, um, uh, Mr. Dehoney, I just wanted to know uh, the boards that we currently have, do they have any oversight? And do I need to name the boards again? Uh, Mayor, members of council, Councilwoman Pastor, in the sense that I think you're asking me, uh, no, the Civil Service Board doesn't have another board that it reports to. It, it has its own authority to act. Right. So uh, that is where I'm getting to because that's been the argument that these boards, and we've had these boards, and they do not have oversight. So, as I stated earlier, I, as I stated earlier, um, to look at these boards and look at all the different models so that then we can figure out maybe these boards need to be combined, maybe they don't need to be combined, maybe we, do, we need to eliminate one. I don't know, but that's what the purpose of us sitting up here and coming to some solutions and figuring out what is best for our city. Sure. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, thank you, I respect you. Um, secondly, we have a template already. There are two cities that already have a city of Tucson and the city of Chandler. And it falls within the Arizona revised statutes. 
So my suggestion is you look at those as we look at everything around uh, so that a template has already been made within our state and it falls within the boundaries and the, and the guidelines of the revi Arizona revised statute and I think we can move forward and look at that. So I appreciate, I can give it to you, but uh, I think you probably have it. I know you have two songs. I have Chandler's. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional council member questions at this point? All right, we will move to citizen cards. We will start with Rev Reverend Reginald Walton, who will be followed by Jennifer Rouse. Once again, I find myself in front of the city council, having wasted an entire afternoon listening to people that do not want to listen to one another. However, I stand because it is time. Trust and transparency has been eroded in this city ever since the critical incident that took place with a sitting city councilman being handcuffed and harassed by a Phoenix police officer. That gave us the community engagement and outreach. Um, yeah, the out community engagement and outreach. There were recommendations that came out of that. One of the recommendations that came out of that was a, guess what? A civilian review board with subpoena power. Then we had the Community Policing Trust Initiative. One of the recommendations that came out of that, guess what? A civilian review board with subpoena power. It is time to stop kicking the can down the road. There are people in this city that do not feel safe. And to say that it's a knee-jerk reaction, this is going on almost the year 2020. We're in July now. And so let's stop playing politics and start talking about real solutions. We're not against the police. We want to make our, our city the best city that it can be. And by having oversight, it creates a, it builds trust which at the end of the day makes the, our officers' jobs better. Here we have an opportunity to build bridges rather than build the divide. We can fix the divide by building a bridge that is built on trust. Because if we don't trust one another, love cannot win. Thank you very kindly. Jennifer Rouse will be followed by Jose Hernandez. Good afternoon, Council. Oh, Jennifer Rouse left, so I'd like to take her time. Uh, no, you, I'm sorry. Hmm? We, we are not, we're not doing... Okay. You, you, I no. would just like to make... My name is Dan Penn. Um, you have filled out a card, and we will get to your card when it comes. You are not... We will have Jose Hernandez. Is Jose Hernandez still with us? So I'll make this uh, I'll make this pretty brief, and um, I will control my language this time. So I apologize for those that were in the church. Um, I hear a lot of tone deaf dialogue uh, when it comes to this. It almost sounds like we're willing to negotiate lives that we're losing in our community for the sake of trying to prove our point one way or the other to an extreme. Uh, my brother was shot and killed on April 29th, and uh, before we considered seeking legal counsel, before we decided to go public, uh, we followed all the protocols to get any police reports, uh, medical reports, autopsy, use of force. Um, two months to the day, yesterday, we received the reports. Uh, and the only reason we received it is because we decided to speak out and uh, go public. Um, we still don't have everything we need. And in those reports, as I skimmed through them, there's already some inaccuracies that I see that did not happen that day and details that were included or left out. Uh, there's no video evidence, there's no body cam, no dash cam. All we have is reports that were taken from the officers 
and we see a pattern that's happening in the community where videos are not matching what's in that police report. We don't know as a family where that internal investigation went. Uh, law enforcement never contacted us as committed to uh, after the incident. We were left out in the cold, and I think about all the families that don't have, you know, for my parents, all the families that don't have a voice to speak for them. And it's almost like the system is built to quiet them down and to wear them out because there's no response from law enforcement. There's a, there's a lack of trust. And with the Civilian Review Board, it's looking out for the community. Um, you know, we came here today, and I'm going to end it right now. We came here today with the same goal in mind, but it seems like we're working to protect the community from officers, and we're working to protect officers from the community instead of working together uh, with checks and balances to ensure that we don't leave people out of the cold, and if there are concerns, they're addressed and they're met, and the victims' families understand what happened, and if it was justifiable, uh, we'll walk through that process. So instead of being enemies of law enforcement, because we're not, uh, we're advocates for the way that it was handled. Uh, two months ago, I would have given a glowing review of law enforcement. I still have friends in law enforcement. Uh, I'm not anti-police, but I do have an issue with uh, being left out in the cold and we don't have a voice. So while the employees of the city do have three boards to assure that they're getting their case handled properly as a community, I don't feel like I have a voice and that creates a certain level of distrust with law enforcement and I will be an advocate of that. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I, I think I got my point across, but I'm, I'm obviously in favor of the Civilian Review Board and I don't speak so eloquently, I speak simple. Uh, there's problems, there's actions that we need to take and all I hear is deflection and no level of extreme ownership from those involved. Um, it's time for, for ownership. It starts with you guys. Council Member Garcia. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> I think this, this family has gone through a lot, and I just wanted to point to the critical incident transparency protocol and take advantage right now. I know we have a, a lot of cards, but this family uh, needs a lot of answers. Um, they have a lot of uh, things missing from the report, and so I don't know how we could figure that out um, and, and get someone together with them to make sure they get what they need. Walter Gray, unless, uh, Walter Gray will be followed by Britt London. Walter Gray is next. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm concerned about those 44, 42, and like this gentleman just said, I hope we're not dismissing 40, 44 deaths. You know, we've had the, the, the foundation, we've had the boards, we had the county attorney. All of those apparently have supported the officer who, who did the shooting. I, I'm a mentally ill person. I can't accept that. Because a mentally ill person doesn't comply with, with screaming officers. And, and so I think I hope that you don't let those 44 uh, cases uh, down now that these boards have acted. Uh, maybe he has to go and find an attorney and file a suit against the city. Maybe 44 people will, or maybe 20. But, you know, the idea is that uh, I think there should be a review of the, those 44 cases and see which ones, like the, the suicides by cop, because those are, are very challenging cases, and uh, check those out. Also, I think the police union needs to be uh, exposed here. They need to, they need, you need to hear from them in a, in a future meter in public, because they're, the leadership has some questionable background in their in their positions with the support of Joe Arpaio. And so, and, and, uh, and we're wondering if we want Arpaio policing in Phoenix or police, uh, Phoenix policing in Phoenix. Thank you, my time. 
Thank you. Britt London will be followed by Janelle Wood. Do I have four minutes, Mayor? I thought there was a card. Yes, there were two individuals, one marked to pose and weren't marked in favor, wishing to donate time. So Mr. London will have four minutes. And so okay. there is also an individual marked in favor of the item who would like four minutes. Thank so. you. So good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Britt London. I am the president of the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association. And to, uh, thank you. Please. Thanks, Mom. But anyway. Please be um, respectful. Mr. London has the floor. I would like to make a distinction. I don't speak for the Phoenix Police Department. I don't speak for the city. I speak for the members of our association. So, you know, as this moves forward, um, I would like to offer just some input um, to the council. Uh, of the three types of civilian review, investigative review and monitor, the city of Phoenix currently employs the review focused model. It's actually part of the Nicole. If you look, it, it is the same definition. Um, this model utilizes a board of review and question, uh, a board to review and question an internal police investigation and make recommendations for discipline of the officer in question. The Phoenix model also allows civilian members to question the officer during a disciplinary or use of force board. Since the process of civilian review is already in place here, I can only guess that the council would like to go forward with the investigative model of civilian review. So this model brings some challenges such as funding, board personnel, delayed investigations, and lawsuits brought against the city. Not to mention undermining the authority of police command personnel. It will be expensive to hire outside investigators to conduct their own investigation when the police department will also provide an investigation. It just seems like a waste of tax dollars. I'll be the first to agree that discipline plays an enormous part of a successful police department or any organization for that matter. I think we all know that. Discipline must be appropriate and only dispersed after a careful and critical examination of an alleged action. Not after two or three days of inaccurate media portrayal and certainly not with emotion. We shouldn't convict, then investigate. The investigation into an allegation of wrongdoing is the single most important piece of the discipline process. Without a solid investigation, doubt and question will rule the day. This is what the Phoenix Police Professional Standards Bureau, the members of our discipline and use of force boards, and executive police staff already do, provide a process that works. I'll suggest that you ask yourselves, what's wrong with the existing procedures? Are there cases where there was no discipline because of a shoddy investigation? I would suspect that you would need that proof before just believing everything that you hear. We've all heard the comments at public meetings that would have you believe that the Phoenix police officers are extremely brutal, picking innocent people out of a crowd and harassing them, and that a civilian review board is the answer. Civilian review boards are allowed in 200 of this nation's 18,000 police departments, but what effect have they had in cities such as Chicago or Baltimore? Take Seattle, for instance. This city had civilian review implemented, and a few years later, the federal government decided to step in and operate the police department. What went wrong there? What evidence is there that will show that a civilian review board will have any effect beyond what is already implemented in the Phoenix Police Department? The police are easy to attack because of what we symbolize, law enforcement. The ripple effect of distrust has now come to Phoenix. I believe that there are people on both sides of this issue that are willing to work towards solutions, solutions that are for Phoenix, because we aren't like other cities. It is difficult to remove emotion from the equation, and I can never say anything to mend some of the anger and hate, but we are better understood if we make the attempt to remove that from the discussion. Plea will always consider the issues of our community important, and we will not turn away any meeting that would produce better understanding and relationships. And I would also offer, if any of you want to know about our discipline process, I'm an expert, and I've got six experts at my office. We can tell you everything. Um, th there is a lot more to it. I don't expect anybody to know, um, but we're always there to help. Thank you. I'm sorry, this gentleman, I did forget. My serial number is 6157. Britt London, 6157. Thank you. Janelle Wood will be followed by Joe Grove.
Is Janelle here? She's, I'm sorry, is Janelle is here? All right, Joe, you're up. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for hearing me tonight. Um, I really feel like we're in a sad state of affairs here, people not getting along. Uh, we all have our biases when we come in this room, all of us. It's not black, it's not white, it's not red, it's not brown, it's all of us. And we've got to stop picking on each other because of our color or because of where we've come from. Um, and this mistrust, I'm not sure it all comes from. I come from a different background than you all did. So I don't know where it all comes from. But I do have a statement to make, and I'm going to go as quick as I can. Um, I'm an employed, taxpaying, law-abiding citizen of Phoenix. I have taken vacation time today from work to be here. Therefore, I ask the council in the future to make these meetings so that uh, working people can make the meetings. It's impossible. Uh, I support our police and law enforcement everywhere their job is dangerous, and as we expect them to do, they protect and help people in need constantly. The city of Phoenix does not need another police review board. They're doing their job in accordance with the situations they face and reviews already taking place. I am opposed to this proposed police civilian review board. There's nothing more than a, propose, a proposal to undermine the ability of the Phoenix police to operate effectively. Excuse me, I've been changing notes all day because I'm trying to make it quicker. I'm not going to make it very quick. I also believe we are here today uh, because certain community leaders and uh, Tom Horn himself, the wonderful man that he is, are using race and are using all of us for their own benefit, for power, for money, and fame. And this all has to stop. We expect our, I'm sorry, we expect our police department uh, to protect us from danger 427, 724, and, and that they constantly face abuse and the threat of personal harm. I, for one, thank them profusely for their service. When people break the law, however petty the crime, and refuse to obey police commands, police don't know why, how dangerous the criminal may be, and if they have a weapon, etc. So they have to amp up their apprehension of the criminals for their own safety. Please and that goes for people thought. with children. Am I done? Yes, thank you. Thank you. We have Dr. Ann Hart followed by Arnold Joseph Flores. Okay, thank you again, Mayor and City Council. Um, again, I'm a member of the CPTI and we're here for solutions. And I would like to say that we should convene a panel of community members and at least one outside expert city manager to explore the implementation of a civilian review body to hear and review complaints against the Phoenix Police Department with investigative powers to the extent permitted by the Arizona Revised Statutes with auditing authority and the ability to make substantive and binding judgments in connection with the complaints. Within six months of being convened, a panel would provide a report on the best practice and models for police department, department civilian review board. Civilian oversight boards are not a catch-all solution to excessive police force, but they can help to hold police accountable and reduce instances of the unnecessary use of force. Effective oversight boards also have the ability to enhance public safety and renew in public trust in police, especially within brown and black communities. To succeed, civilian oversight boards need resources and authority to maintain accurate data and foster positive relationships with city officials and community members. And above all, they must operate independently of the police departments themselves. So I think that would be a positive recommendation for all of us to get on board with. And this is information is further documented in the Center for American Progress. Thank you. Thank you. Arnold will be followed by Carol Coles-Henry. 
Thank you. Now, <clears throat> I'm a retired staff sergeant in the United States Army Infantry. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm Mexican American. My father came from Mexico. My grandfather came from Mexico. My wife comes from Mexico. Now, with that said, I don't agree with a civilian review, review board. I think a lot of this is a lot of emotion based, a lot of anger. There's a lot of anger on, on both sides. Some justified, some not. But let's take a look at our, our Phoenix Police Department. Of the six largest cities in order, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Houston, Phoenix, and Philadelphia, our police department is the smallest and the less paid and the least staffed civilian-wise. So you want to know why you don't get paperwork on time or it's missing parts? There's a staffing issue because our city council hasn't given a raise, hasn't given the staffing, and hasn't even given the police department that they need. Right. You keep saying every time I hear you on the video, every time I hear you at one of these meetings, first-rate city. Well, you want a first-rate city with a third-rate police department. Yep. If you want a first-rate city, then you need to have a first-rate police department. Right now, the closest city to us in population is Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia pays their officers $13,000 more a year annually on the average. And they also have 3,500 more police officers than we do. Yet they're only 25% the size landmass in which has to be patrolled. I'm sorry, I'm about to run out. You want to look out at um, Phoenix compared to Houston. Houston has a little, a little bit larger than us, but they also have 2,400 more police officers than we do. They get paid $6,000 more than our police officers do a month. So if you really want a solution to your problem, it's not a review board. It's give them the staff that they need, the support they need, the police officers we need. More police officers on the streets, less crime. Less police officers on the streets, more crime. Carol Coles Henry will be followed by Sunshine. Uh, last name starts with the K. I'm not sure on the pronunciation. <laughs> Carol. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Vice Mayor and members of the council for the opportunity to address this recommendation, which was core and key as part of our community police trust initiative work. One of our members, Jeremy Helfgut, is also a member of the Phoenix Human Relations Commission. And he worked, he's here tonight, but he can't speak because he wasn't here in time to put a card in. But one of the things I was really intrigued about and our members were intrigued about is that he came and represented members of our community. This particular recommendation to convene a panel of community members and at least one outside expert city manager to explore the implementation of a civilian review body What's core about that recommendation, it says convene a panel of people to explore with city management. One of the things that I felt as a member of city management, having worked for Phoenix for almost 30 years, the voice of the community was key. Even when the tough, we, it was really tough for us in our enforcement and uh, administrative responsibilities, having a pathway for community input and dialogue is essential. So I feel that the city council should follow the intent of our core recommendation to explore with experts and the community the implementation of the civil civilian review board. With the background of the CPTI, it was our recommendation. It was also the rec recommendation of the uh, previous group, the Community Outreach Task Force. I feel that it will advance the city and we possibly could come up with something that will be in, a, in its own a best practice better than anything of any of those cities that were on the list. So I ask for your support to follow the intent of our recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Sunshine will be followed by Diane Post. Hi, I am Sunshine Kincaid. Um, I am here to support the police and the policies that are already in place in this city. I think that additional oversight using a community re review board would be counterproductive to the peace in our city. Um, 
I think that it would encourage community rebellion and disrespect for authority if we put um, civilians over our police. If you, do not, if you do choose to implement further oversight, I think that it should apply not only to police, but to all government agencies. I do not think any of that is necessary at this time. I think that the community should be um, respectful of police and the policies that are already in place in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Diane Post will be followed by oh, Gerald Huron. Okay. Is Diane here? Gerald Huron will be followed by Mukhtar Sheikh. Is Gerald here? Is Mukhtar here? All right. No, Gerald. Uh, Gerald uh, Huron. I'm sorry, Gerald Huron, not here. Uh, so Mukhtar is next. Uh, my name is Mukhtar Sheikh, and I also support the police. I'm also critical of the police. Th that's just because I want a better police, that doesn't mean I'm anti-police. And if the community that ha doesn't have an ownership in the police department, then who they are serving. So we do need somebody oversight the police, and Chief William is not it because she herself is a police officer. And if she become a hard on the police, the police union is not going to support her, and people, member of the police union is not going to support her. Just what's happening in Mesa. So we do need somebody outside the police. Also, if 90% are happy with the police, what about that 10%? Mayor, Vice Mayor, that does 10% have a voice? I call the police officers. I do all the time. I serve an immigrant community. I call the police. You know what I want when that police come? To be professional, to be caring, to be understanding. Everybody calls the police officers. We don't want the police officer to be the judge and the jury. So we now enter police. We want community ownership. I didn't want to share this. I was a member of Refugee Police Advisors. I speak up because I, I said that in community meeting. Guess what happened? I was kicked out. Guess what I said? The police have to have a better positive approach. If they listen to me, what happened May 26th will not have happened. Because the police officers should not be cussing out. They have a high standard. They have to be first all the time. So we do need community engagement, honest community engagement, not selective. Not to put people the police like, not people who are blind eyed to the police. We need people from outside to look into this. We need a civility board. Uh, what I would suggest is the police community bureau should not run by police. It should be run by, civil, <laughs> by people not police. So they have a somebody from outside to tell them. So please, just because we are critical of police, we are not under police. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy Ensminger will be followed by Adam Melcher. Good evening. Um, my name is Wendy Ensminger. I live in Levine. I've had a history with um, Councilwoman then Gallego, now Mayor Gallego, and, and Councilman um, Nowakowski. You've always supported the police and you've always supported our community. Um, I just want to say, looking at all this, seeing the history of it, I think this started in 2009 when we had good numbers for our police officers. And then after that recession hit, we dropped way down. I think we were almost $1,000 or 1,000 officers down. And now we're at a point of 500 officers down. But this fiscal year, we could also lose to retirement another 300 officers. So the staff, staff sergeant made an excellent point. And it's, it's you people on our council. 
that ha are part of the problem are actually the problem. You don't don't hire enough officers. You don't you don't staff them. They worked. They do overtime. It's it's horrible. It's horrible to get a response time. I know that the. Um, Police chief, she has issued overtime, so you have detectives doing double duty. They're doing their day work and then they're coming out at night. You guys have got to buckle down. You've got to pay our police officers more, and you've got to hire more officers. And all this other stuff is just noise. So, so please do the right thing for our communities. Get the officers hired. Um, so anyway, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Adam Melcher will be uh, followed by Carolyn Lowry. My name is Adam Melner, and um, I'd like to thank you for what you're doing here today. Um, what I think an effective citizen's review board is, is all citizens, non sworn law enforcement, where complaints can be filed in a non intimidating environment where non-police investigators conduct independent investigations with subpoena power. They provide citizen input in the policy. Complaint outcomes can be determined by citizens without an agenda. They can make recommendations for discipline, recommendations. And they would be an advisory board. Um, and the most importantly, they would make reports to the public, elected officials, and the police, create a system of checks and balances that hold each other accountable. Public information is the key to accountability no matter what process is adopted. And I would like to ask a question about the disciplinary review board, use of force board. There are no minority votes produced. So we don't know how the citizens voted. And they see the same investigation over and over again. Not new ones. It's all the same as yesterday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is Carolyn Lowry here? Gary Ensminger will be followed by Clovis Campbell. Hello, my name is Gary Ensminger. Unfortunately, coming at the end of this, most of the people have stolen my thumber, thunder. Um, I'd like to reiterate some of the things I've said. We are fifth largest city, but there seem to be 10 cities that are smaller than us that have larger police departments that pay them more money. So before we go spending millions of dollars on new IT equipment or civilian reboard boards, or studies or questionnaires, why don't we get the police officers back on the street where they belong? Staff up the police department like we promised we were gonna get it back in 2009, and then we can start addressing the other issues that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Clovis Campbell will be followed by Vicki Yaquez. Is, do we have a Vicky? Uh, Lupita Rubio. Diane Barker. Good evening, Mayor and Council and City Management. I'm Diane Barker and I live downtown in District 7. A just society delivers justice upon violators and innocents. 
and in listening to Mr. Dahoney's, um, you know, uh, rundown of the CRB, I'm in support of that. He mentioned a word, which was perspective. If this brings another perspective. I'm also in support of Councilwoman Pastors asking that you do the research to bring the different elements so that we can have the best comprehensive citizen review board. This goes on beyond culture. It goes very much directly to haves and haves not. And justice is for everyone. Not everyone can afford an attorney, but as you've even heard this, when allegations against, and I do support our law uh, enforcement, they have an attorney. And if you don't like it at the city level, if the standards board rubber stamped everything, and you go into court, you're going to get in modern day litigation the powers that will go up against you in denial and you will not get justice. We need to have this open. We need to have the citizen light on this. We need to have the public light on it. We need to have the press on this for a just society. Thank you. Tam Tammy Garver followed by Michael Pence. Is Tammy here? Great. Hello, my name is Tammy. I'm with Patriot Movement AZ. We already have three layers of citizen review board. This is another way for the radical left and the anti-police cults to have police officers fired. Until what? No more police? When is enough enough? Is it too much to ask to take orders and do what the police say? I can't help but think that a lot of the public outrage towards the police is fueled and fanned by the media. What they choose uh, to cook, the message they push to the public and what the target audience is, not to mention the programming of Hollywood. The police deserve respect and compliance from the public, not hostility, aggression, name calling, or blatant violence against them. When provoked or attacked, the police have a right to defend themselves just like we as civilians do. <clears throat> the body cams are effective and tamper proof. If someone gives the police a reason to take force, perhaps harsher punishment should be put on the individual. Instead of forcing the police to roll over and put their lives in danger in the name of tolerance. On the flip side, if an officer uses unnecessary force on someone who is complying, then of course we can't have that either. Which is why we already have review boards, body cams, and let's not forget the police have supervisors and laws too. Back the blue. Thank you. Michael Pence will be followed by Rich Oseal. Is Michael here? Uh, Rich Oseal will be followed by Reverend Juan, uh, John Morellis. It started out as good afternoon, so I'll say good evening to Mayor and City Council. Um, I also am from Patriot Woman AZ. I've lived in Phoenix for the last 23 years, like Councilman Waring, a former Chicagoan. And like him, you couldn't pay me enough to go back there either. <laughs> it's uh, not a place that uh, you'd want to be. This is, I came to Phoenix thinking this is really a much better place to live. And the last 23 years have not proven me wrong when I made that decision to come here. I want to be on record as saying I support the police. I support the guy in the corner there, the guy in the corner there, the ones outside the building, the plainclothesmen, 
the detectives, all of them. They do a fantastic job, and I thank them for it. I'm here to also voice my opposition to the Civilian Review Board creation of this board. One of the problems with boards that, like this, when the result is not what is desired by a certain segment of the uh, population, it's kind of like the Mueller report. The Mueller report didn't uh, produce the results that certain people wanted, so now they need another board or another uh, investigation. And that's what happened with the review board. If there was a, a case here in Phoenix that was very controversial, kind of emotional, whatever, and uh, the results weren't what uh, people were pushing for, we would have to have another investigation and another review. So that's just kind of what seems to happen with these kind of boards and these kinds of uh, situations. So I just want to say once again, I support the police department 100%. I oppose this creation of this review board. Don't Portland our Phoenix. Thank you. John Morellis will be followed by Teresa Leidenberger. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and City Council persons. Um, my name is Reverend John Morellis. I'm the National Chaplain for the League of United Latin American Citizens, the oldest and largest Hispanic civil rights organization in the United States. Back in July 2015, uh, LULAC had uh, basically passed a national resolution to establish civilian police review accountability boards for every local, state, and federal law enforcement agency in the United States. Um, civilian police uh, review accountability boards would allow communities to have more balance of power in law enforcement behavior in neighborhoods across the nation. Um, civilian police review accountability boards are guarded by 10 principles uh, in order to have an effective civilian police review accountability board, and that would be independence. Uh, the power to conduct hearings, subpoena witnesses, and report findings and recommendations to the public, and to promote transparency. Investigatory power, the authority to independently investigate incidents and issues on complaints. Uh, mandatory police cooperation, complete access to po police witnesses, and documents through legal mandate and subpoena power. Uh, adequate funding should not be, and the board should not be a lower budget priority than police internal affairs systems. Uh, hearings are essential for solving credibility problems and transparency and in, in, in enhancing public trust uh, in, in the process. But it also should reflect uh, community diversity. The board and staff should be broadly represented in the community it serves, and it should be proportionate representation. Uh, policy recommendations. Uh, civilian oversight can spot problem policies and provide a forum for uh, developing reforms. Uh, plus, the st statistical analysis. Public statistical reports can detail trends and allegations and early warning systems can identify offers officers who are subjects of unusually numerous complaints. Uh, if you could give us your final thought. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, plus, should be there should be separate offices and also a disciplinary role for the civilian uh, community uh, accountability board. Thank you. Teresa will be followed by Vidi Hernandez. Thank you. My name is Teresa, and I'm a, uh, from Colorado, transplanted to Arizona with my military son when he transitioned out. Um, my family is very patriotic, and I look up here at the board, and I see somebody with a protest shirt on doing public business. I'm sorry. That is disgusting to me. If you want to protest, you do it in your own time. Yeah. Period. 
because I can look at you and you don't represent me. You don't represent me like you're supposed to represent everyone. My God, you know, for real. And I'm looking at the police, I've heard all the attacks. And this week we're burying a 26 year old deputy sheriff, volunteer fire part member in my hometown as a suicide. This constant attack, and now you want to add another review board? Good God. How many reviews do you have to do? Fix the ones you got. Quit keep throwing money at the items. Excuse the language. But you keep throwing money. You're supposed to be doing something for the city. I don't. I heard someone say that you guys had said you were going to hire more cops, pay them better, treat them better. That's out the window. We got a professional protester up there. I don't know who to trust up there. I really don't know who to trust. I don't know who to trust. And before you say anything, yeah, I'm, in a, I'm a Rivera before I got married. So my family is Hispanic. We grew up with that. Maybe I don't look like it, but that's what I grew up with. Thank you for your testimony. V.D. Hernandez will be followed by Sharon Steely. Hello. Okay. Um, I mean, it's been interesting to hear all your migrant stories, Jim Waring, and a lot of people. I'm also a migrant. Came to Phoenix 26 years ago. Um, and I think in that, right, like who then has ownership of like what needs to happen? Council members here are elected in our communities to represent us. And similar as, you know, I guess you can be a professional protester, I don't know, um, like similar that, that this council member doesn't represent you, so many of these other council members don't represent us. And that's part of why, why we're here. We heard uh, police representation talk about how they're experts in how the disciplinary process happens. And that's really appalling and concerning because while they become experts because they're allowed a space into these meetings, they're allowed to be in all of these review process, they're allowed to represent the officers, the, fam the families don't get that same privilege. The families get excluded from every single process and they don't give the chance to, as, this, you know, as Mr. London talked about, how they've become experts throughout the years because they are allowed. There also was a question about when has the review not worked, right? In one of these boards, for example, in, um, with Officer McGowan, the board refused to watch the video camera footage. And they made a decision about this officer being rehired without watching the footage. So that's one example. And like that, there's many more. The discipline that gets went in, you know, very unlikely that there is discipline. When there is discipline, 85% or more of the times that officers appeal the discipline, it is overturned or it is lowered. So that is showing us that that discipline is not working, that discipline is actually not happening. And this came from a report that the police department created and launched about a few, a few years ago. Right, and as right, the other thing, I'm asked for two other minutes that I think someone requested, uh, Mr. London, Sarah gave me her uh, time, Sarah Tacola who's no longer here, so all that to add. I'm also here for, to talk about Justina Hernandez, who's the mother of Alejandro Hernandez. They had to leave, um, but they were here and they wanted to talk about their son. Their son was shot Shut and their son was killed. And this whole process has been inaccessible to the family. And what she wanted to ask in this process is that there needs to be an independent process. She wants to hear why and how her son died. She wants closure about how her baby boy was killed. He's 25 years old. When they called asking for help. She also asked that community and that families deserve a seat at those tables. She asked to be able to be there, uh, her, her children, or other families 
to be able to sit and have a real analysis about these processes. Um, as many of you brought up, who are the pool of these 30 people that get rotated? A handful of people that I know submitted to be part of these advisories and were never followed up with, were never called, were never, there was no process. And so those pools are not diverse and they are actually not representative of our community. Thank you. Sharon Steely will be followed by Randall Holmes. Is Sharon here? Randall Holmes will be followed by Carrie Lee. Hi folks, I've uh, moved in from the suburbs about four years ago and this is my first city council meeting. I'm ashamed that uh, it's taken me this long to get here, I'm sorry. But uh, thank you for having me. Please be gentle, this is my first time. So uh, uh, we the people, and we have to be uh, reminded of this now and then, we the people are the government. And the people on the stage are the people we've hired uh, uh, who have volunteered, possibly, to run our, help us run our government. The police department are our employees. And we have certain standards that they have to meet. You have an, an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You do not have the right to be a Phoenix police officer. That is a privilege that you have to earn. Now, what we need is a chain of command that carefully screens our applicants for the police department for mental and emotional stability, and we have to screen them for a, a disorder that many of us European Americans have, which is called white fright. White people are scared to death of people who are less white than they are. So, if you, if you are the type of guy that thinks you're on a SWAT team, and you wanna wave your gun around and, and point your gun at a family sitting in a car, and uh, tell them you're gonna bust a cap in their head and use all kinds of obscenities and stuff. You do not belong on my police department. You are welcome to go find honest employment elsewhere. And all you professional police officers that are here today, God bless you, we love you, we do support you, believe it or not. But we depend on you to know who the wackos are in the department, because you hear them talk and you see what they do. Now, you just seen in the news the other day that the Border Patrol has a secret Facebook uh, group of present and past uh, Border Patrol officers that joke about uh, their racist uh, senses of humor and how uh, cruel and sadistic they can be to the people in their custody. Well, with the Border Patrol needs to be fumigated. And if the police department does too, then we depend on you officers to help serve and protect us from the wackos that do not belong in the police department. I thank you and God bless you again. I want to remind everyone we are taking testimony on the topic of the role of civilians in the Phoenix Police Department. <laughs> Carrie Lee will be followed by Michelle Ruiz. Uh, Madam Mayor and City Council members, I had a lot of bullet points and I don't want to beat a dead horse, a lot of it has already been addressed, so instead I'm going to address some of the things that have come up as I've been here. Um, I do not support a, a citizen review board um, for multiple reasons. Essentially, we've discussed how it's already, citizens are already involved. It seems as though we're trying to fix something that's not broken. It doesn't seem to have been any evidence that it is actually effective. There's no, it's not an evidence-based practice if you were to ask me as a professional. Um, additionally, another thing that keeps coming up is this issue of race. I think one of the things that, I can't remember, I apologize, one of the um, city council members mentioned the civil service board and the racial demographic makeup of it, and it doesn't seem as though it's very representative of the community. It's actually a board that is, um, the very purpose is to be an appeal mechanism for the officers. So I think it would be interesting if it actually represents the officers, because you know, me, my husband, my brown officer husband, um, isn't really represented on that. And it's very interesting how disrespectful you guys are and how it's not, it matter, it doesn't matter if they're brown or black or different color when there's, it doesn't when I'm speaking, when someone's speaking about the officers, but it sure does when we're talking about you as a citizen and a community member. I'm not gonna talk to you because you're not worth my time. The next thing that I keep hearing is that we need to be working together. What I see is communities that are, or communities that are put together that are actually side by side, and by doing this, we're actually going to be segregating further. And so that is a problem for me. Additionally, I do see um, that citizens 
Every citizen has a course of action outside of the police department if they do not feel like something was justified or uh, there's criminal and there's civil courses that they could take. We keep talking about families not having something to do. We're families too. Our men and women come home to their kids, their sisters, their wives, their husbands, all of that. So please understand that every day they're walking into a very dangerous job not knowing what it's going to look like, and they do that to protect and serve. Michelle Ruiz, followed by Kathy Frings. I'm pretty short, so. Good evening now, six hours later. Um, first, I would like to address a comment earlier and stating this for the record. I will state that policing was created to sure protect property at a time when property was included for enslaved people. It was created to keep enslaved people in place while white folks held the power and the status quo. At root, this system was created to function in a way that it does not protect or serve black and brown bodies. And yes, this continues today. And for there should also be an apology for comparing the life. I am speaking. I have the mic. You be quiet. You Google Google. And there should also be an apology. There should also be an apology. There should be. Michelle has the floor. Please do not physically approach someone. Please stop my time. I cannot speak stop when this time. is happening. We Thank will stop you. your time. It is unacceptable to, yes. Physically intimidation is not acceptable here. I don't know. I like Mayor. 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 Can Council and Testor. Can we just take a minute to what? take a minute? Thank you, Michelle. If you would like a full two minutes, you may have a full two minutes. Thank you, Mayor. Can we reset the clock? Michelle has the floor. Continuing that statement, there should also be an apology for comparing the lives of human beings to that of taking a TV of an apartment. It is absolutely not the same, and it was a disgusting statement to hear. When it comes to the committee, I would like to take a minute to state, for technicality purposes, that this conversation must also include accountability and oversight of school resource officers, which are now being hired through the union from Phoenix PD. Currently, there is an officer that this past semester who works a regular gra graveyard shift, then came to a school campus to complete their extra shift without sleep, without rest, which is dangerous, absurd, and must be addressed immediately. Clearly, the union did not think this was a problem as it is happening right now. PLEA currently has hiring power over SROs. We also heard allegedly they have disciplined policies for officers. They left out to also include that they associate with extremists who repeatedly spit at underage youth, flip people off, speak profanity, and threaten the lives of community members repeatedly. These are people in their membership. This is a strong reason why this committee must, have, must move forward, and this is why we need unbiased and unracist accountability to exist. Lastly, the board should also in some way oversee and include school resource officers and the, um, include the school district in the hiring of any officers that are placed on school grounds. Lastly, thank you to council members who using all forms of representation, a t-shirt or however it is, include and is done to reflect and represent that voters that actually elected that person. Thank you. Kathy Frings will be followed by Aaron Lopez. Is Kathy here? Aaron Lopez will be followed by John Chambers. We had two people donate their times ahead of time. We're not going to allow any additional donations of time. We had one opposed and one in favor. We have over 30 individuals wishing to testify.
We had two people accept, ask for time ahead of time. We gave uh, opposed and in favor each equal time. Is Garrick McFadden here? All right, Garrick McFadden is next. Uh, Please be respectful. Garrick has the floor. My, uh, my name is Garrick McFadden. Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, City Council. Um, thank you for giving an excellent presentation. Uh, there's a lot of questions that have come up that I have, like um, in Chicago, with the Civilian Review Board, do they have subpoena, is it two separate tracks when a criminal investigation is occurring? Like, does the Civilian Re uh, Review Board, does it toll um, so that they cannot begin their investigation until after the criminal proceeding has ended? I know with the Laquan McDonald inc uh, incident, there was the camera, the, the body uh, camera, was available, um, but it was not subpoenaed. And I don't know if that was a technicality. So what Councilwoman Pasteur has said about studying the best things. Now, we have the opportunity to craft something completely new. Is that correct? We have carte blanche. We can create the new Phoenix model that accurately reflects the spirit of Arizona, of Phoenix, our frontier mentality. We can have opportunities to do things that haven't been done before. What, there's been so much information that has been given out. I support the Civilian Review Board because of the different perspective. It gives a different means for people to go. Um, one of the things that people might not feel comfortable going through the other uh, process. The families might have a chance, like they do in criminal court, to have a victim impact statement. They could have a victim impact statement in the Civilian Review Board. We have the opportunity to use our imaginations, our creativity, to craft something that will work and that will be the best practice. So I support this. Thank you, Your Mayor, for the time. Thank you. Jillian M. followed by Abigail Adams. Hi, thank you. Um, law does not run on emotion. Emotions run hot and cold. Emotions change. Emotions are not run by reason or logic. Emotions are personal human responses, and they vary greatly from person to person, as we've seen here today. Thankfully, though, for all of us, the law is not run on emotion. The proposed Citizen Review Board would be run on emotion and, by nature, chaotic. I see this as a step back in the justice system for us all. The Arizona State Medical Review Board is comprised of 12 members. Eight are practicing physicians. Four are members of the public. One of those four is to be a registered nurse, leaving three positions open to the public. All of these seats, to my understanding, are appointed by the governor himself. This is essentially, as we've talked about here today, what the Phoenix Police Department already has implemented. The Use of Force Board has three citizens, the Disciplinary Review Board has two, um, and then the additional with five citizens. But these citizens have been trained on case law regarding law enforcement because law and order is key, not emotions and mob rule. Doctors on a review board are judged by a group of their peers, not by a group of former medical malpractice complainants. This pr proposed citizen review board would include alleged police br brutality victims and anti-police members of the city. It goes without saying that this board would be inherently biased. This is not done in the practice of medicine. This is not done by the Bar Association in regards to lawyers, and it should not be done for our police officers. Thank you. Abigail Adams followed by Melina F. Is, is Abigail here? And if you could state your name, that would be helpful. Melina F. Thank you. Anytime a cop is the subject of a screaming headline, calls for investigations immediately follow. 
Lawyer smell lawsuits. The usual coalition of people who wish to harm the order of our city proceed to paint a grossly exaggerated version of the incident and claim it is typical of all police in the department. Some city leaders fall for the media manipulation by making negative public statements regarding police actions before any official investigation is complete, much less even started. This emboldens criminals to further disregard police authority and stirs up a situation between police and community that's fraught with tension and danger. In this atmosphere, it's easy for politicians to decide that a civilian review board is a wonderful campaign issue which could be made highly popular. There's no need in Phoenix for another such board. Legal machinery already exists to handle the complaints against the police including the Disciplinary Review and Use of Force Board and Civil Service Boards, which already have citizens on the boards. Motives of those promoting civilian review boards are questionable. The power to discipline is the power to control. The Civilian Review Board makes officers subservient to a small group of unelected, politically oriented, an often biased group of unelected lay people who neither know nor understand police problems. The Phoenix Police, which provide frontline protection against crime in our city, is being targeted in order to weaken their ability to identify and stop criminals and terrorists who would disrupt our city. We must remind ourselves that local law enforcement is the only thing that stands between us and a devastating, brutal anarchy. The council should ask important questions like, are officers really constitutional renegades? Is the Phoenix Police Department really a racist justice apparatus arbitrarily descending on minorities? Are people making specific accusations or just spouting hate for police in general. Could you, uh, could you wrap up, please? What methodology has been used to prove Phoenix PD is racist, corrupt, or guilty of widespread brutality? Or is it actually the reverse, that resistance to lawful police action is becoming routine, and civilian brutality against the police is increasing? Thank you. <laughs> Leonard Clark. Is Leonard still here? Yeah. Leonard Clark, yeah. You can, send, you can send your people over here when little girls are talking. We didn't send anybody over there. You just showed your true face. City Council, this is why we need a Citizens Review Board. A little girl, maybe not 100 pounds, speaks, and a thug who supports the police comes up and tries to shut her up. Oh, but it's all in our heads, you know. Sorry. We have modern technology, social media, live video. This is only going to get worse. You remember Joe Arpaio. Well, of course we remember that loser and has been who costs us hundreds of millions of dollars in Maricopa County. We could go bankrupt as a city. You're going to be doing more settlements for police. Oh, and all this talk about, you know what, the, the families, uh, you know, you have all these boards. The families aren't allowed to present their case, just like this uh, regressive grand jury system that we have here. And don't even set up that false narrative, because there are a lot of police that do give their lives, but the problem is, police union, plea, you become the Teamsters of the 1970s. And, you know, apologies to my Teamsters friends. I mean, two days from now, we're going to have tanks in the streets of Washington, D.C. This whole post-9-11, the police have to be the military. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's only going to make your lives safer and our community's lives safer if we can have a civilian review board. But you're not going to silence us. And we just saw the face of that right now. We saw the face of it at the Trump hate rally in 2017. Yes. Nothing was done. Nothing was done. Tear gassing indiscriminately thousands of people. Yet a 100 pound little girl comes up here to speak and your friend, and you're not getting up there putting, saying that was wrong. You need to stand up and you need to condemn that. Because if you don't, then that he speaks for you. And I'm not afraid of you, sir. I'm not afraid of any fascist. My father served under the command of General George S. Patton. Okay? So don't ever try to stop and come up here and bully a little girl again. That, if you don't condemn that, then you stand for him. I need you, one of you to stand up and say what he did was wrong. Thank you. Lord, Lori W. followed by J.J. Johnson.
Uh, Lori, Lori W., who is coming, followed by J.J. Johnson. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. So, I am the face of a wife. I've been married for 36 years to the same man who has been a police officer for 34 years, the last 19 and a half years in Phoenix. I'd like to give you some data, and it is some data that you've already heard tonight, um, but earlier this afternoon, um, our board was talking about liking to hear data, and also, um, Councilman Garcia, you asked about the tools that they need. So Phoenix, currently, at 2017 census, 1.626 million people, covering 516 square miles. We have 3,000 sworn police officers. The city of Philadelphia, 140 square miles of 1.5 million people. So close to the same. And they have 6,300. So we are not 500 officers short. They have doubled the police officers. Let me tell you a little bit about our families. My husband comes home tired. He works overtime, so the SRO officer that's coming to the school after he's doing extra duty is because they're trying to make money. We took pay cuts, excuse me, thank you. We took pay cuts over 10 years, city council, and you know that that's the truth. Pay cut after pay cut. I'm a registered nurse. I've been a nurse for 32 years. We didn't get into this work for the money. We did it for the community. And I'm asking for the task number two that you're voting on. There's been no objective data for you to change what is currently in place. Thank you for your time. JJ will be followed by Angie Russo. Mayor, Council. When a paramilitary organization res becomes resistant to scrutiny and oversight, there's a term for that, and that term is sedition. The police department doesn't want to be scrutinized for any of the things that they do. And what this causes is it causes a situation where good cops are unable to report misconduct because they are targeted for retribution and retaliation by their peers. Now, the one city that Mr. Dahoney failed to mention was Cincinnati, where he was a city manager that had a very functional civilian review board. So I'd like to hear more about that. We hired Mr. Dahoney because he had a breadth of, of experience from Cincinnati, and I think he isn't listened to very often. Fire we'll get to that. We are now on the fourth police chief during Ed Zerker's tenure. He's not been able to lead this city forward, and you need to be looking at making a change there. Probably a nice enough guy to have a beer with, not very good at his job. It is time to do something different. If you want to protect cops, change the culture in this city so that good cops are able to report misconduct and be protected. Thank you. Angie will be followed by Maria Cruz Ramirez. Jeruso. Thank you for allowing me to come and speak today. No one thinks that there's not room for improvement, but we should always try and uh, strive for improvement for all people, 
because common sense is not an ethnic group. Uh, but to have an oversight committee completely devoid of law enforcement officers is ridiculous, unproductive, problematic, and dangerous at best. How can anyone sit in judgment of someone who has never had the experience of making life and death decisions in a split second? What other area of life would anyone think that's a good idea? If you're a parent, do you ask for parenting advice from those people who aren't parents? How about medical advice from someone who isn't a medical professional? We wouldn't ask for advice from people not in the field. Why in God's name would we think it's a good idea to allow them to sit in judgment of law enforcement? As I, as I said, there's always room to improve, but make sure you're not creating another problem while trying to solve this problem. Catering, creating a lawless environment by undermining the authority of law enforcement solves absolutely nothing and makes everyone less safe, civilians and police officers included. I just moved here seven months, from Cal uh, seven months ago from California, and I can promise you this, you don't wanna do anything that California is doing. Do not follow suit. Ever since I got here, all I hear is don't California my Arizona. Trust me on this one. You do this and you'll California it all right. Thank you very much. Ms. Ramirez will be followed by Noel Rosen. Noel will be followed by Kathleen Brady, Brody. Hello, my name is Noel Rosen. I am with Rally for Law Enforcement. And I see what this Citizen Review Board is gonna do. It's basically gonna tie the hands of police officers from doing their jobs. We should never give in to these agitators because this is what these anti-cop agitators want. They want a Citizen Review Board, they wanna put their own people on it, and they wanna start doing, you know, causing a little bit of chaos. That's what I see. This is political posturing. This really is. We, we dealt with this issue a few months back, back in March. This came before the city council. And I got to tell you, they said no then. They should need to say no now. We should not be giving the agitators another inch, okay? The second of all, I just want to say, as someone said before, Mayor Gallego and Councilman Garcia, you should never have gone on an apology tour. You threw the officers under the bus. And you know what, Councilman Garcia, if you want to uh, adv you know, be an activist up there, no, no way. You should not be, be able to Excuse me, excuse me. You want to? Are you gonna? Are you just gonna keep interrupting me? Here's the problem, okay? You're a professional activist. You should not even be in that position. You wear that shirt. It's disgusting and despicable. And you need to step down. If you want to be an activist, go back to Puente. You can do it. You can do it from there. And Mayor Gallego, I gotta tell you, there's a lot of people here that support law enforcement. I believe in backing our cops, and I do it unapologetically. I will not apologize for it, and I will tell you one thing. I have Thank these cops back. Thank you for your back. testimony. No, you know. M Martha Albavara. Martha. Martha will be followed by Francisco Chavez. I'm Kathy. Is, right, is Kathleen. it my turn? Kathleen. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm Kathy Brody. I'm a Phoenix resident. I live in District 3, and um, I'm, sp I'm speaking in support of a civilian review board, specifically the type that was uh, described as an investigations board, because I think we need an independent, investigatory, and civilian-led review board here in Phoenix. Um, I, I'm saying this as a person who, as part of my living, I've done independent investigations, and uh, Councilman Waring, you asked earlier, why would anyone want a different lev another level of review? And you know, to that I could say, go ask any CEO or general counsel of a company. They have an independent investigation so that they can find out what, if anything, went wrong how to fix it, and how to make sure it never happens again. And that's, that's what we're asking for. Um, because the police are supposed to serve us, the community, the people who live and work here, um, not, not to serve themselves. They should serve and protect us, um, because that's their job. So we, the people of Phoenix, including myself, and I guess most people here, um, we should have a fully transparent window into the department, especially, but not only, when officers use force to hurt and kill people. I can't understand why the department, or anyone really, is so afraid of real civilian oversight. Um, from what I've seen, uh, from my own experience, the circle the mentality, the circle the wagons mentality that I've seen, um, when something goes wrong or when people express concerns, that's really a major part of the problem. Civilians, the community, the people, we need to be able to see inside that circle and actually get inside the circle of the wagons. The police department needs to open the wagons and you, the city council, you're the ones that need to force that circle open. And it's important it's important that community members, especially those from families affected by police violence, are part of building and implementing that civilian review board every step of the way. Thank you. Martha Albavara will be followed by Francisco Chavez. Is Martha here? Is Martha here? Is Francisco Chavez here? Xenia Aronia. Sorry, huh? Third time. Spell it out. Xenia. Xenia. Is that her? All right. That's all right, Kate. Or uh, Mayor Gallego. Um, I'm sorry, if you would just excuse me for one second. I need to bring my statement back up. Okay. Um, so, first off, I believe that the Civilian Review Board should be the first to review police misconduct. The Civilian Review Board should be a demographically balanced and representative body. This board needs to have full subpoena, investigation, suspension, and firing powers. This way, Phoenix can root out bad actor cops, including those who beat, rape, and kill our people. Between the last two weeks, we have had first-hand accounts of all of this, and since the chief will not give consequences, we need people-powered oversight to do it for her. Uh, second, of, uh, second of all, Councilman Waring, what do you prefer? What do you hold in higher priority? Your stuff or our lives? The, being, being held to a, lower, to a lower priority than the things that are in your house or in your apartment is frankly disgusting. I prefer to protect people's lives. I think that the Civilian Review Board is a needed first of many steps that needs to be taken. And since, there, since the current civilian held positions are not being effective, this is an option. Let's take this option. Thank you.
Lorenza Armanderas followed by Gisette Knight. Is Lorenza here? Is Gisette here? Sean Severud followed by Sarah Tacola. Mayor and members of council, first off, I'd like to ask, where's Sal? Is he on the phone? Is he here? Where's he at? Yeah, that's him. That's the guy. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, I'd like to uh, just make sure that I heard this right from, from uh, Vice Mayor Waring, uh, who suggested that if the response is disproportionate, quote, so be it, is the vice mayor encouraging police to abuse their power, to abuse the people of Phoenix? Because that's what I heard. And you can stop the clock so, so, so he can respond to that, because maybe I misinterpreted. No, but if they feel they need to send seven officers, then they need to send seven officers. Seven officers for a four-year-old? Okay, well, realistically, they probably don't know that when they get the call. They just get the call. Okay, so... So I guess I'll say this, I'll just sum it up. If you know what this is, I'm a believer in the castle doctrine. End of story. All right, I guess that answers that. So um, I normally have something prepared to say for these meetings, because I've been coming to these for years now, unfortunately. Um, but I woke up this morning uh, to the news that uh, an old friend of mine, an ex, ex of mine, had died in a car accident in LA. And so pretty much all day I've been sort of out of sorts, I've been angry, uh, I've, I haven't really known how to handle it, and that's exactly sort of what's going on with this community for the last number of years. This community is grieving, and this community has not been heard. Um, so when you, when you hear people being emotional, yeah, there's a, there's a reason for that. When people's family members are getting murdered, uh, they get emotional. And at the end of the day, whether you're anti-police or whether you support the police, at the end of the day, police are gonna exist. So we need to figure out how to exist with a police that doesn't abuse their authority. And at the end of the day, what's gonna not completely solve that, but make a huge difference is a police oversight board with subpoena and firing power. Thank you. Sarah Tacola followed by Ginny Ann Sumner. Is Sarah here? Is Ginny Ann Sumner here? What I haven't heard through this discussion is also a to create a mechanism for officers to receive praise um, Con, um, commendations, um, commendations for their work, and we need to find a way to put this out in the public, whether it's social media, whether it's news, whatever it is. So I think we also need to consider this is another way to recognize our officers. Thank you. Is Berta Rita here? Maria Castro followed by Lisa Antone. Up, homie. Um, I'm speaking in favor of the community review board. I think it's important that families who have had first hand experience, whose loved ones were taken away by law enforcement, be um, on this review board. Um, and specifically, that no officers, no former officers, and no city employees or former city employees be on this panel because it would create an unsafe environment for those families to be uh, able to accurately participate. Um, I think that should also be reflected in the ad hoc committee. I'm speaking directly to all of the city council people who are going to have an opportunity to appoint folks. Think about reaching out to the families who have been directly affected by police violence and have those folks uh, have a representative uh, of their family on the ad hoc committee as well. Um, and this civilian review board it needs to have 
um, power to do revisions and suggestions to changes of policy and changes of training. What we saw with 4.48 uh, two years ago was that the policy changed, but the training didn't. And so that it wasn't reflecting um, the change of, of practice in the city. Um, and so this civilian review board needs to have the power to make suggestions to change in policy because what we see and the reason why these systems are failing us is because they, the cops are killing us and it's legal. And it's completely within the rules to murder us and to take our lives because there has, no, there has been no regard and no respect and no dignity for the lives of black and brown communities uh, written within the policies and the laws of this city and of this state. And so this board needs to be able to review those, rewrite them, and change the training and the policies uh, so that you can't keep killing us legally. Lisa Antone, followed by Leslie Pico. Hi, my name is Lisa Antone. First of all, who's us, exactly? What is with the racism that I hear only ever coming from the radical left? <laughs> only. The only oppressed black people in this room are the leftists. The only oppressed Hispanic people are the leftists. You know why? Because you take no accountability for your own actions. Stop! There are no oppressed black conservatives and no oppressed black Hispanics or, or conservative Hispanics. It's disgusting. And you people up here, shame Please. on every one of you activists. Keep your testimony to the off civil Shame on and every one of you activists up here. Mayor Ted Wheeler, and that is how I will refer to you because that is what you want. You want a lawless society like we have in Portland, like we see in Berkeley, like we see in Los Angeles County. You have no interest in upholding the laws for this country. So you know what? I think all the police should quit. I say forget it. They should quit because you know what? You have never, never had their backs. Never. Laura Pastor, I heard you speak to chief, to the chief, with such condensation, exactly, exactly, exactly. That is exactly what all, every single normal Phoenix citizen needs to see is the lack of respect off of this council. Laura, Laura Pastor literally talked to the chief like she was a five-year-old. You, mayor, you allowed your radical leftists to go on for three and four minutes Leslie Pico. Leslie Pico will be followed by Michelle Rose. First of all, I want to say thank you to, I know that I'm not on the stage now, but um, Laura Pastor for her very poignant questions. I only wish that many other council members had just, were just as informed uh, because it's evident that you're not. Um, I also want to give a great, you know, big thank you to Councilman Garcia. Um, I am on the border and just right in that district, thank goodness I'm not in seven. Um, so I want to give a huge thanks to Councilman Garcia for everything that he's doing. Racism is not just perpetuated by the people in white hoods. It's also the, I have black friends, or I'm a brown guy, many of whom who are in Language. this room. They refuse to see the part that they play in the system because they're too busy making sure that everybody knows how racist they're not. Being married to these people does not give you a free hall pass out of the structure and the system of structural racism. Uh, being able to live without having to be defined by your skin color is actually the hallmark of privilege. As the fifth largest city in the United States, Phoenix remains the largest overall without an independent body holding the police department accountable. Many of our community advocates have been calling for similar reforms for as long as you have been on the city council, Mayor Kate, yet you keep asking for more time. We don't need any more time. It's a luxury that only you have, evidently. We need you to make a decision that moves forward on enacting this board. 
Do not allow the people to continue to bicker on forever to become mired in years in debates over the details. As mayor, you have the power to make the decision. You do. So you can lead or you can leave for vacation while the rest of the community just waits. I support a citizen review board and the community supports it. We're ready to elect leaders who support it and remove those who continue to deter and delay these efforts. Mayor Kate, we're asking you to demonstrate your concern for police conduct to your constituents. Do not leave for vacation without making a decision. You've been present for this conversation for years and the time for discovery is over. <laughs> Michelle Rose followed by Katie Jo. Hello, Michelle Rose. I am speaking in support of the Independent Citizens Review Board because the current boards are ineffective. The reason I say they're ineffective is we're number one, but for all the wrong things, number one in police shootings and these over-the-top responses to minor infractions. So I'm just asking that we be reasonable about this. It's illogical to have one's own friends and colleagues collect, store, and analyze evidence about an alleged crime, much less be the judge and the jury. It's a glaring conflict of interest, and unintentional and intentional biases will affect the outcome. I propose that we have a Citizens Review Board that has technical, legal, social, and policy expertise, not random people. It should be comprised of attorneys, data security experts, mental and medical health professionals, policy experts, and a few regular citizens. The representation, we have 1.6 million people in the city. So I propose having a large review board of about four from every district. That's still only one per 50,000 citizens. And the cost would be offset by not having these lawsuits and you could eliminate the three redundant uh, bodies. It needs to have subpoena and firing power and a job requirement that you cannot obstruct justice, you must testify. All documents, evidence, including body camera footage should be available. They should be able to recommend criminal prosecution, disciplinary action, and internal policy changes with full access to that early intervention software data that was mentioned earlier. And then make the data animized, but available to the public by zip code and district in real time, or at minimum available to the city council. Protest is patriotic, and Councilman Garcia represents me. I'm thrilled to have someone like him up there. Thank you. Is Katie Jo still here? O uh, O.C. Bilal will be followed by, uh, it starts with a Y, Cortez. My name is O.C. Bilal. Uh, first, I want to say, be the first to admit, I don't have a solution for this uh, deadly uh, national problem we have. And I respect the uh, chief of police for trying to bring about a change. But what she's doing, it will not work. You cannot remove the stripes from a zebra and pretend that it's a racehorse. And most of the people that left this building, I view Portland filibuster from a distance. I'm viewing a filibuster face to face today. Like I said, most of the people that left this building and the young people didn't even show up. And all of the uh, implements that you all are trying to implement, it will not work without the young people. It will not work. And Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. He told Nicodemus he had to be born again. And Nicodemus came back on Jesus and told him that will never happen. So what you all are trying to do say you're trying to do, it will never happen without the input of the young people. Thank you. Uh, Yancy Cortez followed by Gerald Richards. 
Gerald Richards followed by Isis Gill. Madam Mayor, <coughs> members of the council, Mr. Zerker, Mr. Dehoney. First, thank you so much for staying this late. Mr. Dehoney, Mahoney, Dehoney, you did an outstanding job as far as your presentation. Our city has experienced unfortunate situations in the past from which we have learned from and we've overcome. In the past, incidents resulted in cutting edge training for our officers, involvement of citizens in our citizen advisory board, citizen police academies, cultural awareness training, and developing immigration policies that have been adopted by other agencies throughout the state of Arizona. Also introducing less lethal methods. The department that is, we have a department that is unafraid to bring in nationally recognized outside law enforcement agencies to conduct studies and investigations on itself. Today's plans that Chief Williams has put forth are plans that are based on past successes, and they do work. The most recent community forum at Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church shows that we can still come together and talk things out and work it out without rioting in our cities and having certain areas of our cities become devastated. Our focus is not to demonstrate to dismantle our police department, but to come up with solutions. Since Edward Mallet, Reverend Oscar Tillman asked for a citizen's review board. I am not a proponent of a citizen's review board. However, if we must do it, what I do ask is that those individuals be highly trained to understand the workings of the police department, the workings of those police officers that place their lives on the line every day, the stress that they're under, I think that we already have what's in place with our current um, review, as Mr. Dehoney said a little bit earlier, and I know that we're going to continue to move forward to be the best city that we possibly can be. Thank you. Mayor, <clears throat> yes, I have a question for Gerald Richard. Gerald. What was your position with the city of Phoenix? I started off with the city of Phoenix in 1989. I started off as a legal advisor. I was promoted to director. I oversaw three different divisions with a number of individuals sitting on the council today. I walked side by side to make sure that you exercised your First Amendment right in a nonviolent way and got your message across. I worked hand in hand with every community that was out there. I've also been a consultant nationally. I've been to Ferguson, I've been to Salinas, I've been to Tampa. I've had a chance to see other cities and when I ask them about what do they do what we do here and they're just shocked. They said, wow, we wish we were like Phoenix. So when I say that Phoenix is, as they told me before I stood before the Commission on Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies in Nashville, ten Tennessee in 2005 and I happened to find the letter in my garage just the other day because my house just flooded. Phoenix Police Department is one of the best law enforcement agencies in the world. And we should never forget that. I love this department. I love this city. And your position with the city at the, in the police department was? Director. I was a civilian assistant chief. Do we, uh, Mr. Zucker, do we have that position today? Uh, <clears throat> Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, we don't have that exact position that Mr. Richard had. We do have a civilian in the chief's cabinet who works on uh, community re and police relations. I would like to look at that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Is ISIS here? Jeffrey Federhoff, followed by Janine Get Gelsinger. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, I rise today to say I support the civilian-led police uh, uh, community board. Um, I do want to say to Councilman Nowakowski and Councilman Garcia, especially Councilman Garcia, I did reach out to your office to explore um, more options as far as uh, having civilians be a part of the police force. 
Um, I haven't re received anything back. I don't know if that's just a backlog on your office with you being new. Um, but I would love to have a 30-minute, hour-long uh, meet meeting with you guys um, where we can discuss having our police chief be a civilian and the administrative roles be uh, civilian-led instead of having the police officers making and creating and implementing policies um, that we have a civilian uh, civilian led police force that goes that coincides with the civilian oversight board. Um, I do believe that uh, Vice, Vice Mayor Waring was uh, talking about cost. I can't agree with you any more than that. That is something that we should obviously be uh, concerning ourselves with. However, um, maybe we can get some of that money back from the uh, Phoenix Suns owner that we gave $150 million to. Um, maybe we can put that back into our police department and we can uh, pay for some of these uh, new things that we want to do. Um, but I don't believe that uh, we've been using our money in a proper way. So take the money back, put it into our police department, make our police department be more responsive to the community, and we will all win. Thank you. Janine will be followed by Lerman Montoya. Uh, Mayor, council members. My name is Janine Gelsinger, and I am the executive director of UU Jazz, which is the Unitarian Universalist Justice Arizona Network. I grew up here in, oh, and I live in District 6. I don't, Sal's not here, but I live in District 6. Um, I grew up here in Arizona, and when I was a kid, my parents told me that the police were here to keep me safe. Now that I'm a mother, I have to have the conversation with my children that they need to be very careful before calling the police because the, their presence is dangerous to the black and brown friends that they have with them. That's not a conversation that I wanna have. That shows me in the deadliest police department in the country that our police department is not keeping the community safe that they're meant to serve, that they're protecting themselves. So Citizen Review Board provides much needed accountability to the community that the police are dedicated to serve. It also means that we can start to take steps forward in the implementation of policies that we've been asking for for years and that people have been asking for for years. I've been very encouraged, Mayor Gallego, by your um, timelines that you've set to ask for things. I need to see this in 30 days. I need to see this in 30 days. And I appreciate that. And so I would love to hear when we heard about the steps of the review board and saw that we were on step two, what the timeline is for the rest of those steps. Because I know that things take time, but we've had a lot of time and I don't want to go another year wondering if my friends are safe in their communities. Thank you. Lerman will be followed by Jaden Fedrick. Hello, my name is Lerman Montoya. I would first like to express how disappointed I was with the budget hearing two weeks ago. I felt that it was a complete waste of time. For hours, we poured our hearts and our souls to you. We revisited the most traumatic moments of our life. We cried, we screamed, we begged. Some of you didn't even pay attention, Sal. Um, and for what? For you to pass the budget without any edits or even postponing the vote to think over the 5% increase for the Phoenix Police Department. My question is, where is that money actually going to? We've heard today that there were systems purchased that have proven to be completely pointless and useless at producing a holistic picture of the issues within the police department. Thousands and millions of our dollars have been spent on broken systems. You all passing the budget with no research as to where the money was actually going to and how things function is absolutely disgraceful and lazy on your part. Because of the failed transparency of the Phoenix Police Department, we must have a community review board that allows for review, audit, subpoena, and firing power. This CRB needs to be able to audit how that money is spent. Is it being spent on military grade riot gear or is it funding behavioral health services for officers or more body cameras that actually work? The CRB needs to be able to audit cases of police brutality and officer involved deaths. This board needs to be able to review internal cases and have power to influence concrete decisions. You all passed the budget. There's nothing you can change. All I ask is that a large portion of that money be used so that this CRB can actually go into effect. The CRB must be implemented with representatives of the community from all districts, especially the districts with the most police presence and activity. 
The CRB should have subpoena power and be able to audit or have an outside committee audit Phoenix Police Department. This will ensure transparency that we need that you and the Phoenix Police Department have failed to give us. Make things right, pass the CRB. Thank you. Jaden will be followed by Joshua Close or Clark. Is Jaden here? Joshua Close or Clark will be followed by Marty Winkler. Hello, my name is Joshua Klaus and I'm a resident uh, here. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that I am 100% in favor of the Citizen Review Board. It is a Citizen Review Board. Don't call us civilians. We're not in a military state yet, so don't call us that. We are your citizens, and it is your duty to protect us. And I want to talk to you, Mayor Gallego, because I have a lot of faith in you. I, ha I go to ASU, and I work a lot with the Young Democrats at ASU, and we worked a lot to get you in that seat. And I had a lot of friends who didn't believe in you. They thought you were going to be the same as Greg do nothing on police brutality, and do nothing to halt what they do. Please don't make me regret telling all my friends that they're wrong about you. Please be the mayor that actually does something about it, because Greg didn't take any action. And you have the chance to be better than he ever could be, because I know you can be that person. Um, as for the vice mayor, I didn't call you an idiot. I just said that you weren't as smart as Kate, a very smart person. But if the shoe fits, you can wear it. Marty is followed by Ken Baker. My name is Marty Winkler. I think you probably all know who I am. I am the face of a Phoenix police violence survivor. I am. It's not just black and brown people. White people are 40 to 50% of Phoenix police violence victims and survivors. I am, and you did nothing about him. He's doing training now at the Sunny Slope substation of Desert Horizon Precinct. You did nothing to him, nothing, nothing. It was all covered up. They didn't even investigate him till 11 months later after I went to the media and I found an attorney and filed a notice of claim. If I wouldn't have done that, they would have covered it up forever. All of these review boards did nothing to him. Nothing. This is why we need an all-citizen review board. Because of me and people like me and brown and black people, everyone. It should not be racial. It should not be. It's all people. You, Kate Gallego, Sal DeCicio, and Mr. Waring, are in denial about this Phoenix police violence. If it can happen to a middle-aged white grandmother calling the police for help, calling the police for help, all I wanted to do was file a police report on what the Circle K did. That's it. I just wanted to get my police report number and walk away. I have traumatic brain injury. I almost lost an eye. My head hurts while I'm sitting here. I have to wear hearing aids. I couldn't hear half of what was being said. I wake up every morning, my head is throbbing. You all covered it up, all of you. You met an executive session and decided you weren't even gonna give me a settlement because I spoke out at City, City Phoenix Council and exposed some of the lies and deception. Thank you. Ken Baker will be followed by Mike Santa. Ken Baker will be followed by Mike Santa. Are you guys going to validate parking for this long meeting? <laughs> and also, um, somebody has dropped a debit card, and I'm not sure who to turn it into. I would. I used to. Yes, I used to be told to turn it in the police, but now I'm not so sure. But there is a there is somebody here, and that's a joke. You can. You can give it to me after you speak. That's, that's fine, thank you. That was just a joke. Um, at your last church event, um, I, I think you shouldn't really need to be debating whether you need a, a civilian or a citizen's review board because you have a, 
uh, PR issue, and you need to instill confidence. Um, we gave a moment of silence this beginning of this evening for a, for a worker, a utility worker, who, who died in, a, in an awful uh, vault accident. I used to work in that industry. I used to do post-mortems. I used to figure out why things explode, what do, and repair them, and all that stuff. And I don't think anybody here doubts that APS will give a final report to the city. The city will investigate, and there will be the facts of what happened down there. Um, a person died. There may be some legal issues. That's life. That's business. That's our world. Um, peace officers should not have as much problems of near-death experiences. Uh, utilities workers work around lethal voltages, and if anybody's throwing F-bombs at the professional level, they are sanctioned and, and moved to a better system. Um, I don't, there was one other thing, I met a, a, a guy on your civilian thing, I think he was a, a marshal, and he asked, he said if he could recommend something in the city, he would recommend rubber bullets be used in the city's, uh, to, to reduce lethal exposure to the city. The city is Thank is you for being, your testimony. Uh, that's all. Mike Santa will be followed by Juana Rita. Is Juana here? Darian B. will be followed by Luciano Ariaga. Oh, my name is Darian. I'm a resident of Tempe. I, I support this review board because of situations like Remain Brisbane back in 2014. Michelle Casso, you know, um, I, I filmed these officers. I highly think it's needed to be able, to, as a civilian, be able to review what these officers are doing on their job when they shoot someone in the back like Remain Brisbane, bringing food home for his, for his kids. Um, another thing, I would like to see these police departments have public records request forms in their front office like they're supposed to. I've been to plenty of police stations and precincts, and the only one to have a, a complaint form out was Cactus Park Precinct. Um, Carlos, don't let none of these people tell you what you can and can't wear. You wake up in the morning, you put your shoes and socks on one by one. They, they, they don't, they, you know, like I said, they don't dress you. <laughs> wear what you want. Sal DeCicio, wherever you're at, get the off of Twitter. Language. <laughs> Luciano Ariaga will be followed by Jose Guzman. Is Luciano here? Jose. Is Jose here? Oh, I guess I can't roll that up. All right, anyways, um, I, I, heard, I heard a lot of comments from Jim and Britt and a few other people about civilian review boards not working in Portland or Chicago or in other cities, don't Portland, my Phoenix. Uh, just to be clear, we, we, what a civilian review board does is hold police accountable, not fix the city. Those are two different things. That's not what that's supposed to do. So don't blame civilian review boards for everything else that's wrong with the city. So I think that's why we're all here, to hold police accountable. Yes. No one is above the law. If I, if I commit a crime, I should be punished for it. If a police officer breaks the law, if they kill someone unjustly, they should also be punished for it. Or do we believe that, do we believe that police are above the law? So I think also people that are saying that just, or just don't break the law or, or you know, just don't be a criminal. That's, that's like telling someone who's depressed 
who has clinical depression to just be happy. This is a systemic issue. Yeah, yeah, I hear, I hear people laughing, but what, what, you don't, what you don't realize is that a few, like over 50 years ago, black people were only allowed to live south of Van Buren. Those are the same neighborhoods that were deprived of resources. They didn't have jobs. They couldn't, they couldn't do a lot of things. We didn't give them a lot of resources. And this is a systemic issue that has been happening. And, and it, it comes from a long line of racism. No, no. Thank you. what? <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Is Aaron Lopez here? Is Sukari Mejia here? John Chambers. That concludes today's cards. We will reconvene the City Council in September for a work study session where we will come back with the uh, answers to the questions that council members have asked, including more details on the review on implementation in Phoenix of the three models we discussed in the assistant manager, city manager's presentation, review, auditor monitor, and investigations, how that would look here in Phoenix, what we'd be illegally allowed to do, what types of changes would need to be made, what type of staffing and budget support would be required, the board and governance structure that would be needed. So we will be back in September. The ad hoc committee will meet for the first time in August. We will hear at the work study session about the variety of different questions that council members have asked. We appreciate council, uh, community members who provided testimony and experience today to help us make better decisions. These are very difficult issues. They are not easy. Cities struggle with it throughout the country. Our job as elected officials is to listen to and understand different points, the viewpoints that exist within our city, to put ourselves in the shoes of the people I represent and to see their world through their eyes. This means we, under, we need to understand there are people who feel that police are not their allies and still others who feel that police are being treated unfairly and still many others who feel, fall somewhere in the middle. This is not and never has been a two-sided issue. The work being done here today is important. It represents more than the nine people sitting up here. It represents 1.7 million people in our city with different viewpoints, life experiences, and concerns. It was never going to be easy, easy or instantaneous but we appreciate the people who have provided testimony, who have listened, and who have been part of this important conversation. With that, we are adjourned.